Starting in 1999 in Japan and 2002 in North America, the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game was a breakout success from the moment it launched. Based on the manga from Kazuki Takahashi, and later the hit anime series, the TCG was bound to be successful based on the popularity of its source material, but no one could have expected how big it would become. Now, over 20 years later, the game has grown into one of the three largest card games on the market today, spawning six anime, three feature-length movies, and over 10,000 cards. Even though the game has grown quite massively over the years, interest in the casual market has fallen for quite some time, as most casual fans played once or twice back in school due to the original anime's popularity. Because of this, in 2016, Konami would reimagine the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG into a more casual-friendly game, spawning an entire metagame around it with its own deep history separate from its TCG predecessor. This is a look back over the history of Konami's venture into the mobile market with Yu-Gi-Oh!, its ups and downs, and its intricate and ever-evolving metagame. This is the history of Duel Links. Duel Links was originally launched on October 2016 in Australia and Singapore, followed shortly by Japan in November. The game itself was almost like a love letter to the original Duel Monsters era of Yu-Gi-Oh!, focusing on iconic cards used by the most popular characters of the original anime. The main focus of the game was to provide a simpler version of Yu-Gi-Oh! that could be played on mobile devices, as the mobile game market was already booming at this point. This was accomplished by reducing the turn phases, field sizes, life points, and deck sizes from the physical game to be played in quick matches, similar to that of Hearthstone. In addition to this, players were given access to skills that were unique to different characters in the game, like Yugi or Kaiba, making it feel more like you were playing as those characters. A benefit of redesigning the game, aside from recapturing what made the original game so appealing, included not needing to release every card ever printed to the TCG, meaning that Konami could cherry-pick what was and wasn't included in Duel Links' card pool. This allowed them to avoid decks that were problematic in the TCG simply by not adding the enabling cards to Duel Links, creating a unique meta environment. At launch, the duelists that were available out the gate included Yami Yugi, Kaiba, Joey, Mai, Teya, Weevil, Rex, Mako, Bandit Keith, Ishizu, and Odeon. All of these characters were available just by playing the game and unlocked through special missions. They each brought their own unique card pools and skills to the game, making it easy to build a deck around all of your favorite characters. Of these initial cards, the only card that would see staple play in almost every deck at the time was Enemy Controller. This card would allow you to change the battle position of an opponent's monster during either player's turn thanks to it being a quick play spell, making it a consistent way to stop an opponent's attack. It also had the ability to tribute a monster to take control of an opponent's monster for the rest of the turn, but this usage was only used in niche circumstances. Luckily, this pool of cards wouldn't be the only cards available at launch, as the first booster pack was released on the same day. Released on the same day as Duel Links on October 27th, 2016, The Ultimate Rising was the first main box set. Booster sets for Duel Links were split between these core main boxes, which bring a variety of new cards and strategies to the game, and mini boxes, which focus in on one or two specific strategies. Out of this first box came a bunch of staples of the early meta, the most important of which was Sphere Karibo. Similar to Enemy Controller, Sphere Karibo could switch an attacking monster into defense position. What made it different from the former was that it could do so from your hand, so you never had to put it on the field in case the opponent had a removal option. This distinction, along with the focus on attacking that the early meta held, made Sphere Karibo an instant staple, being the most sought after card in these early days. Comparatively, none of the other monsters in the set would garner as much attention, but each had their own uses. Axe Raider was notable for being the largest no-tribute normal monster in the game with 1700 attack, seeing play for that fact alone. Crass and Dream Clown, with their control effects, formed a limited version of the TCG's clown control deck, though lacked many battle position changing effects to use on themselves. The only card that really enabled this at this point in time was Curse of Anubis, and you could only get one copy of it per account. Sonic Bird searched a ritual spell on summon, which wasn't critical at this point in time, but would be in the near future. Finally, 4-star Ladybug of Doom was one of the only mass removal options in these early months, destroying all level 4 monsters upon being flipped face up. Alongside these monsters were a series of spell and trap cards that would fill out the remaining staple positions of the launch meta. The main one used at this time would be Order to Charge, which let the user tribute off any normal monster in exchange for monster removal. This, combined with the lackluster effect monsters of the launch period, and the simultaneous release of White Elephant's gift, led to the early meta of the game being entirely focused around normal monster beatdown strategies, the most prominent of which was Dinosaur Beatdown. 
Twister saw a good amount of success since field spell skills were popular at this point in time. Fusion Gate was an alternative to polymerization for heavy fusion decks, but didn't see much play due to being a little bit overkill. Mask of the Accursed was good for locking down monsters and providing burn damage, which would later be combined with Restructor Revolution from this set to make burn a meta staple. Trap-wise, not too many were played at this point, as the ones available didn't do much in the grand scheme. The most useful of the first traps was without a doubt Reinforcements, which could swing a battle in your favor thanks to the attack point focused beatdown meta. While it's safe to say the launch meta was rather basic, being focused almost entirely around beatdown strategies, it would be shaken up rather regularly, as Konami tended to release a new box every month, starting the trend in November with the release of Age of Discovery. Age of Discovery was the game's first mini box, releasing on December 7th, 2016. The main strategy from this set revolved around the Via Dragon Daedalus, a sea serpent boss monster that could synergize well with Mako's skill Mythic Depths. This card was powerful in that you could send a Yumi that was face up on your side of the field to the graveyard to destroy all other cards on the field. While it doesn't sound too powerful on its own, Mythic Depths let you start the game with a copy of Yumi on the field, so the requirements were not as difficult to pull off as they might have seemed at first glance. This, along with the other powerful water support cards like Unshaven Angler, High Tide Gyojin, Moray of Greed, and Big Wave Small Wave, made the deck a powerhouse on release. In addition, other boss monsters from this set would see play due to the slow nature of the early months, such as Kazajin, Suijin, and Sangha of the Thunder. All three of these monsters shared the same effect to reduce an attacking monster's attack to zero once while they were face up on the field. These three were never played together, as you would play them based on what attribute your deck was focused on. Because of this, Sui Jin saw the most play of the three initially, as Unshaven Angler provided both tributes for a summon and was already being played in a meta deck. Kazajin would see experimentation in some decks thanks to Whirlwind Prodigy, but would be overshadowed by his water attribute brother. This left Sangha of the Thunder completely behind both, as he didn't have a quick and cheap way to be summoned at this point. Beyond these, some other cards that saw play from the set include Yomi Ship and Gaku Gaier Panda for control strategies, Stray Lambs as a token generator and tribute fodder, Cost Down, which made tribute summoning easier, and Attack and Receive, a powerful burn trap. All of these, though, would not see as widespread play as the first real staple trap, Mitchizer. Mitchizer would allow a player to destroy an opponent's monster when their own gets destroyed. Overall, this set brought the game into its first real meta strategy, giving players a taste of what Konami intended to provide with their mini box expansions. However, Konami wasn't content with just releasing cards and booster packs, as the first new character was about to be added to Duel Links. Welcome to Toon World was the first ever character unlock event, beginning on December 20th, 2016. It introduced the first new playable character since the game's launch with Maximilian Pegasus, who brought with him new skills and cards to the game. With his skills, the main one to focus on was Mind Scan, as the skill allowed the player to see all set cards until the end of the third turn, as long as their life points remained above 3000. While not immediately helpful, as back row removal wasn't really a thing at this point in time, it would eventually see usage in control focused decks once back row control became a little bit more available. More importantly than his skills though were the cards he brought to the game, as he brought two playable strategies. The less immediately impactful of these strategies was Toons, which brought with them Toon Mermaid, Rollback, Table of Contents, and Summon Skull through the Card Trader. This was less impactful at the time as they relied heavily on the spell card Toon World to be active to do anything. While the skill It's a Toon World could offset this slightly by starting the game with a face-up Toon World, the deck was still heavily susceptible to Twister, which was still popular due to the field spell meta of the time. However, much more impactful than Toons would be the release of Relinquished, a level 1 ritual monster that could act as both monster removal and a self-protecting beater in a meta of combat-focused decks. If there was ever a deck primed to take over the meta in these early months, it was Relinquished, taking full advantage of the already released Sonic Bird for searching out the ritual spell Black Illusion Ritual, and Sphere Karibo, whose graveyard effect could fill the entire ritual summoning requirement for Relinquished. This hostile takeover of the meta would only be punctuated by the release of the next main box one week later. Neo Impact was the second main box, released on December 27, 2016, just one week after the Toon World event. This set was primarily focused on promoting ritual monsters as a deck type, boosting the newly released Relinquished deck further into the meta. The main piece of support that did this was Senju of the Thousand Hands, who could search a ritual monster on summon, making it a counterpart to Sonic Bird. This pushed the consistency of Relinquished even further, giving the deck a searcher for both the ritual spell and the ritual monster. 
While it's clear that Konami wanted Senju to push a deck based around Garlandorf, Relinquished being a much easier summon, and just as powerful effect, pushed Garlandorf out of the meta almost immediately. Beyond the ritual support, Kaiser Seahorse and Double Coston extended the double tribute support to light and dark attribute monsters. This was important mainly for the fact that Kaiser Seahorse now allowed Sangha of the Thunder to be played at the same capacity as its brothers, which would see play in Mythic Depths decks that weren't focused around Leviathan Dragon Daedalus. Jerry Beansman would power creep Axe Raider, becoming the new highest attack on a no tribute monster with 1750 attack. Even more important than that, it was a super rare compared to Axe Raider's ultra rare status, making him easier to get copies of. Last in the monster department is the Element series, including Element Valkyrie, Saurus, and Dragon. While Valkyrie and Dragon wouldn't see much use, Element Saurus would find a place in Dinosaur Beatdown almost immediately thanks to the prevalence of Earth monsters in the deck, giving them an easy answer to 4 star Ladybug of Doom. Beyond monsters, a couple of spells and traps would see a decent amount of play from this set. Black Pendant would see occasional play in burn strategies as a source of an additional 500 burn, but was more of a tech choice than anything. Half Shut would see the most play of the spells of the set thanks to its versatility. Being able to protect your own monsters for a turn while also providing a way to attack over weaker monsters repeatedly let the car see play in a few beatdown strategies at the time. Desert Sunlight would be the first real support for clown control decks, as it would let you swap your monsters to defense position on your opponent's turn, triggering the effect of your dream clown. However, all of these cards pale in comparison to the true staple from this set, Mirror Wall. Mirror Wall, while face up on the field, has the attack of all opponent's monsters when they attack, making it the most powerful battle trap in the game. It did come at the cost of 2,000 life points every standby phase, but you could always choose to not pay it and let it be destroyed. Even if you did choose to pay it, it effectively stops your opponent from attacking for another turn, which could often result in the end of the game. Neo Impact, at the time of its release, was essentially power creep in a set, giving the game more staples and slowly morphing the game into its first real format. Unfortunately, the bar may have been set a little high, as the next mini box would not nearly reach the same heights. Flame of the Tyrant was the second mini box, released on February 3rd, 2017. The clear intention of this set was to create a fire counterpart to the popular Mythic Deaths deck with cards like Tyrant Dragon, Rigorous Reaver, and Flame Ruler, but this concept fell flat hard on release since it was not nearly as well executed. Tyrant Dragon as a boss monster was an interesting concept, being able to attack multiple monsters in a turn, but fell victim to Enemy Controller, Sphere Karibo, and Mirror Wall completely shutting down its main game plan. Instead, this set became more well known for four monsters that would become staples of their own respective control decks, being Sergeant Electro, Possessed Dark Soul, Agent of Creation Venus, and Warm Worm. Sergeant Electro was one of the first truly generic back row control options, being able to stun a set spell or trap card once per turn, making it unable to activate its effects while he's on the field. While most back row at the time was freely activatable, meaning you could always chain it to the effect, it did force out options before they could be used effectively, making Electro a popular choice in almost every control deck going forward for a time. Possessed Dark Soul had a similar placement in control decks, serving as a way to break boards that tried to avoid 4-star Ladybug of Doom. With the rise of Jerry Bean's Man from the previous set, level 3 monsters were becoming a popular option to avoid Ladybug if you didn't play an out to it. Possessed Dark Soul punished that line of play by stealing every level 3 or lower monster from your opponent, sometimes ending the game right then and there with a powerful enough board swing. These two cards would become staples in control decks for the next few months, being nearly irreplaceable. The other two previously mentioned cards would not be staple in all control decks, but would become the focal point of their own control variants. The Agent of Creation Venus could, by paying 500 life points each, summon copies of Mystical Shineball from your hand or deck. This effect, using combination with Order to Charge and White Elephant's Gift, could cause massive swings of advantage thanks to monster removal and draw power. This spawned an entirely new deck type known as Venus Control, which would only get more powerful in the future sets. The other deck that would be spawned from the set would be Warm Worm Mill, a control deck focused on repeatedly using the effect of Warm Worm with cards like the Shallowed Grave to mill out the opponent's deck. While not the most effective form of mill, it would grow more powerful as more sets released, slowly turning mill into an effective meta option. Flame of the Tyrant set out to do a lot of things, but really only succeeded in making control decks a little more playable in the sea of beatdown strategies. The next set, however, would push many of the control strategies introduced here into becoming true meta staples. Valkyrie's Rage was the third main box, released on February 27th, 2017. The set's focus was once again bringing powerhouse cards to the game, power creeping many of the meta staples up to this point. 
The primary case of this was Dunaim's Dark Witch, an 1800 attack normal monster that would power creep Jerry Bean's man for the title of strongest no tribute normal monster. In addition to this, beatdown strategies would gain another powerful tool in their arsenal in the Fiend Mega Cyber, a 2200 attack monster that you could special summon if your opponent controlled two more monsters than you. While not a staple in every beatdown deck, Mega Cyber would give those who chose to run it a solid comeback option for when their opponent gets ahead in field presence. Arguably more important than beatdown support would be the control support, bringing the decks mentioned in Flame of the Tyrant to the forefront. For Venus Control, Sky Surge Enrise served as the deck's game ender, banishing three Shine Balls and a Sphere Karibo from your graveyard to summon itself. Enrise could banish a monster on field once per turn at the cost of its attack, being one of the few cards at this point to offer banishing removal. Hero Shadow Scout would fit snugly into Worm Mill, providing an additional monster to mill your opponent that heavily benefited from the Shallow Grave. Similarly, Pump Princess, the Princess of Ghosts, would see play in control decks focused on stalling thanks to its attack draining effect, making games easier to finish the longer she stayed on the field. Burning Land became an excellent fit for burn strategies, as removing field spells was relevant at this point in time, and the additional 500 burn per turn really stacks up in a 4000 life point format. Finally, Jing Zhen Hu served as a trap card version of Sergeant Electro, stunning two speller trap cards while it remained on the field. Beyond these, there were also a few generically good cards to cover from this set. Soul Exchange gave Tribute Summon decks even more tools to work with in terms of monster removal at the cost of your battle phase, but this also saw play thanks to its interactions with enemy controller. Divine Wrath, while not widely played at this point in time, provided easy monster effect negation at the cost of discarding one card. Skull Air would see play as a tech choice to deal with relinquished decks on the ladder, as it was still a potent threat. Finally, Wild Tornado would see play similarly to Twister before it, but had the added benefit of destroying any card if it was destroyed while face down. This set brought many cards that would change up the face of the game, like the other main boxes before it. Unfortunately, this main box would be steeped in controversy, as on the same day that Valkyrie's Rage released, the first ever KC Cup would begin. Beginning on the same day as the launch of Valkyrie's Rage on February 27th, 2017, the first ever KC Cup was the first in-game tournament for Duel Links. The goal was to let players compete in a point battle style tournament over the course of a two week period as a test of players' skills. Unfortunately, starting on the same day as a box release steeped the entire competition in controversy, as players who didn't buy into the set on day one were put at a severe disadvantage over players that did. This was on top of the fact that Singapore, Australia, and Japan had a two month head start on collecting cards compared to the rest of the world, who only had had the game for roughly a month before this tournament started. Because of this, strategies morphed over the course of the tournament, as new cards would affect builds of already established decks as people finally obtained them. A few decks had a couple of tops overall, such as Dinosaur Beatdown, Venus Control, and Clown Control, gaining one or two tops but not being a majority mainstay in the top 100. In the end, the top 100 was mostly consisted of four decks, Relinquished, Harpy Beatdown, Weevil Burn, and Gravekeepers. Relinquish was still riding high off the coattails of its consistency cards, but what was interesting about the lists ending in the top 100 was that almost every one of them was playing the skill Switcheroo, which allowed the player to swap any card in their hand for a new one from their deck once per turn and twice per duel. This was used in conjunction with Thunder Dragon to search for two Thunder Dragons, Switcheroo one away for the free draw, and then search the one that you sent back, giving any deck that ran it effectively an easy way to thin your deck by two and draw one for free. Weevil Burn was a control deck that focused on using the skill Parasite Infestation in combination with Jade Insect Whistle to force the opponent to draw into Parasite Parasite, locking up their board and effectively skipping their draw phase. This, in combination with stall cards like Big Shield Gardna, Cocoon of Evolution, and Pump Princess the Princess of Ghosts, allowed you to slowly burn your opponent out through Mask of the Accursed, finishing the game by attacking a Parasite Parasite with Gyakugai or Panda, which could deal 2000 damage when facing a full board. Harpy Beatdown would be the most successful of the beatdown strategies, combining the raw power of normal monsters like Dunaim's Dark Witch and Jerry Bean's Man with Harpy Lady, which could provide back row removal in combination with Harpy's Hunting Ground, being one of the only decks with reliable back row removal. Gravekeepers were able to make a splash in the later days of the KC Cup, using Soul Exchange and Enemy Controller as ways to clear out the opponent's board through tribute summoning their monsters like Gravekeeper's Oracle and Gravekeeper's Chief. The last deck that made an impact, and ended up being used by the first place finisher in North America, would be Statue Control, a control deck that used the card trader card Guardian Statue to control the opponent's board in combination with cards such as Sphere Karibo, Sergeant Electro, Amazonas Chainmaster, and Possessed Dark Soul. The KC Cup would go on to become a staple of Duel Links' competitive play, occurring every few months to keep players sharp in the face of new releases. 
This meta environment would continue to shift in the coming months, as new boxes would continually shake up the established decks. Wonders of the Sky was the third mini box, releasing on March 17th, 2017, a little over a week after the KC Cup ended. This set focused on boosting up wind attribute strategies, similar to the mini boxes that came before it. The main focus of the box would be the Atmosphere, a wind boss monster with a similar effect to Relinquish that could summon itself by banishing two monsters from your field and one from your graveyard. The main difference between this and Relinquished, however, is the Atmosphere did not gain battle protection from absorbing a monster, making it arguably worse than a former. However, because of its self-summoning nature in decks that could flood the field, it would find a tech spot in the Rising Venus control deck, using Shinefalls as a cheap and effective way to fulfill its summoning condition. Desert Twister would be the other highlighted card for the set, able to summon itself by banishing two winds and one earth from your graveyard. It was able to provide back row removal by discarding a card, making it one of the few cards in the game that could remove said back row effectively. Overall, he wouldn't see much success outside of a gimmick deck at the time known as Last Gamble OTK, which focused on using the skill Last Gamble in conjunction with Desert Twister to destroy copies of Wild Tornado to clear out the opponent's board, and then swing for game with multiple Desert Twister. While the rest of the set for the most part would fall flat similar to that of Flame of the Tyrant, one deck would rise from a couple of new cards in this set. This set gave Harpy Beatdown Birdface, an 1800 attack beater under Harpy's Hunting Ground that searched for a Harpy Lady on Destruction, as well as Sonic Duck, which was a 1900 beater under Hunting Ground that synergized with the already played Order to Charge. These cards would be enough to boost the deck into Tier 1 status, as the deck was already considered a serious meta threat after the showing it had in the previous KC Cup. Wonders of the Sky might not have done much overall, but its contributions to the meta would be felt immediately, and they wouldn't be the only change felt, as the next character unlock event would begin just one week later. Starting on March 23rd, 2017, the Destiny Board of Doom event introduced Yami Bakura to the game, and with him the first alternative win condition in Duel Links aside from deck out through his skill Destiny Board. Destiny Board starts the opponent on a 5 turn clock on activation, with the caveat of requiring Dark Necrofear to be in your graveyard and to be under 2000 life points. While many players would try to make this skill into a valid deck with the addition of stall cards, Destiny Board didn't see meta play overall due to the slow and clunky nature of its effect. However, alongside Destiny Board came the skill Fiend Farewell, which allows the user to send a fiend from deck to graveyard any time they lose a monster on the field. This skill would be used a couple times in off-meta decks at first as a way to generate resources to summon Bacorus Ace Monster Dark Necrofear, which could be special summoned by banishing three fiend monsters from your graveyard. While she was merely a beater while on the field, if the opponent attempted to destroy her, she would take control of one of the opponent's monsters at the end of the turn, making her very difficult to play around. While expectations may have been a bit high for this event after the powerhouses that came from Pegasus's launch, Bakura's launch was seen as a bit of a disappointment overall, bringing no real meta strategies to the game. In hindsight, Fiend Farewell would see a lot more usage in the near future, but for now, the tinge of disappointment would hang over Bakura's head as most look to the next set for any real meta shifts. Chaotic Compliance was the fourth main box, released on April 11th, 2017. While this set was focused around Blackluster Soldier and splashable counter traps such as Magic Drain and Seven Tools of the Bandit, none of these would see any meta relevance. For the most part, only a couple of cards from the set would see play in any meta decks. Master Kionchi would see play as an easily accessible 1750 attack beater, matching the power level of Jerry Bean's Man on a rare. Desk Kangaroo became useful as a monster that could remove almost anything affected by enemy controller or sphere Karibo, as it destroyed any defense position monster that had less defense than it. Jowls of the Dark Demise was an option for either stalling out a game or for ending it with its flip effect, stealing an opponent's monster and making it able to attack directly that turn. Lady Assailant of the Flames was another tool in Burn's arsenal, giving them another monster to use to extend the Burn game plan. Planet Pathfinder would be the first reliable way to search field spells in the game, but wouldn't see play until later as most decks were not running field spells at the time. Double Summon would see usage in Gravekeepers, allowing them to get an additional summon towards their Tribute Summon game plan. The most surprising meta card to come out of the set was without a doubt Gateway to Chaos. While the Blackluster Soldier deck never went anywhere, Gateway to Chaos helped to usher in a new form of beatdown strategy known as Handless Beatdown, thanks to it searching a copy of Swift Gaia the Fierce Knight a Yami Yugi level up reward that you could only receive one copy of at the time. 
The goal of the deck was to quickly dump your hand onto the board and trigger the summoning effect of Swift Gaia, or offset the effect of Flash Assailant, overpowering your opponent with raw stats. This surprise meta deck would see much more success in the coming months, as we approach the next major tournament. Chaotic Compliance overall didn't do nearly as much as previous boxes, but it would still introduce a new meta deck, so it wasn't completely overlooked. The same could not be said for the next mini box that followed just one month later. Released on May 11, 2017, Land of the Titans was the fourth mini box in Duel Links, rounding out the theme of attribute support by being focused on Earth attribute monsters. The primary two cards of the set were Yellow Baboon, Archer of the Forest, and Green Baboon, Defender of the Forest. These two were intended to form the backbone of a new meta deck, but their summoning conditions were too situational to see any real meta success. Unfortunately, a majority of the set fell into the same hole, as almost all of the cards here would never see any form of meta play outside of the odd rogue deck. Only three cards would break out of this particularly bad set, being Gearfried the Iron Knight, Obedient Schooled, and Security Orb. Gearfried would find a home rather quickly in the previously mentioned Handless Beatdown, being an 1800 attack body with no downsides in that deck. Obedient Schooled would pop up from time to time across the later history of Duel Links thanks to its ability to spam summon out three weaker beast monsters, but wouldn't see relevance until much later. Last would be Security Orb, which was mainly considered to counter the growing threat of Harpy Beatdown, providing an enemy controller-like battle position switching effect when used normally, and a monster removal when destroyed by a spell or trap effect. Overall, the set really had nothing worth noting aside from those three cards, making it one of the most forgettable sets in Duel Links' history, leading into the first ever balancing of the game. On May 23, 2017, the first ever skill balancing patch came into effect. This had been announced about a month earlier, so players knew the changes were coming, which included buffs to the skills Reinforcement, Precognition, and Endless Trap Hell, and more importantly, a much needed nerf to Switcheroo. Switcheroo had a life point restriction added onto its effect, making it so you could only use the skill after losing a thousand life points. This change would hurt the overall consistency boosting the skill provided, but it wouldn't kill the usage overall, as it would continue to see meta play going forward. This lull in changes to the meta would finally come to an end the day after these changes, as the next character on lock event would change the face of the meta completely. Starting on May 24, 2017, the Guardians of the Gate event would introduce the Paradox Brothers to the game, and with them, arguably the most powerful skill up to this point. The skill 3 Star Demotion would change the game entirely going forward, as it, for the cost of 2000 life points, would reduce the level of all monsters in your hand by 3 until the end of the turn. This would allow the user to normal summon any level 7 monster in their hand without tributing that turn, creating an entirely new category of meta decks simply referred to as 3 Star Demotion decks. These decks included 3 Star Demotion Machine, which centered around Barrel Dragon, Defensive, which used a variety of level 7 monsters like Guardian Angel Joanne, Flame Ogre, and Sangha of the Thunder, and the most popular of them all, Dark Magician, centered around the titular monster. The cost of the skill, paying 2000 life points, was also very easily offset with cards like Supremacy Barry, which would fully refund the 2000 paid if played after using the skill. 3 Star Demotion would make its presence known rapidly, as the next major tournament took place merely one week later. Starting on June 1st, 2017, the World Championship Qualifier was the start of a true competitive landscape for Duel Links. While this wasn't the first high-profile event thanks to the KC Cup which happened a couple of months prior, it was the first to offer a tangible reward for doing well in the form of an invite to Duel Links' first World Championship for the winners of each region. Because of this, everyone competing for the top spot of each region had a reason to fight tooth and nail to maintain that number one spot using the strongest of all the current meta decks. Some of the decks that did well in the final stage of the tournament, but just had less representation, included Weevil Burn, Clown and Statue Control, and Three Star Demotion Machine. The remaining six had a heavy representation in the final stages of the WCQ, marking them as the top meta decks of the time. Relinquished was still a powerhouse in the meta, even with the nerfs to Switcheroo. Many players at this point had pivoted to running a Harpy package instead of Thunder Dragon, allowing them to use the skill Harpy's Hunting Ground to give the deck back row removal. Gravekeepers were now fully embracing the Soul Exchange and Double Summon package to control boards through Tribute Summoning Chief and Oracle, making very difficult to attack over boards while also clearing out problematic cards. Defensive three-star demotion bounced between a collection of seven-star monsters, such as Guardian Angel Joanne, Barrel Dragon, Sangha of the Thunder, and Flame Ogre, to create a more control-oriented boss monster strategy, providing life point gain, spot removal, attack prevention, and draw power between its boss monsters. 
Handless Beatdown would fully make a name for itself here, taking up a good portion of the North American top spots. The power of cards like Swift Gaia the Fierce Knight and Flash Assailant would carry the deck through, even in the growing presence of 3-star Demotion. Speaking of, the last 3-star Demotion deck, and the most successful of them, was Dark Magician, cheaply summoning the titular monster, and then backing it up with cards like Dark Magician Girl, who could use Sage's Stone to summon additional copies of Dark Magician, Dark Magic Attack for clearing back row, Thousand Knives for removing problematic monsters, and Champion's Vigilance for Omni Negation. The most represented deck in the final stage of the WCQ was unquestionably Harpy Beatdown, which was riding high off the power boost the deck received from Wonders of the Sky, fully embracing cards like Sonic Duck and Birdface to overpower the meta in combination with cards like Wild Tornado, which could turn into spot removal when popped with Hunting Ground. Overall, the World Championship qualifier gave everyone a deep look into the tournament meta going forward, though it would drastically change before the actual World Championship would come around thanks to a new series of cards and balance changes on the horizon. Coming right off the heels of the World Championship qualifier, Crimson Kingdom was the fifth main box, released on June 12, 2017. With the disappointment of recent releases up to this point, Konami really brought their A-game with this set, introducing not only stronger normal monster support, but an entirely new deck type in Zombies and Red Eyes. In the normal monster department, Blazing and Pachi would once again power creep to names Dark Witch for the spot of strongest no-tribute normal monster with 1850 attack. This combined with the release of Great Angus, which matched Dunaim's attack at 1800 on a rare, would set the new standard for normal monsters going forward. In addition to this, Soul Resurrection was a revival trap for normal monsters, and Knight of the Red Lotus would be considered the boss monster of normal monster beatdown strategies, both providing recursion for your normal monsters. Red Lotus in particular would find a home in Venus Control, ousting the old boss monster the Atmosphere, as he fit the deck a lot better overall. Other key cards from the set included Reinforced Human Psychic Borg, which helped to push the Rising Psychic deck into the meta, Buster Blader, the Dragon Destroyer Swordsman, a dragon countering fusion monster that would eventually receive more support, and Ultimate Providence, the first truly splashable Omni Negate. However, all of the normal monster support and other key cards would be completely overshadowed by the powerhouse of the set that would go on to redefine the meta, Red Eyes Zombies. This set would release Gozuki, Red Eyes Wyvern, and Red Eyes Zombie Dragon, three cards that when combined with the previously released Red Eyes Spirit and the soon to be released Red Eyes Insight, form the core of Red Eyes Zombies, a deck that could consistently put Red Eyes Zombie Dragon onto the field thanks to the consistency of their search enablers. This deck would go on to define the meta going into the World Championship in a few months, causing further controversy as its key cards, Red Eyes Spirit and Insight, were both exclusive to the Super Joey roaming event, meaning not every player could consistently obtain playsets. This wouldn't be the last shakeup, as the next couple of releases would consistently change the meta with each set of additions, starting with the next mini box, Dawn of Destiny. Dawn of Destiny was the fifth mini box, released on July 10th, 2017. While there was another set of cards released just one week before these, which were the game's first ever structure decks, Sorcerer's Alliance and Draconic Force, which introduced completely new cards to the game, these did absolutely nothing for the metagame and changed nothing overall. Dawn of Destiny, on the other hand, introduced the Neftis archetype, their sibling archetype the Fire Kings, and further zombie support that would go on to continue shaping the meta. The star card of the set was Sacred Phoenix of Neftis, a 2400 attack monster that, when destroyed by card effect, would resummon itself during your next standby phase, destroying all spell and traps on the field in the process. This level of back row removal let Neftis see play almost immediately, combined with Fire King Avatar Yaksha, which would let you destroy Neftis in your hand, and Fire King Island, which could both let you special summon Neftis if you controlled no monsters, or let you destroy a monster in hand to search for Yaksha. Illblood and Heavy Knight of the Flame would form the backbone of Gemini Zombie, a deck focused around using Illblood's Gemini effect to flood your board with powerful zombie monsters. Heavy Knight of the Flame would actually be used in far more than just this deck, as it was splashed into almost every zombie or control focused deck as a reliable removal option for any special summoned monster. Red Dragon Ninja would be introduced in this set, but wouldn't see meta play until support released in the next set. Tribute to the Doom served as a generic monster removal at the cost of discarding one card, which is used in many decks at the time due to its versatility and splash ability. The final breakout card from the set would be Super Rush Headlong, a quick play spell that gave a monster the ability to destroy any one attribute of monster that it battled, serving as a guaranteed combat victory. Overall, this was arguably the most impactful single set up to this point, bringing two completely new meta decks and introducing so many new splashable tools for just about every kind of deck. 
However, to help with the overwhelming power level of the game up until this point, Konami would also opt to perform another balance update one week later. Going into effect on July 18th, 2017, Konami once again would provide a balance update to skills and, for the first time, introduce the forbidden and limited list to Duel Links. While the TCG had a ban list ever since the first set of the game, Duel Links up until this point had no restrictions on deck building outside of soft restrictions based on how many copies of a card you could obtain. This introduction also gave insight into how the ban list would operate going forward, as it was different from the TCGs. Cards on the forbidden section would be completely banned from play, which was to be expected, but beyond that there were also the restrictions of limited, semi-limited, and tri-limited. Unlike the TCG where you could play one of each limited card and two of each semi-limited card, Duel Link specified that you could only include one limited card in the deck, two for semi-limited cards, and three for tri-limited cards overall. This meant that if you wanted to play two different cards that were both limited, you could only play one or the other, not both. The only card that was added to the list at the time was Restructor Revolution, being limited. This was done due to a deck on the ladder known as Taya Burn, which we haven't mentioned up until this point due to its lackluster performance in tournament settings, but should be mentioned at least once. The deck used the skill Dual Standby to make both players start with 5 cards in their hand instead of 4, giving more consistency to your deck as you played cards like Cup of Ace to make either you or your opponent draw 2, and then burn cards like Restructor Revolution, which burned your opponent for 200 for every card in their hand. This deck was akin to that of a Solitaire deck, in that it didn't have any forms of interaction and if you opened the right hand, you just won with no counterplay. While it wasn't consistent enough to be top tier, it was enough of an issue to warrant a limit to Restructor Revolution to prevent the deck from doing any further damage. Beyond this change, all the remaining changes were skill rebalancings, which included buffs to Fairy Smile and Precognition, and, more importantly, nerfs to Harpy's Hunting Ground, Parasite Infestation, and 3 Star Demotion. Harpy's Hunting Ground would see an adjustment so that the titular card would start on the top of your deck rather than in play, effectively removing your first draw for playing the skill, discouraging the use of the skill as generic back row removal. Parasite Infestation saw the number of Parasite Parasites shuffled into the opponent's deck reduced from between 1 to 3 to between 1 and 2, as Weevil Burn was able to pull off its Jade Insect Whistle play a little too often. Finally, 3 Star Demotion would see its life point cost increase from 2,000 to 3,000, as the low cost of the skill led to it being far too powerful in the current meta environment. These changes were all put in place as an attempt to balance the game going into the World Championships a month later, but before we get there, we do have one more event and one more box to cover. Starting on July 26, 2017, the Attack of the Rare Hunters event would introduce Yami Merrick to the game as a playable character. More importantly than Merrick himself, this event would bring Lava Golem to the game, a monster that allowed you to tribute two monsters on your opponent's field to special summon them to their side of the field. This would give them a 3000 attack monster, but at the cost of 1000 life points every turn, being without question the most powerful single burn effect in the game at this point. Lava Golem would become a popular option in the recently nerfed Weevil Burn strategy, who was already playing Mask of the Accursed at the time, which paired perfectly to lock down the 3000 attack Golem. This event would lead into the last box release before the World Championship, Electric Overload. Electric Overload was the sixth main box, released on July 31st, 2017, and was the final box release before the World Championships two weeks later. This set, being the last box before the World Championships, made one last push to shake up the meta, which it managed to succeed in doing thanks to the Ninja archetype. While the headliner of the deck at the time, Red Dragon Ninja, was introduced in the previous set, the support in this set would bring them into their own, with cards like Ninja Grandmaster Sasuke, White Ninja, Flame Armor Ninja, Black Dragon Ninja, and Ninjutsu Art of Transformation. The main game plan of the deck involved using monsters like White Ninja and Ninja Grandmaster Sasuke to clear out defense mode monsters, then use Transformation to change them into the far more powerful Red or Black Dragon Ninja, which could remove back row or protect themselves respectively. Beyond this, a rogue level deck that would pop out of the set would be Ice Barrier, a deck focused around summoning either General Gontala or General Grunard using Magical Triangle of the Ice Barrier. From there, they would either use Guntala to recycle monsters, or Grunar to enable field swarming, combined with the general consistency boosting of other Ice Barrier monsters like Daisojo, Strategist, and Samurai from this set. For general tribute support, Mecha Phantom Beast Hamstrat would see play as a settable token generator, as when flipped, it gives you two free tokens to use for a tribute summon. 
In addition to this, Treeborn Frog would be introduced in the set, which could special summon itself from Grave once per turn, as long as you controlled no spell or traps. While the former would see immediate play and success, Treeborn Frog wasn't as useful in a meta of heavy back row. With the release of Electric Overload, the card pool was finalized, going into the first ever Duel Links World Championship, taking place just two weeks later. The first ever Duel Links World Championship was held in Tokyo, Japan from August 12th to the 13th of 2017. Being the first sanctioned in-person event for Duel Links, no tournament format was set in stone at this point in time, and as such, the tournament would have a format different from all of those that followed it. Each player, who plays first in their respective regions during the World Championship Qualifier back in June, would bring three decks with different characters and skills for each. From there, players would face off using one of the three decks, playing a best two out of three in which once you won with one deck, you could not use it for the rest of the match. Going into the tournament, many players expected Red Eye Zombie to dominate the format, as it was the most powerful deck on ladder at this point in time. What players weren't expecting was that the first and second place finisher would not only have no Red Eyes in their lineup, but would actually be playing the exact same three lists. Ninja had a far stronger performance than anyone was expecting at the time, which made sense as it was one of the only decks that could reliably fight Red Eyes in terms of raw power. Toon was a real dark horse of the tournament, however. While the deck had been introduced way back in the Toon World event, it hadn't reached a super high power level until the release of Planet Pathfinder and Chaotic Compliance. With effectively four copies of Toon Kingdom, the deck was able to consistently put Toon Summon Skull on the board on the first turn, giving the opponent one turn to find a removal for Toon Kingdom before Toon Summon Skull started putting 2500 attack punches into their life points, which could be turned to at least 4000 when combined with either Rising Energy or Toon Rollback. The final deck in the finals was Mill, which used a combination of Hero's Shadow Scout, Warm Worm, and various stall cards to quickly mill out the opponent's deck. This was the newest evolution of Taya Burn, now known as Taya Mill. The deck used Dual Standby once again, not only to open with additional cards to use, but also to put the opponent one card closer to deck out, which matched the deck's goals perfectly. The winner emerged from the finals in a decisive 2-0 match, being Timmy from New Zealand, who claimed the first ever title of Dual Links World Champion. Outside of the finals, other popular decks from the World Championship that would show up in multiple people's lineups were Red Eye Zombies, Heavy Knight Control, and Fire King Nefties, with a few other decks sprinkled around other people's lineups as a one of Results from this tournament would echo through the ladder over the next few weeks, shaping the meta until the next event would shake the game to its very core. Set Sail for the Kingdom began on August 29th, 2017, bringing the main character of Yu-Gi-Oh, Yugi Moto, to the game. While Yami Yugi had been in the game since launch, Yugi Moto had not been in the game until this point, and with him came a couple of new skills. The most iconic of these from a fan of the anime's perspective was Grandpa's Cards, which added a copy of the five Exodia pieces to your deck at the start of the game. This was, and still is, the only way to use Exodia in Duel Links, as it takes your skill to play the deck as well as a minimum of a 25 card deck, balancing out the mechanic in a quicker game than the TCG. In addition, Yugi also came with the skill Access Denied, which, when under 1000 life points, locks both players from summoning effect monsters or activating monster effects until the user's next turn. However, overshadowing Yugi, his skills, and all of his cards would be a single monster added as a super rare lottery reward to the event. Toon Barrel Dragon is a Toon version of the previously released Barrel Dragon, having the same effect along with the standard Toon conditions of not being able to attack the turn he's summoned, and being able to attack directly if Toon World is active. What set Toon Barrel Dragon apart from the other Toons released up until this point was that Toon Barrel Dragon didn't need Toon World to be active to be summoned. This caveat allowed previous builds of 3-star Demotion Beatdown and Toons to merge their decks together, making a deck that could drop a Toon Barrel Dragon on the first turn with 3-star Demotion, then, if Toon World or Toon Kingdom was active the following turn, it could attack directly. This fusion, simply referred to as Toon Barrel Dragon on the ladder, quickly rose to take the spot of the top deck in the format, dethroning the previously top-tier Red Eye Zombie, though the latter was still powerful in the meta. Set Sail for the Kingdom would be remembered for years after as the event that introduced Toon Barrel Dragon, but it would also be known as the last character unlock event of the Duel Monsters era. At this point, the announcement of the next era of Duel Links had already been made, letting everyone know that Yu-Gi-Oh! GX would be added to the game in September. As the month approached, we had one more mini box release before the new era would begin, being Echoes of Silence.
Echoes of Silence was the sixth mini box and the final box release of the Duel Monsters era, released on August 30th, 2017. While the set had nothing of impact on release, it did have a couple of cards that would eventually become major players in the meta. The Silent Magician archetype, making their introduction here with Silent Magician level 4, level 8, and Silent Burning, would eventually become meta relevant with the release of further support in the future, but for now would be viewed as simply nostalgia bait. The last, and probably most unexpectedly powerful card of discussion from the set was Massive Morph, a trap that would double an opponent's monster's attack and defense for the turn on the condition that it could not attack you directly. While this seems like it might be a joke at first glance, this became a nearly instant kill card in burn decks thanks to Amazon Swordswoman, who could attack into the monster you boosted to deal massive amounts of damage to your opponent out of nowhere. Without dealing any prior damage, an opponent's monster with 2750 or more attack could instantly end the game with this combo. Beyond this, Echoes of Silence wouldn't impact the meta for the long term outside of the one card. This would leave the meta of Duel Links with Toon Barrel Dragon reigning supreme, followed closely by Red Eye Zombies. However, this could be considered the calm before the storm, as with the new era of Duel Links on the horizon, the next meta shakeup and the first true Tier 0 deck of Duel Links was about to rock the game to its very core. When we last left off, Duel Links was coming to the end of its first year and its first era. Toon Barrel Dragon, a card recently released in the Yugi Unlock event, had taken over the meta, combining the powerful 3-star Demotion deck with Toons, creating a deck that could remove threats through card effect and attack directly with the right cards. Red Eye Zombies was still a major threat, following closely behind Toon Barrel Dragon in terms of success rate, writing off their numerous consistency cards. Beyond these two, a couple of fringe decks known as Mausoleum Invader and Psychic were popping up here and there with successes, but neither were near the level of the previous two. We now continue our look back over the history of Konami's venture into the mobile market with Yu-Gi-Oh!, its ups and downs, and its intricate and ever-evolving metagame. This is the history of Duel Links. Generation Next would be the main box that officially launched the GX era, released on September 21st, 2017. While the GX world would not launch for another week, this set would be the mark of the beginning of the new era, as the power level of cards across the board with this set would set the standard for releases going forward. Starting with support for previous decks, Red Eye Zombie would get another consistency boost thanks to Samurai Skull, which sends a zombie from deck to grave upon summon. It would also allow you to special summon Gozuki from your deck if it was removed by card effect, meaning your opponent standardly would have to remove it by battle. While not a consistency booster, Bacon Saver would also fit nicely into the deck thanks to its battle fading effect once per duel, which was easy to establish thanks to Samurai Skull and Gozuki. Ninja would see further support in Mass Ninja Ibizu, Armor Ninjutsu Art of Alchemy, and Ninjutsu Art Notebook, providing back row disruption, draw power, and searching for their Ninjutsu Art cards. As for new decks, three new decks would see their real start here. Horus the Black Flame Dragon would take the place of Silent Magician from the previous set as a spell immune level monster deck, seeing success thanks to level 6 having the same level of spell immunity as Silent Magician level 8, and level 8 stopping spells in general. Evil Dragon Ananta would see experimentation in its own deck, using the newly released worm monsters like Carteros, Lynx, and Barsis to provide its summoning conditions. Hazy Flame Beatdown would see far more success here, combining the previously released Hazy Flame Sphinx and Beast Rising with the newly released Flame Tiger and Canatar to form the backbone of a new beatdown strategy, providing consistent power boost to Hazy Flame Sphinx, which is untargetable, making it difficult to remove from the field. As for general support, Magical Something provided recursion for quick play spells like Enemy Controller. Card Guard provided one-time protection to any card on the field, which would occasionally pop up in decks focused around protecting a specific card. However, the card that truly began the new era of Duel Links was undoubtedly Floodgate Trap Hole, a trap card that could permanently flip any monster face down upon their summon. This would go on to see play in any deck running trap cards, as it was a one-card answer to any boss monster, being truly the first of its kind in terms of generic monster disruption. Generation Next would shake up the established meta heavily, bringing in the new era of GX, punctuated by the release of GX World one week later. Launched on September 28th, 2017, GX World was the first new world added to Duel Links, bringing with it iconic characters from the Yu-Gi-Oh! GX anime, like Jaden Yuki, Chaz Princeton, Aster Phoenix, Bastion Misawa, and Alexis Rhodes. 
These five characters would also bring with them their own unique cards and skills, similar to past character releases. Jaden was focused around the original elemental hero monsters, like Avion, Burstinatrix, and Flame Wingman, but these would not be useful at all in the meta. Instead, his cards Wing Karibo and Flute of the Summoning Karibo would occasionally see play in stall-focused decks as a way to both deck thin and stall for a turn. Chaz Princeton was focused on the Ojama archetype, which would see experimentation thanks to their field lockdown abilities, but not much success overall. His skill, Ojama Go, on the other hand, would see success in stall decks as a way to clog up the opponent's board with Ojama tokens, but would be the only relevant piece of support to come from him. Astro Phoenix would come with his iconic Destiny heroes, like Malicious and Plasma, which would see success in the later GX era as more support was released. He would also bring two skills that would see success, in Bring It and Destiny Calling. Bring It was useful in that you could trade any card in your hand for a copy of Destiny Hero Plasma, allowing a player to tech the monster into a deck capable of flooding the board with monsters for its tribute requirement. Destiny Calling would put a copy of Dark City onto the field, allowing Destiny Hero monsters to effectively punch up to stronger monsters. Bastion Misawa would bring his chemical monsters, such as Hydro Get On, Oxy Get On, Carbon Get On, and Water Dragon. Of these, only Hydrogedon would see play in the newer variant of Dinosaur decks thanks to its field swarming ability. His skills, however, would be six variations of the same ability, allowing the user to activate a copy of either Eureka, Molten Destruction, Gaia Power, Rising Air Current, Luminous Spark, or Mystic Plasma Zone for free when under 3,000 life points based on which version you ran. Alexis Rhodes would be the most notable, and infamous, among all the new releases, as with her came her upgraded cards from the Arc 5 anime, the Cyber Angels. Cyber Angel is a ritual archetype, focused around tributing each other to Ritual Summon, then gaining some effect when summoned or tributed. These cards include Cyber Angel Takini, Benton, Edaton, Machine Angel Ritual, Machine Angel Absolute Ritual, and Cyber Petite Angel, essentially forming a new deck from those cards alone. Dakini would be considered the go-to boss monster of the deck, removing a monster from the field on summon, inflicting piercing damage, and recycling a ritual monster or spell back into your hand at the end of the turn. This, combined with Benton's effect to search out a light fairy when tributed, Machine Angel Ritual's graveyard protection, and Cyber Petite Angel's searching ability, alongside all of the previously released ritual support, would propel Cyber Angel to tier 0 status on release, completely overpowering everything that had come before it. In addition, simultaneously to this launch would be two new structure decks that would add further cards to the game. Released on the same day as GX World on September 28, 2017, being the third and fourth structure deck releases, Structure Deck Legendary Warrior and Heroes Rising would bring new cards to the game as well. With Legendary Warriors, a majority of the cards were once again non-impactful to the overall meta, but two in particular would find usage later on. DD Warrior would be one of these, banishing any monster it battles with along with itself. This would become useful in stall variants as a form of monster removal, stalling out a battle phase in the early game. The other card would be Assault Armor, which can make any warrior attack twice in a turn on the condition that it was the only monster you controlled when you equipped it. This might not seem powerful now, but would eventually become the linchpin in an OTK in the later GX era. The other deck released at the same time, Hero Rising, would introduce Elemental Hero Blazeman, who was unquestionably the most useful of the Elemental Hero cards released at the time, being able to search out Palmerization on Summon and then copy the attribute, attack, and defense of any hero monster in your deck by sending it to the graveyard. While he wouldn't see competitive play until later, he did lay the groundwork for a viable Elemental Hero deck at GX's launch. While these two decks were not nearly as impactful as the character releases, the GX era was off to an explosive start, which would lead into the next mini box one month later. Released on October 17, 2017, Servant of Kings was the first mini box of the GX era. Following up Generation Next was always going to be tough, but Servant of Kings managed to do so successfully by introducing more generic cards to the game that could be used in almost any deck. The cover card, Dark Magician of Chaos, was unfortunately not one of these, but was still viable in its own right, allowing the user to retrieve any spell card from their graveyard at the end of the turn he summoned. While not generically splashable, he would see success later on in spellcaster-focused decks. Similarly, Maneater Bug, one of the classic Yu-Gi-Oh! effect monsters, would be introduced here and find success in stall strategies, similar to DD Warrior, but wouldn't be played outside of them. Force Raider would once again set the bar for non-tribute normal monsters at 1900 attack, a value that would not be topped for some time. Moving into generic splashable cards, Forbidden Chalice would be introduced here, a quick play spell that could negate any monster's effect by increasing their attack by 400 that turn. 
Being versatile in both an effect negator and an attack boost in battle let Chalice see immediate play, being one of the most useful quick play spells in the game next to enemy controller. Similar splash ability could be found in Wall of Disruption, a trap card that, upon an opponent's attack declaration, drops all of their attack monsters by 800 points for every monster on their field permanently. This would see similar play to Mirror Wall before it, being more useful in some cases as the attack cut was a fixed number between 800 and 2400, which in most cases could be more than the halving of Mirror Wall. The set would move to impact the meta, bringing new generic staples and continuing the pushes started with Generation Next. This wouldn't be the only push to the meta, as the next GX character was introduced just one week later. Beginning on October 25th, 2017, Dr. Crowler's Tricky Tests would introduce Dr. Valen Crowler, the first GX event character. With him came a new control deck and his key archetype of Ancient Gears, a series of monsters that are immune to spell and trap cards while attacking. This was most prevalent in the two main cards, Ancient Gear Golem and Knight, the former of which could be considered the boss monster of the strategy, adding piercing damage onto the standard Ancient Gear effect. Golem would be fairly easy to summon with Crowler thanks to his skill Middle Age Mechs, which would start the game with a copy of Ancient Gear Castle on the field, building up counters as you summon monsters that could be used as tributes for Ancient Gear Golem. This archetype would be played alongside control staples up to this point like Sergeant Electro, Heavy Knight of the Flame, and Super Rush Headlong to control the board while building up your big finisher in Golem. This character seeing immediate meta success would set the standard for character releases in the GX era, having each character bring something of meta relevance, whether it be cards or skills. However, some of them were far overtuned at this point, which led the game into its first balance update of the GX era. Going into effect on November 6, 2017, the first balance patch of the GX era was the first ever list to introduce more than one card to the banned list. Out the gate, Machine Angel Ritual was limited to one, which was an attempt to rein in the Tier 0 Cyber Angels which had been tearing through the meta with reckless abandon up to this point. Hitting this spell in particular was because Cyber Petite Angel could not search for Absolute Ritual, and this spell provided protection from the grave, which could be annoying to deal with in multiples. While this in no way killed the deck, it would bring Cyber Angel's power level down to a level where other decks could compete with it. Beyond this, Champion's Vigilance would also be limited to one as an answer to the steadily growing popularity of 3-star Demotion Dark Magician on the ladder, which had been rising as of late to counter the ever-present Cyber Angels on the ladder. Finally, Red Eye Spirit would be limited to two to prevent a perceived Red Eye Zombie takeover with Cyber Angels nerfed, which never came to be but was still a safe precaution to take. As for skills, Creator would be buffed to include a few more powerful cards in its pool, and Balance would be nerfed to no longer guaranteed the ratios used, as Handless Beatdown up to this point was abusing the skill to ensure they open with only one monster in their opening hand. This balance update would be considered a success overall, leading into the next main box just one day later. Galactic Origin was the second main box of the GX era, released on November 7, 2017. This set would introduce Saphira, Queen of Dragons, which would allow you to either draw two and discard one, discard a card from your opponent's hand, or return a light monster from grave to hand in the end phase where you either ritual summon it or send a light monster from hand or deck to grave. This one monster would be combined with Cyber Angel's natural tendency to make ritual monsters every turn, giving Cyber Angels another boost of consistency, which would see play from time to time, but it was debatable as to which was the better build, with or without Saphira. The other major deck to come from this set was Gladiator Beasts, making their Duel Links debut with the cards Lakari, Mermillo, Bestiari, Dimakari, Herculinos, Narokios, and Esadari. The archetype's goal involved attacking with their monsters and then tagging out into another monster in the deck, activating that monster's effect on summon, generating advantage, and eventually contact fusing their boss monsters, which would be the first meta appearance of contact fusion. This archetype, while not extremely prevalent at launch, would become a meta mainstay over time, as more balance changes would push it up in the meta. Into the Void would see play in many OTK decks, as it provided a draw as long as you have at least three cards in hand after playing it, at the cost of discarding your entire hand at the end of the turn, which most OTK decks get around simply by killing the opponent before the end of the turn comes. Impenetrable Attack would see play in Gladiator Beast and Hazy Flame Beatdown decks as a way to protect your monster for a turn, triggering the Gladiator Beast tagout effect if used in response to a battle. 
However, the most important card from this set that would go on to shape the meta around it was Cosmic Cyclone, a quick play spell that, for 1000 life points, could banish any spell or trap on the field. This would be the first truly generic spell and trap removal option, not only providing spell and trap removal, but also a way to drop your life points in order to activate skills with a life point loss requirement. In the end, Galactic Origin would be a very successful set overall, giving a new variation to Cyber Angels, introducing a new meta deck in Gladiator Beast, and giving the game its first generic spell and trap removal in Cosmic Cyclone. This would all culminate in the next KC Cup taking place just two days later. Beginning on November 9th, 2017, the second ever KC Cup would test the waters of the new balance update with a heavy competitive landscape. While many were expecting the absolute dominance of Cyber Angel and Red Eye Zombies going into this KC Cup, the results of the top 10 would show not only very little Red Eye Zombies, but instead the dominant force of the meta call that was Ninjas. Ninjas came out of nowhere to surprise many players, as the deck's boss monster Black Dragon Ninja was a direct counter to Takini by banishing itself in response to Takini's effect letting the effect fail, then returning to the field immediately by its own conditions. This counterplay would let Ninja see a good portion of the top cut alongside Cyber Angel and Red Eye Zombie, the latter of which underperformed in the face of the surprise Ninja turnout. The November KC Cup would give good insights into the meta going forward, showing that the all-powerful Cyber Angel deck was compatible and that any deck could return to relevance with the right environment. This would be the meta environment for the next month, as the next mini box wouldn't release until a month later. Blades of Spirits was the second mini box of the GX era, released on December 1st, 2017. This set would introduce the six samurai archetype to Duel Links, focusing around the boss monster Great Shogun Sheen, who could special summon himself if you controlled at least two six samurai monsters. Sheen's ability restricted the opponent to only being able to use one spell or trap per turn, which could be useful as long as the opponent's one spell or trap didn't out Sheen, which would allow them to use more spell or traps. Six Samurai's introduction in the set included the original Six and Hand of the Six Samurai, so the deck was not really at a competitive level yet, but could easily become relevant with the right support wave. Beyond this, other archetypes would receive one or two pieces of support here as well. Fire Kings received Barong, who could search any Fire King in the standby phase after he's destroyed by a card effect, giving further synergy to the Fire King Island in Yaksha. Gemini decks would gain a beat stick in Neos Alias, but he wouldn't be used much until later support made him relevant. Hazy Flame Beatdown gained new tools in the form of Hazy Flame Cerberus and Hazy Glory, giving the deck more explosive summons and more untargetable beaters to use. Temple of the Mind's Eye would find a home in some variants of Stall, reducing or raising any damage dealt to either player to 1000. Parallel Twister would find tech spots in decks focused around field spell skills, providing an easy piece of spot removal for the cost of your field spell. Fire Formation Gyoko would see play as a counterpart to Jing Zhen Hu and Sergeant Electro, being able to only target one speller trap, but making it unable to activate in response. Finally, Powerful Rebirth provided decks based on lower level monsters a Grave Revival effect, the first of its kind since the Shallow Grave. Overall, Blades of Spirit didn't have any immediate impact on the meta proper, but would give some decks more powerful tools to work with, leading into the next two character unlock events. Beginning on December 19th, 2017, Bonds' Spooky Zombie Party would introduce Bonds to Duel Links, and with them a couple of skills that would find homes rather quickly. Bonds would bring the skills Posthumous Army and Straight to the Grave to the game, the former being used as a way to lock certain type-restricted decks out of the graveyard by making them all zombies, and the latter being used in Red Eye Zombie as a reliable 200 attack bonus at all times. While Bonds' release only brought useful skills with them, the next character unlock event that took place two weeks later would bring yet another character to the game in Arcana. Duelist Chronicles, Battle City Begins, would begin on December 27th, 2017, bringing Arcana, the Master of Dark Magician, to the game. What Bonds lacked in relevant cards, Arcana more than made up for, bringing Dark Magic Curtain, Magician's Rod, and Illusion Magic for Dark Magician strategies. More importantly than those, Arcana would bring Anti-Magic Arrows, a Duel Links exclusive card that would lock up all spell and traps at the start of the battle phase, making your attacks go through uninterrupted. He would also bring powerful skills in the form of A Trick Up the Sleeve and Show of Nightmares, the former guaranteeing a high-level spellcaster to start in your opening hand, while the latter would randomly add back a spell from grave to hand hand once per duel, as long as you had at least three spell cards in Grave. Bonds and Arcana would both have their uses in the meta overall, whether it be through a generic spell or an ability in a meta deck, but both would help tie players over until the next main box less than one week later.
Primal Burst was the third main box of the GX era, released on December 31st, 2017. Once again, the set was focused around introducing new archetypes to the game to try and shake up the meta a bit, as we were still looking at a Cyber Angel dominated meta at this point. Primal Burst would attempt to break it up firstly by introducing the Dark World archetype, focused around Snow, Unlight of the Dark World, and other monsters such as Cerule and Rainbow, and spell and traps such as Dark World Lightning, Dark Smog, and the Forces of Darkness. This archetype's gimmick was to get their cards discarded by card effect to trigger effects in the graveyard, but were a bit underpowered on release due to their main TCG support cards not being imported at the same time. Volcanics would also see their start here in the form of Volcanic Doomfire, Rocket, and Shell along with Blaze Accelerator, which could turn volcanic shells into monster removal, then replacing the shell immediately after with its effect. While the monster removal was useful, Doomfire was too cumbersome to get onto the board to see play, but the core of Volcanics would be considerably useful in the near future with different support cards. Lightsworn would see their first wave of support here, most prominently in Lila, Lightsworn Sorceress, and Jane, Lightsworn Paladin, but wouldn't be a standalone deck for some time, seeing Splash play as options for other decks. Golden Ladybug would find an instant home in stall strategies, giving the decks an additional 500 life points a turn just for staying in your hand. Finally, the Bamboo Sword series of cards would be introduced here, including Broken, Cursed, and Golden Bamboo Sword. These cards would almost immediately see play alongside a previously released card named Woodland Sprite, forming the basis of Woodland Sprite FTK, a deck that used Woodland Sprite's effect to send equip spells to the grave to burn the opponent for 500 each, alongside the Bamboo Sword package, giving plenty of equip spells to fuel this effect while also drawing with Golden Bamboo Sword and triggering the effect of Cursed Bamboo Sword. Primal Burst would mainly set the stage for future releases, but the Woodland Sprite FTK would permeate the meta for some time after this set's release, leading us into the next set of balance changes. On January 9th, 2018, a new set of balance changes would go into effect for Duel Links, bringing both new cards to the ban list and a much needed skill rebalancing. For the ban list, Machine Angel Ritual would be moved from limited to semi-limited, but would be joined by Cyber Angel Takini, effectively making Cyber Angel players only able to use two copies between the two cards, being the first effective implementation of this aspect of the Duel Links ban list. As for skills, 3-star Demotion would once again receive a nerf in its usage, only being activatable when under 1,000 life points instead of paying 3,000 to activate it, in addition to being once per duel. This change would effectively kill the deck's meta usage, as you now had to reach the 1,000 threshold through other cards rather than the skill itself, making it difficult to play in any 7-star deck. The catch to this change was that Kazajin, Suijin, and Songa of the Thunder could use this skill at any life total, making the originally intended use for the skill still possible for the Paradox Brothers Ace Monsters. Restart would see an adjustment to show your opponent the hand you are sending back if you used it, giving away in most situations what deck you were playing. Finally, Mind Scan was changed to only be usable from the third turn onward, as opposed to at any point in time, though the life point restriction remained. There was also a buff to Middle Age mechs on this patch, activating Ancient Gear Castle at the start of the user's turn rather than the start of the game, so it couldn't be removed before your turn started. Overall, this balance update would be seen as another attempt to push Cyber Angels more in balance with the rest of the meta, essentially pushing the Saphira Cyber Angel variant to become the primary build of the deck. In addition to these changes, Konami would introduce a new way of delivering cards to players three days later in the form of the game's first ever selection box. Selection Box Volume 1 would release on January 12, 2018, bringing the game's first ever set of reprints. Up to this point, Duel Links had 9 main boxes and 8 mini boxes, making the barrier to entry for new players a bit high, as they would need to go into multiple boxes just to gather meta staples to play at a top tier setting. To help alleviate this barrier to entry, Konami introduced the Selection Boxes, a series of boxes that would take the best cards from the previous year of the game and put them into one easily accessible set, making it easier to get older cards that were seeing play. This first collection would include cards like Sphere Karibo, Sonic Bird, Senju of the Thousand Hands, Reinforced Human Psychic Borg, Gozuki, Mecha Phantom Beast Hamstrat, Sergeant Electro, Destructotron, Red Eye Zombie Dragon, Ninja Grandmaster Sasuke, Soul Exchange, Order to Charge, Double Summon, Super Rush Headlong, Mirror Wall, Divine Wrath, Ninjutsu Art of Transformation, Zing Zhen Hu, and Wild Tornado to name a handful. In addition, the selection box would introduce new exclusive cards to it as an incentive for older players to still buy into the set. The only card among these that would see any kind of relevant play would be Dark World Dealings, giving the previously mentioned Dark World deck a reliable way to discard their monsters. 
While the set may just seem like a good thing overall, it did come with the catch that it was a time exclusive set, only becoming available at certain parts of the year, effectively making it so that players that missed it would not have access to the exclusive cards inside. This issue would become more apparent in the future, but for now it was excusable as the exclusive cards really didn't do that much to the meta. The same could not be said for what followed two weeks later, as Konami had made a glaring mistake in their ban list from earlier this month. Effective January 24th, 2018, just over two weeks after the last ban list, an emergency ban list was put in place, limiting the monster Woodland Sprite. This was done in response to the growing presence of the Woodland Sprite FTK, which saw a major spike in play after the last ban list completely missed it, causing the ranked ladder to be filled with a solitaire deck. Limiting Woodland Sprite would slow the deck down considerably, but it wouldn't kill it overall. Konami mentioned in this post about the banlist that they would also be watching the Bamboo Sword cards very closely, as if the deck continued, they would take further action on those cards as well. This would be followed through, as just under two weeks later, on February 5th, 2018, Golden Bamboo Sword would also be emergency limited to match Woodland Sprite, completely killing the FTK. The set of changes would establish that Konami did not want any form of a consistent OTK or FTK in Duel Links, and would not hesitate to hit problem cards when presented. In addition to these changes, the initial emergency hit would come just one day before the release of the next set. Resonance of Contrast was the third mini box of the GX era, released on January 25th, 2018. The set would attempt to give the original Red Eyes Black Dragon a push into the meta with the release of Red Eyes Slash Dragon, a fusion monster requiring the original and any warrior. Whenever it attacked, Slash Dragon could equip any warrior from the graveyard to it as an equip spell, and it could send any card equipped to it to the graveyard to negate any targeting effect from the opponent. This unique effect would allow the card to see moderate success out the gate, but it wouldn't be a mainstay in the presence of Cyber Angels or Red Eye Zombie. The Bujin archetype would get its start here with Bujin, Yamato, and Arasuda, but wouldn't see further play until support was released. Vampire Grace was the first piece of vampire support since Crimson Kingdom, but wouldn't see play until further support released. In the end, the only card that would see major meta success was Snipe Hunter, a monster that could discard a card from your hand to have a two-thirds chance to destroy any card on the field. This would see splash play in various decks, but its most prominent usage would be alongside the Volcanic Engine from Primal Burst, providing a discard engine through copies of Volcanic Shell to fuel Snipe Hunter's effect. Overall, Resonance of Contrast was considered more as a preview of things to come, but would bring Snipe Hunter into the meta, giving one last shakeup before the KC Cup two weeks later. The third KC Cup began on February 8th, 2018. While the KC Cup was nothing new at this point, this particular KC Cup would be more interesting to the prior two, as this one gave any player that ended in the top 600 of their region a free pass into Stage 2 of the World Championship Qualifier later that year. Because of this, the competition of this particular KC Cup would see a sharp rise compared to the past, as there was now a tangible reward for doing well. With that said, the dominant deck was Sephira Cyber Angel, the newest evolution of the Cyber Angel deck since its hit in January. Zephira, once used as a tech option, was now a core piece of the deck, providing a consistent body that also provided its other effects every turn thanks to Cyber Angel's knack for ritual summoning fast and often. Following closely behind would be Red Eye Zombie, as the deck had seen a couple of new additions with time thanks to Zombie Skull and Bacon Saver, giving the deck more consistency in its already consistent game plan. Among the other top decks of the tournament, such as Gladiator Beasts, Dinosaur, Hazy Flame, and Stall, the surprise success of the KC Cup would be Magnet Warriors, which would take first place in the world. This deck used Delta the Magnet Warrior in combination with cards like Beta the Electromagnetic Warrior and Powerful Rebirth to quickly fill up the grave with Magnet Warrior monsters, fueling both the effect of Delta to summon Valkyrion and to summon Gaia Plate the Earth Giant. In addition to this, the deck used Storm to clear out used copies of Powerful Rebirth and to clear opponents' back row, making an open field for Gaia and Valkyrion to attack for gain. This breakout success would have been enough to establish Magnet Warriors as a mainstay of the meta, however a couple of new releases over the next week would once again change what decks were on top of the meta. Starting on February 13th, 2018, Mokuba Kaiba would be unlockable via a new set of bingo missions, a set of challenges for a player to receive rewards from. This was the first, and so far only, character not to be tied with a world release or a time-sensitive event, making Mokuba Kaiba a bit of an anomaly in the character roster. Card-wise, Mokuba brought Ancient Rules, a spell card that could special summon any level 5 or higher normal monster from your hand, and Dark Flare Dragon, a 2400 attack dragon that could special summon itself by banishing a light and a dark from your graveyard. While these two cards were notable, the most important thing that Mokuba brought with him was his skill Kaiba Corp Bling. 
At the time, this skill could be used when you lost 1800 life points to search for any one prismatic or glossy rarity card in your deck at random, making card rarity an impactful piece of deck building. However, this would not see play until much later, as for an additional 200, you could use Yami Yugi's skill Destiny Draw, which let you choose what card to add on top of searching for any card in your deck. The effects of Mokuba's launch wouldn't be felt until much later, but it did give players a good transition point into the complete meta overhaul that followed. Abyss Encounters was the fourth main box of the GX era, released on February 20th, 2018. The set would completely reshape the meta around it by introducing support for three deck types that would go on to be the face of the new meta, being Archfiend, Alien, and Sea Stealth Attack. Of the three, the least impactful of these would be Archfiend, a deck centered around the newly released boss monster Archfiend Emperor, the first Lord of Horror. The deck focused around using lower level fiend monsters, like Trance Archfiend and Doomdog Otheros, to quickly get your larger Archfiend monsters into the graveyard with the skill Fiend Farewell, and then bring them back with the new trap card Call of the Archfiend, which could revive a higher level fiend once per turn as a continuous trap. Sea Stealth Attack would be another powerhouse deck to come from this set, centered around the titular card, which in combination with Umi would give spell and trap protection and monster removal for your higher level water monsters. This was done in combination with the skill Mythic Depths and the monster card Citadel Whale, which could special summon itself by tributing two water monsters, searching for Sea Stealth Attack on summon, and giving your water monsters once per turn targeting negation. Other monsters commonly played in the deck from this set would be Abyss Soldier for targeted bouncing, Warrior of Atlantis for a 2100 body under Umi, and a searcher for the tech card of Legendary Ocean, Gishki Chain as a 2000 attack body under Umi that could stack the top three cards of your deck, Gishki Beast as a one card Citadel Whale when played with the other Gishki monsters, and Fishborg Planter as an additional body to summon Citadel Whale. The final, and arguably most impactful of the new decks from the set, would be Aliens, a deck focused around spreading eight counters, which could be used to lower an opponent's monster's attack and defense by 300 for each when battling an alien, or to activate their various effects. Alien Overlord would be considered the boss monster of the deck, which could special summon itself by removing two A counters from the field and placed one on an opponent's monster once per turn. Alongside this would be Alien Telepath, which could remove A counters from an opponent's monster to destroy a spell or trap, Warrior, which placed two A counters on anything that destroyed it in battle, and Grey, which placed an A counter when flipped and drew a card when destroyed. Their monsters, however, were nothing compared to the main two spell and trap cards used to push the deck into top tier status, being A Cell Recombination Device and Brainwashing Beam. Recombination Device would let you send an alien from deck to grave to place A counters on your opponent's monster equal to the level of the sent monster then banished itself from Grave the next turn to add an alien monster from deck to hand, providing quick A counter distribution and searching in a single card. Brainwashing Beam proved to be a huge payoff for spreading A counters, taking control of an opponent's monster that had A counters on it, removing one on each of your turns, and keeping it as long as it still had A counters on it. Abyss Encounters completely changed up the meta with its release, rivaling the power level of the meta mainstays up to this point and even eclipsing them in parts. This meta-defining set would be followed up by arguably the best structure deck up to this point just one week later. Destiny Rulers was the fifth structure deck, released on February 28, 2018. Compared to the previous structure decks, Destiny Rulers was noteworthy as it introduced a slew of new archetypal support for the Destiny heroes released with Aster Phoenix. This includes Destiny Hero Celestial, who could banish itself in another Destiny Hero from Grave to draw two, Drill Dark, who could special summon another Destiny Hero from hand when summoned, Dark Angel, who could both clog the opponent's board and disable their spells, Dreamer, who provided battle protection from the graveyard, and Dangerous, who can send Destiny Heroes from deck to grave once per turn. In addition to the Destiny Heroes, this structure deck would also introduce the Vision Hero archetype with Vision Hero Vion and Vision Hero Trinity. Trinity was the highest attack hero monster when summoned with 5,000 attack and could attack three times in a turn, but couldn't attack directly, while Vion could send a hero monster from deck to grave on summon, then banish a hero from grave to search for polymerization. While these were all not immediately impactful, they were leaps and bounds better than any of the structure decks that had come before it and would greatly affect the meta with future releases. As for the current meta, it would once again see a shakeup in the form of a new set released just two weeks later. Rampage of the Forest was the fourth mini box of the GX era, released on March 14th, 2018. The set would introduce the Sylvan archetype to Duel Links, a set of plant monsters revolving around excavating them from the top of your deck to activate different effects. Each of the Sylvan monsters had an effect to excavate a number of cards from the top of your deck and sent the plants among them to the graveyard, but each also had a unique effect when sent to the grave this way. 
Sylvan Kuma Shrumo would destroy a spell or trap, Martial Leaf would destroy a monster, Hermitry would let you rearrange the top three cards of your deck in any order, letting you set up your next excavate play, and Guardi Oak would take any plant from the grave and put it on top of the deck, letting you excavate it for another effect proc. In addition to this, the deck played World Carrot Weight Champion from the set, which could special summon itself from the grave by sending a plant from hand or field to grave, as well as Rose Lover, a card trader card that could banish itself from grave to summon any plant monster from your hand. As impactful as Sylvans were on release, becoming meta staple almost immediately, one other card from this set would gain notoriety quickly. Hey Grenade was a spell card that, when played, would return all set spell and traps back to the hand. This was considered immensely powerful immediately, allowing a player to remove all of an opponent's back row options instantly to make their initial play. While not popular out the gate, Grenade would see play for the foreseeable future in any deck that needed to set up through back row, making it one of the most notable, and eventually infamous, cards of the GX era. The set would be meta-defining to the game as a whole for multiple reasons, both short-term and long-term, leading into the next GX character unlock event. Beginning on March 28th, 2018, Awaken Rainbow Dragon brought Jesse Anderson to the game, and with him, his series of Crystal Beast monsters. This series of monsters was all about becoming continuous spells on destruction, then using them from that state to activate other effects. While not impactful to the meta as a whole, Crystal Beast would see play later on as an engine for other decks in a rogue setting. As for Jesse Anderson's exclusive skills, Crystal Power was the only one of note here, once per turn boosting all of your monsters by 200 for each continuous spell on your field. This would see eventual play in decks focused around continuous spells, but not for some time. This event, alongside the structure deck Draconic Knights, which released three days later, would both be seen as failures in the short term, as neither impacted the meta in the slightest at the time. However, the meta shakeup was coming, as three days after Draconic Knights, the next main box would release, and it would come with the new powerhouses of the meta. When we last left off, the GX era had gone into full swing. After a long stint of time with Cyber Angels as the undeniable best deck in the format, the meta had finally begun to swing back into a balanced state with the release of Aliens, Sea Stealth Attack, and Sylvans, with all three fighting for top spots in the meta. Following closely behind was Saphira Cyber Angels, Red Eye Zombie, Gladiator Beasts, and Hazy Flames, all seeing varying levels of success in the new meta environment. We now continue our look back over the history of Konami's venture into the mobile market with Yu-Gi-Oh!, its ups and downs, and its intricate and ever-evolving metagame. This is the history of Duel Links. Valiant Souls was the fifth main box of the GX era, released on April 3rd, 2018. The set would follow in the steps of Abyss Encounters before it, as it would introduce support for three decks, making them the new focal point of the meta, being Amazonas, Girgia, and Hero. Amazonas had already been in the meta here and there due to the versatility of their cards, but would finally see their own full meta deck thanks to the release of Amazonas Baby Tiger and Amazonas Onslaught. Baby Tiger was useful in its ability to summon itself from the graveyard when an Amazonas monster was summoned, giving the deck tribute fodder for cards like Enemy Controller and Force Massive Swings. Amazonas Onslaught, on the other hand, arguably made the deck function, as it would let you freely summon an Amazonas monster from hand during the battle phase and banish any opponent's monster after battling with an Amazonas monster, making Baby Tiger another form of removal. These two cards, combined with the soon-to-be-released Amazonas Princess and Amazonas Queen, would turn Amazonas into meta staples as one of the most reliable battle-focused decks in the game. Girgia impacted the meta almost immediately on launch, bringing Girgi Attacker, Girgi Anchor, and Girgi Arsenal, each bringing their own form of control. Girgi Attacker let you flip itself face down each turn, and when flipped, destroyed spell and traps up to the number of Girgia monsters you control. Girgi Anchor did the same for monsters, and Girgi Arsenal let you tribute it to bring out any other Girgia from your deck in defense mode. While the deck might seem extremely slow at first glance, Ties of the Brethren, released in Abyss Encounters, let you summon out the other two if you had any one on the field at the cost of your battle phase that turn and 2,000 life points. The quick field swarming, combined with their control effects on being flipped, made the deck into essentially a new age version of the clown control deck, even going so far as to run cards like Desert Sunlight to act as a battle floodgate and effect trigger if any of your Girgia monsters were face down. This, along with other battle position control cards like Enemy Controller, Curse of Anubis, and the event exclusive card Pulse Mines would turn Girgia into a potent control threat in the meta. Finally, Hero would get a massive shift in playstyle thanks to the addition of Mask Change, a quick play spell that would let you change any hero monster into a masked hero of the same attribute. This would instantly be combined with the Destiny and Vision hero monsters released in Destiny Ruler to form the newly coined Masked Destiny hero deck, 
as all of the Destiny and Vision hero monsters were dark attribute, allowing for mass change to turn them into the powerful mass hero Anki. Anki was a 2800 attack monster that could either attack directly for half damage, or search for a mass change upon destroying a monster by battle. The interesting part of the latter effect was that Mass Change could be used on him again to bring out a new copy of Anki, allowing him to attack again effectively, but the search effect was only once per turn. This, along with Girgia, would become an instant mainstay of the meta, with Amazon as following suit a month later with their additional support. Aside from the new meta decks, the set would also introduce cards that would see play in various different strategies. Dark World Dealings would be brought out of its selection box exclusivity here, making Dark Worlds buildable for anyone who had missed it previously. Needle Sealing was the first truly generic board wipe trap being niche in its applications requiring four monsters on the field, but would see play in slower decks. Finally, Paleozoic Kanadia would be seen as a powerful tech choice, flipping a monster face down on activation, then becoming a body on the field when another trap was activated while in the graveyard. The set brought many changes to the meta, which would be felt almost immediately, as the next KC Cup began just two days later. Starting on April 5th, 2018, the fourth KC Cup would begin, bringing the previously used format from the third KC Cup, offering another opportunity to skip stage one of the WCQ by placing in the top 600 of your region here. This tournament, though very soon after the last box, gave us a good look into the competitive landscape of Duel Links, primarily into the performance of decks released since the last KC Cup. Some of the decks that saw success, but not a lot of it, would include Archfiend, Sea Stealth Attack, Alien, Hazy Flame, and Stall which saw a couple of top spots, but not nearly as many as the four top decks. In fourth overall would be Girgia, riding high off its debut in the previous set. The power of dropping three monsters, all capable of controlling the board at once, then backing it up with further control and back road, made Girgia extremely powerful, but the deck essentially lived or died on seeing a copy of Ties of the Brethren to win, leading most builds to either run Restart or Balance to ensure seeing a copy of it early. In third overall would be Saphira Cyber Angel, the newest iteration of the Cyber Angel strategy. This deck was essentially unchanged from its variant in the previous KC Cup, barring a couple of tech choices. The remaining two decks would actually see an equal amount of representation in the top cut, being Sylvan's and Mass Destiny Hero. Sylvan's was still going strong off its release, using generic plant support cards like Rose Lover and World Carrot Weight Champion to quickly put Hermitry and Guardioak onto the field, then repeatedly excavating copies of Kuma Shroomo and Marshall Leaf to control the board. Most builds at this point were also opting to play spells that could discard cards from the hand to the graveyard to help start Rose Lover and Carrot Weight plays, such as Tribute to the Doomed and Dark World Lightning, boosting their consistency. The other top deck of this KC Cup was Mass Destiny Heroes, whose massive success could be almost entirely attributed to the release of Mass Change and Mass Hero Anki. Combining the easily summonable boss monster with certain hero cards like Malicious, who could banish himself from Grave to summon a copy from deck, Celestial, who could banish himself in another Destiny hero from Grave to draw two, and Vion, who could send either of the previous two to the Grave on Summon and Search Polymerization, would bring the deck into the forefront as the deck to beat for the format. This KC Cup was living proof that the format was still consistently changing with each set release, and it wouldn't stop here, as the next set would once again bring another archetype into the meta. Visions of Ice was the fifth mini-box of the GX era, released on May 1st, 2018. The set would introduce the Spellbook and Prophecy archetype, a series of spells and monsters respectively that synergize with each other to generate massive amounts of card advantage off their play starters. Opening either Spellbook Magician of Prophecy or Spellbook of Secrets could generate an insane amount of advantage through their standard combo, creating a chain of searches to dig deeper into your deck and set up for one of their various boss monsters used for the strategy, such as Reaper of Prophecy, Prophecy Destroyer, or Dark Magician of Chaos. This was further backed up by Spellbook of Fate, a quick play spell that, by banishing three spellbook cards from your graveyard while you control a spellcaster monster, provided non-targeting monster banishing removal, the first of its kind for Duel Links. By being non-targeting, you were able to choose which monster to banish after your opponent's opportunity to respond, meaning that there wasn't much your opponent could do to stop the effect. This was used in tandem with the previously released card trader card, That Grass Looks Greener, which would mill your deck until you had the same number of cards in your deck as your opponent, allowing the user to fill up their grave with spellbook spells for fate and spellcaster monsters for life, which could revive any spellcaster monster from the grave by banishing another and revealing a spellbook in hand. This combination of cards would lead spellbooks into a powerful position in the meta, rivaling its contemporaries and leading to an even more diverse meta. The other major contribution this set would provide was the trap card Treacherous Trap Hole, a trap that could destroy any two monsters on the field, but only if you had no other traps in your graveyard. This became an instant staple in any deck that didn't run trap cards, as it was a two-for-one in terms of card advantage, letting you remove any two monsters without making any form of deck concession. In particular, Sylvan's, Spellbooks, and Mass Destiny Hero would latch onto this particular card effectively, as all three had no need for traps in their builds. 
Vision's device would be seen as a major success, establishing not only a new meta archetype, but also a powerful meta staple trap that would go on to shape parts of the history of this game. The set would also lead into the third GX character unlock event just one week later. Beginning on May 9th, 2018, Cyrus Truesdale's Road to Duel Links would introduce Cyrus Truesdale to the game. This character would be known for introducing the Viacroid monsters to the game, a series of machine monsters that provide a variety of effects. While not the most impactful character, he would bring a couple of pieces to the game that would become more important as time went on. The first of these is his main skill, Fusion Reserves Roids, a skill that let you search for any monster listed on a Roid Fusion monster in your extra deck once per duel when you lost 1800 life points. Though the Fusion Roid monsters were not usually ones you would want to bring out, Super Viacroid Jumbo Drill paired nicely with this skill, as it would let you search for Drill Roids who could destroy any defense position monster when it attacked. The only other notable card released here would be Pear Psychroid, a fusion monster requiring any two machines with the same name that could attack directly. While not immediately impactful, this card would be noteworthy as a 1600 attack monster that could attack directly in a 4000 life point format was interesting from a combo deck perspective. Overall, the Cyrus event wasn't immediately impactful to the game as a whole, but later context would bring this event into a whole new light. For now though, most players would overlook this event for the next change just two days later. Released on May 11, 2018, the first ever Selection Box Mini was introduced to Duel Links. Similar to the Selection Box that debuted before it, the set was focused on giving reprints to popular cards of the time while also introducing a couple of new cards as Selection Box exclusives. Some of the key cards reprinted this time around were Lila, Lightsworn Sorceress, Sephira, Queen of Dragons, Cosmic Cyclone, Red Eye Slash Dragon, Forbidden Chalice, Fire Formation Gyoko, and Wall of Disruption. However, the main draw to this reprint set was undoubtedly the new exclusive card, Offerings to the Doomed. Offerings to the Doom would see immediate play and success, providing quick play monster destruction at the cost of your next draw phase. This would see immediate play in decks that could either finish the game in one turn, or that didn't naturally need their draw phase, such as Amazonas or Sylvan, seeing an impact immediately. This would become a controversial point, as the selection boxes could only be opened a certain number of times with gems, meaning that to get offerings you would have to more than likely pay actual money, and within the time frame given as the selection boxes would be removed from the shop after a period of time. Controversial or not, offerings would still be a high impact card to this ever shifting meta, and it wouldn't be the only shift, as the next main box would drop less than two weeks later. Crusader's Battleground was the sixth main box of the GX era, released on May 22, 2018. The set was focused around bringing powerful warrior monster archetypes to the game. The first point of note would be Evil Swarm Heliotrope, being a 1950 attack normal monster. While at this point, normal monster beatdown had all but faded completely from the meta, Heliotrope was notable, as it marked there was only one more milestone for no tribute normal monsters to hit, as the strongest no tribute normal monster in the TCG at the time was 2000 attack. Noble Knights would be the first of three warrior archetypes that gained support here, being focused around using equip spells to enable their plays. The key card of this deck was Noble Knight Madrot, who could special summon a Noble Knight from deck when he's the only monster on your field and he has an equip spell equipped, with a requirement to destroy the equip spell after using the effect. While this might seem like a downside, all of the Noble Arms equip spells once per turn can re-equip themselves from Grave to any Noble Knight monster, which allowed you to effectively swap the equip spell from a draw to whichever monster he summoned, which was usually Dristin, who would destroy any face-up card on the field when he gets equipped with a Noble Arms spell. While not on par with other major meta decks at the time, Noble Knights would see some play thanks to the versatility of the Noble Arms spells, such as a Feudator, which destroyed face-down cards at the cost of 500 attack from the equipped monster, Destiny, which prevented the equipped monster from being destroyed once per turn, and Galatin, which boosted the equipped monster's attack by 1000, but decreased it by 200 every turn. Six Samurai was the second archetype supported here, gaining further support after their introduction back in Blades of Spirits. This wave would bring the first four of the secret Six Samurai monsters, Grandmaster, and Return of the Six Samurai, which would give Six Samurai the push they need to make an impact on the meta. The secret Six Samurai monsters would be focused on banishing themselves from Grave to protect your Six Samurai monsters on the field from being destroyed by card effects. Their main deck monsters included Kizaru, who searched for any Six Samurai monster when special summoned, Doji, who sent any Six Samurai from deck to graveyard when summoned, and Hatsume, who could banish any two Six Samurai monsters from Grave or Field to summon any Six Samurai monster from the Grave. Graveyard. These three would come together to form Secret Six Samurai Rihan, a fusion monster that could be made by sending any three Six Samurai monsters with different attributes from the field to Graveyard, who could banish any Six Samurai monster from hand or field to banish any other card on the field. 
This would be considered their boss monster, being able to remove most threats, but requiring a lot of resources to make viable. Grandmaster could special summon itself when you control a six samurai monster, being an easily summonable body to enable your other six samurai effects, or to summon Rihan or Great Shogun Shin more easily. Return of the Six Samurai was a revival trap for any Six Samurai monster, with the caveat of destroying it in the end phase. But this could be circumvented by any of the secret Six Samurai monsters banishing themselves from Grave to protect the revived monster if needed. Similarly to Noble Knights, Six Samurai would occasionally see meta play from the support, but wouldn't become a meta staple due to the raw power of other decks. Bujin would see further support here, introducing the other Beast Warrior Bujin monsters and Mikasashi, who searched a Bujin spell or trap during the end phase if a Bujin was sent from your hand to grave that turn, Hirume, who could summon itself by banishing any Bujin in grave and discarded a card from each player's hand on destruction, as well as some of the better Bujinji monsters in Quillen, who could banish itself from grave to destroy an opponent's monster if you controlled one of the Beast Warrior Bujins, and Hare, who could banish itself from grave to protect the Beast Warrior Bujin on field from destruction. Finally, the cover card of the set, Silent Swordsman level 7, would see his introduction here, along with his level 3 and 5 variants and Silent Sword Slash, which boosts a Silent Swordsman monster by 1500, makes it immune to card effects, and cannot be responded to by the opponent. Silent Swordsman level 3 and Silent Sword Slash together would form the newest OTK in Duel Links, making a monster that becomes unaffected by the opponent's card effects and with Assault Armor can attack twice in a turn. By raising its attack with Silent Sword Slash and Backup Rider, it was very easy to get Silent Swordsman level 3 up to 4000 attack, giving a fully immune monster the ability to attack twice in a turn for massive amounts of damage, or could be used with Secret Pass to the Treasure to make Silent Swordsman level 3 able to attack directly that turn before applying buffs to him. This consistency was once again boosted by the Bamboo Sword cards in combination with cards like Dark World Dealings and Into the Void, making it yet again a consistent OTK combo that plagued the ranked ladder. While the set was unfortunately plagued by an OTK deck, Crusader's Battlegrounds would still be seen as a successful set, even if the supported archetypes were not quite as powerful as previous sets. This would lead into the long-awaited World Championship Qualifier just one week later. The World Championship Qualifier 2018 began on May 28, 2018 for Stage 1, but the main tournament properly began on June 8, 2018 with Stage 2. Any player who made the top 600 in their region received a free pass to Stage 2 from the KC Cup, but any who didn't still had the opportunity to qualify for Stage 2 by completing Stage 1 in time. Each region had an allotted number of spots for the World Championship, capping out at 3, which would be given to the top players of each region. Of the players that qualified for the World Championship here, there were 7 different decks among their lineups. The least used of these were Girgia and Noble Knights, each just barely making the top cut. Girgia was still using their standard game plan of Ties of the Brethren to flood their board with Girgi Attacker, Girgi Anchor, and Girgi Arsenal but now was being supported by new staple spell and traps such as Offerings to the Doomed and Paleozoic Canadia. Noble Knights, while not having the strongest showing, proved they still belonged in this meta by reliably performing the Madrat Drist in play, combining it with staples like Offering to the Doomed and Treacherous Trap Hole. Sylvan came in fifth for the top cut representation, still using their game plan from previous metas, but now using the skill Grit, which each turn would randomly determine whether or not you could be reduced under one life point. This stalling skill, used in combination with Sylvan's control-oriented effects, made for annoying matchups to play against. In fourth for the top cut was Amazonus, which used the power of Amazonus Onslaught, the recursion of Baby Tiger, and the battle protection of Queen to completely dominate any battle that occurred. In third was Stall Variants, which surprised many who were not ready for them. These decks took advantage of the various generic stalling traps that had been added over the course of the game's history, in addition to the skill Extra Extra, which, when your life points are reduced by 2000, makes every card you draw in the draw phase that turn duplicated. In addition, they also ran Grit, similarly to Sylvan's. This, combined with cards like Golden Ladybug, Hero Shadow Scout, Outstanding Dog Marin, and Karibo made it impossible to close a game without heavy amounts of back row removal. In second was Spellbooks, riding high off their initial wave of support. Many variants were running Restart in combination with That Grass Looks Greener to quickly fill up their graveyard with Spellcasters and Spellbooks to enable Spellbook of Life and Spellbook of Fate, further enabled by the raw search power that the Spellbook engine provided. Finally, the most used deck in the top cut was undoubtedly Masked Hero, which were primarily using Restart along with a package of Destiny Hero Malicious, Celestial, Drill Dark, Vision Hero Vion, Mask Change, and Destiny Draw, allowing a player to attempt to handpick their opening play with access to at least one Masked Hero Anki. They also began to run Hatronade here, as the ever-present stall deck suffered heavily from it, being the first main case of Hatronade being used in OTK scenarios. Overall, the World Championship Qualifier gave a deeper look into the meta of the time and how much it had shifted with just a few set releases. This would be followed by a series of changes over the next few weeks to balance out the ever-growing chaos of the metagame.
Released on June 13th, 2018, the first ever structure deck EX, Spellbound Silence, was released. This would introduce the concept of the standard and EX structure decks, with EX structure decks being considered more powerful, bringing more meta-relevant cards with their releases, as well as reprints of higher rarity cards from previous sets. This one would introduce Silent Magician, a retrained variant of the previously released Silent Magician level 8 that was easier to summon by banishing any one spellcaster from the field, negating one spell per turn, gaining 500 attack for every card in the player hand and summoned the original level 8 variant on destruction. This would instantly find a home in the already popular Spellbook deck, as they had easy access to a monster for her summoning condition in Spellbook Magician of Prophecy and heavily benefited from the control she helped provide. In addition to this, Gold Sarcophagus would be introduced here, a spell card that let you banish any card from your deck face up and retrieve it two turns later. While not immediately impactful, it would later find relevance in decks specializing in the banished zone. As for reprints, Magical Exemplar, Magical Citadel of Endymion, and Silent Magician Level 8 would all be reprinted from previous sets, making them easier to access for new players. While not introducing a new deck to the meta, Spellbound Silence would do wonders for the Spellbook archetype, pushing them into a dominant position in the ever-changing meta, leading into the game's next balance change before the World Championships. The June 2018 balance changes went into effect on June 18th for skills and June 26th for cards, being without a doubt the largest list of changes so far in the game's history. 11 skills and 13 cards would be balanced with this set of changes, completely shifting the format around them. For skills, buffs would be given to Dragonic Fusion, Sealed Tombs, Harpy's Last Will, and Posthumous Army in an attempt to make them more playable. But more importantly, nerfs would be given to Dual Standby, Ojama Go, Destiny Draw, Extra Extra, and the generic skills Balance, Restart, and Grit. Dual Standby would see a restriction added making the user unable to activate spells, traps, or monster effects on their first turn, eliminating its usefulness as an OTK enabler. Ojama Go would see a once per duel restriction added onto it, making the skill far less usable as a star enabler. Destiny Draw would see a once per duel restriction added to its effect, as stall decks were similarly using it multiple times in a duel thanks to cards like Golden Ladybug and Rainbow Life. Extra Extra would also be nerfed due to stall decks, making it so the only card affected by the skill would be the card drawn for your normal draw each turn, rather than every card drawn in the draw phase. As for the generic skills, Balance would see a requirement added so that the user must have at least 6 of each monsters, spells, and traps in the deck to use the skill, eliminating cheese mechanics to guarantee certain cards in the opening hand. Restart would now skip your first draw when used, making your opening far less powerful than if you hadn't used the skill. This was primarily targeted at the fact that the skill was being used as a go-to for most decks to boost consistency. Finally, Grit saw a massive change to how its effect operated, now only being usable once in a duel and only when the user's life points at the start of the turn were above 4,000. This made the skill both less random by giving it a defined condition, as well as less annoying to deal with, as it was counterable. Moving on to the Forbidden and Limited list, many cards would be placed onto the list to enforce Duel Links' unique balancing system. The only card limited at this time was Massive Morph, which had seen massive success since the release of new Amazonas support, as it made Swordswoman's combo far more reliable to pull off thanks to the special summoning power the deck now had. In addition to this, it was also being played in stall decks, as the prevention of a monster attacking directly made it very useful for stalling out games. Secret Patch to the Treasure would see a swift limit to 2 alongside Assault Armor and Cup of Ace in an attempt to curb the Silent Swordsman OTK, which had picked up a lot of popularity on the latter after the WCQ. Hero Shadow Scout would similarly see a limit to 2, which paired with the hit to Cup of Ace made Mill nearly unplayable for a time. Enemy Controller would also see a limit to 2, being cited as the control switching effect was enabling OTKs, but more likely it was to prevent usage alongside some other hits that came to meta decks. Rose Lover and Sylvan Marshall Leaf would both be limited to 2, forcing Sylvans to choose between monster removal or special summoning consistency in their decks. Amazonas Onslaught was limited to 2, forcing Amazonas players to drop enemy controller from their lists. A similar story can be said for Girgia, who had Pulse Mines limited to 2 for the same reason. Destiny Hero Celestial was limited to 2 due to the overwhelming draw power the Destiny Hero engine provided, but this would hardly slow them down aside from losing enemy controller. The last in my limit would be Cyber Petite Angel, being the final nail in the coffin for Cyber Angels, who now had 3 cards in total in the semi-limit section, making the deck far too inconsistent to continue to see meta relevance. Finally, Red Eye Spirit would be released from the list, as the Red Eye Zombie deck had all but faded from the meta and it would be a boost to the Red Eye Slash Dragon focused deck. With this massive set of changes, the meta would see change in how powerful certain decks remain, but this wouldn't be the only shakeup at this point in time, as we were about to enter the second Tier 0 format of Duel Links' history. <laughs> 
Clash of Wings was the sixth mini box of the GX era, released on June 22, 2018. This set introduced the Fur Hire archetype to Duel Links, a deck that focused around using lower level monsters to special summon out their higher level monsters, gaining bonuses every time a monster is summoned. The lower level monsters all share the same effect as Special Summon a Fur Hire, while also having their own unique effect when the Fur Hire monster is summoned. Beat, Bladesman Fur Hire, Searched a Fur Hire monster, Seal, Strategist Fur Hire, added a Fur Hire from Grave to Hand, Donpa, Marksman Fur Hire, destroyed a face-up card on the field, and Recon, Scout Fur Hire, destroyed a set card on the field. Their higher level monsters had effects when they were special summoned, as well as a different effect while on the field. Wiz, Sage for Hire, gained 500 life points for each for Hire monster when summoned, then could negate a spell or trap once per turn by discarding a card. Dina, Hero for Hire, banished card from the opponent's grave for each for Hire monster when he's summoned, then was the only for Hire monster attackable while on the field. Finally, their spell Mayhem for Hire special summoned any for Hire monster from the grave in defense mode, making them one of the only decks in the game with in archetype graveyard recursion. All of these effects, mixed with their natural tendency to swarm and control the board, made them a force to be reckoned with, dominating the latter immediately on release. This release would go on to eclipse every release until Worlds, as nothing released could compare with the power level of for Hire, making the next three releases miss the mark. Starting on June 26, 2018, Esperova's Dual Carnival would introduce Esperova to the game, and with him, his ace monster, Jinzo. While Jinzo had no meta archetype around him, he would be a tech choice in some decks as a way to play against trap-heavy decks like Girgia and Amazonas, thanks to his effect to negate all traps while on the field. Beyond Jinzo, this event would also introduce Scrap Recycler, a monster that, on summon, would send a machine from deck to grave. While not powerful at this point in time, Scrap Recycler would see play in the future with other grave-reliant machine archetypes. Beyond these, Esperoba's event would come and go without bringing any new skills of note, leading to the last box before Worlds, Burning Nova. Burning Nova was the seventh main box of the GX era, released on July 9th, 2018. The set's main focus would be the Battery Man archetype, a series of Thunder-type monsters that specialize in field swarming and beatdown. This would be supported by Battery Man Solar, who sent a Thunder from deck to grave on summon, Charger, who special summoned a Battery Man from deck on summon, Microcell, who special summoned a Battery Man from deck upon being flipped face up and drew a card upon being destroyed, and Industrial Strength, the archetype's boss monster, who could special summon himself by banishing two Battery Men from grave and could banish a Battery Man from grave to destroy a monster and back row once per turn. This was also supported by the generic Thunder Monster Thunder Seahorse, who could be discarded from hand to grave to search your deck for two copies of any 1600 attack or lower light Thunder Monster. Battery Men were powerful for sure, but releasing into the Fur Hire meta and being weaker than the past few meta archetypes put them at a major disadvantage out the gate causing them to flounder in the oppressive meta. Besides Battery Man, a few other cards of note would be released here. Megalo Smasher X would finally bring the No Tribute Normal Monster benchmark to 2000, making it the most powerful that that benchmark could reach based on the TCG's releases at the time. Wolf, Lightsworn Beast, would be a key piece in the Lightsworn strategy, being able to special summon himself when sent from deck to grave by a Lightsworn effect. Gym Knights would see a major wave of support here, as well as the release of key archetype pieces like Gym Knight Fusion, Lady Lapis Lazuli, and Lady Brilliant Diamond. Burning Nova was considerably weak compared to the boxes that released before it, leaving the meta fairly unchanged before Worlds. This would lead into the last character release before Worlds just two weeks later. Beginning on July 23, 2018, the Cyberdark Impact event would bring Zane Truesdale to Duel Links, and with him, his series of Cyber Dragon monsters. While the titular monster wouldn't be released with him, Zane would bring cards like Cyber Dragon Dry and Cybernetic Fusion support to facilitate summoning his boss monster, Cyber and Dragon. This was also supported by his skill Cyber Style, which could, when under 3,000 life points, summon a copy of Proto Cyber Dragon to your field for every 1,000 you were under 4,000, mixing well with Cybernetic Fusion support to quickly fill the board with Cyber Dragon sub Substitutes to make Cyber End Dragon. While the skill was intended to just be used as a last ditch way into the Cyber Dragon fusions, it would be abused by Tribute Summon decks, as the Proto Cyber Dragons summoned by this effect had no form of restrictions placed on them. While not immediately impactful, the skill would see more use after the World Championship, which took place just two weeks later. 
The second Duel Links World Championship ran from August 4th to 5th, 2018 in Chiba, Japan. This year, the format would be different from the first World Championship, requiring all players to bring five decks with different characters and skills to compete. In addition to this, you could only use three copies of any card across all five of your lists, and two of the five decks were required to fill the requirements of the newly coined Legendary decks. Decks that required a specific character, skill, and cards to play. Each character had their own requirements for a Legendary deck, including required cards that you had to play at least one of, option cards, which you had to play a certain amount of from the given list, and required skills, which you had to use one of them for your deck. An example of this would be if you were playing Seto Kaiba, you were required to play three copies of Blue Eyes White Dragon, one copy of an option card, with the choices including Kaiba Man, Beacon of White, Soul Exchange, and Burst Stream of Destruction, and a required skill between the options Peak Performance, Heavy Starter, or Beatdown. This made it so that at least four of your deck's cards and your skill was predetermined, making deck building for this event even more challenging. With this in mind, there were a total of six deck types in the top four of Worlds, four of them being played by every single line. Up. For the one odd deck out that would only see one appearance in the top four, Noble Knights would be played as a standard deck by Nagal Duzap, who came in second place overall. He ran the deck using the skill Balance, allowing him to guarantee seeing a copy of a Noble Knight monster and a way into an equip spell on the first turn, making the deck consistent enough to perform the Dristan Pop at least once a game. In 5th in overall representation, Mast Hero would see 3 spots in the top 4, with 2 of them being Legendary decks. For the Legendary deck variant, both Zixo, the 3rd place finisher, and Are, the 1st place finisher, would play the deck using Aster Phoenix, who required the use of 2 Destiny Hero Plasma, 2 cards between copies of Destiny Hero Plasma, Captain Tenacious, Diamond Dude, Double Dude, and Dark City, and either the skill Bring It or Destiny Calling. Both would opt to play two copies of Diamond Dude for their option picks and the skill Destiny Calling, which allowed the user to activate a copy of Dark City when their life points were below 3000, which both players could thanks to Cosmic Cyclone reducing their life points by 1000. The standard deck variant would be played by Jenkins, the 4th place finisher, who opted to play the Ties That Bind instead, using it to boost their boards by up to 300 every turn. The remaining four decks would be played by all four players' lineups, with similar builds between them. The first of these was Amazonist, which was the only one of these four to have both Legendary and Standard decks in the top four. For the Legendary variants, both Nagao and Jenkins would use Odeon, who required three copies of Embodiment of Apophis, one copy of either Mythical Beast Circuit, Temple of Kings, or Magic Jammer, and one skill between Trap Player, Endless Trap Hell, and Chain Reaction. Both would opt to play Magic Jammer and Endless Trap Hell alongside the Amazonist Trap lineup, allowing the recursion of cards like Mirror Wall, Wall of Destruction, and Amazonist Willpower and Onslaught thanks to Endless Trap Hell. RA and Zixo would also use Endless Trap Hell with large trap lineups, just without the required cards. This allowed them to use more versatile traps like Paleozoic Canadia and Floodgate Trap Hole alongside the Amazonist game plan without needing to dedicate four spots to the required cards, including more specific tech cards like Spike Shield with Chain in the case of RA and Memory memory loss in the case of Zixo. All four of the top players played Girgia as their remaining legendary deck, all opting to use Cyrus Truesdale, who required Super Vehicroid Jumbo Drill, Drill Roid, Steam Roid, and Submarine Roid, as well as an option card between Vehicroid Connection Zone, Drill Roid, Steam Roid, and Submarine Roid. In addition, it also required the skill Check Out My Ride, Check Out My Fusion, Training Wheels, or Fusion Reserves Roids. All four would opt to play Drill Roid as the option spot and the skill Fusion Reserves Roids, letting them search out any of their required monsters when they lost 1800 life points. The copies of Drill Roid and Steam Roid were not bricks to the deck thanks to them being Earth Machines, letting the players use Ties of the Brethren with them to summon out two Girgia monsters from deck. They also filled other niches for the deck, as Drill Roid let you remove any defense mode monster, and Steam Roid gave a 2300 attack monster to attack over certain threats. Beyond these, the Girgia game plan remained the same, summoning the Girgia flip monsters quickly and then controlling the board to end the game. The remaining two decks were played by all top four players, all as standard decks, marking them as unquestionably the most powerful decks of the world's 2018 format, being Spellbooks and Fur Hire. Spellbooks had received quite a substantial power boost with the release of Spellbound Silence a month and a half prior, giving the deck an easy to summon boss monster thanks to Spellbook Magician of Prophecy fulfilling the summoning condition for the Silent Magician, while also being searchable with Spellbook of Secrets. Silent Magician would provide them once per turn spell negation and a spellcaster on field to use to Spellbook of Fate, which had become even more critical with the ever-growing presence of For Hire in the meta, as it allowed Spellbooks to fully answer their first turn play before they could fill their boards with monsters. Spellbooks would also be running the skill Show of Nightmares at the time, which would return a random spell from grave to hand once per duel as long as the user had at least three spell cards in grave. 
For Hire would be the other omnipresent deck in the top four, able to quickly and effectively flood the board with For Hire monsters thanks to the lowered level monsters' effects, then clear out opposing threats, search, or recur monsters from the grave depending on which monsters you summoned. Any single lower level For Hire monster could set off the chain of events, making the deck insanely consistent. Adding cards like Cosmic Cyclone and Hey Trune to clear out any back row that might interrupt their combo, and the deck would go off unopposed. The winner of the 2018 World Championships was RA from Japan, using Spellbooks, For Hire, and Amazonas for his standard decks, and Girgia and Destiny Masked Heroes for his legendary decks, winning the finals in a decisive 3-0 match against Nagao to become the second ever Duel Links World Champion. This powerful showcase of decks would quickly be followed up by yet another mini box release aimed to shake up the meta only three days later. Empire of Scarlet was the seventh mini box of the GX era, released on August 8th, 2018. Coming right off the heels of the World Championship, Empire of Scarlet aimed to support an older archetype while also introducing a brand new one. The new archetype introduced here was Insector, a series of insect type monsters that equipped themselves to each other to either boost attack, defense, or provide unique effects. The primary playmaker for this release was Insector Centipede, who could equip an Insector monster from hand or grave to himself once per turn, and search for any Insector card when an equipped card is sent to the grave while equipped to him. The intended use of this was to equip them with cards like Gigamantis, which boosts his original attack to 2400, Hopper, who could send himself to Grave while equipped to make the monster attack directly that turn, which also triggered Centipede's search effect, and Insector Swords at Caliber, which provided an additional 800 boost and recyclable monster from Grave on destruction. While this showing was potent, Insector would not see meta play as the beatdown strategy they were pushing just wasn't effective in the board controlling meta of the time. The other deck, receiving more support since its introduction back in Crimson Kingdom, was Vampire, a series of zombie monsters centered around dumping monsters to grave, swapping around vampires on the field for vampires in the grave, and paying life points to use their powerful effects. Their key starters, Vampire Retainer and Familiar, both revive themselves from grave by sending a vampire from hand or field to grave then could pay 500 life points when summoned to search for either a spell or trap in Retainer's case, or a monster in Familiar's. These could easily be put into the grave too by Samurai Skull or Gozuki, enabling their effects as early as turn 1. The main boss monsters the deck opted for would be Vampire Grimson, who protected monsters from destruction by paying increments of 1000 life points and revived anything it destroyed by battle, Grace, who could revive herself when another higher level vampire is summoned by paying 2000 life points, and could send an opponent's card from deck to grave once per turn, and Vamp, who could equip an opponent's stronger monster to herself and revived herself when destroyed with a monster equipped. Because of all the life point payments the deck required, most players opted to play the skill Cyber Style, as for every 1000 you paid for an effect, it could summon a proto Cyber Dragon to the field to be used as tribute fodder. Vampires would quickly become a powerful threat in the Shifting Worlds meta, providing the game's second powerful zombie archetype, and would be far from the last. Empire of Scarlet's release would be felt immediately after the Showcase of Worlds, but would not be enough to knock the ever-present Fur Hire out of its Tier 0 position. Because of this, Konami would opt to perform another balance update just two weeks later. The August 2018 balance changes went into effect August 21st, 2018 for skills, and August 29th, 2018 for cards. The primary goal of this balance patch was very clearly to curb the omnipresent for higher deck, as it had fully taken over the latter at this point. The only skill change for this patch was Beatdown, which was modified to no longer give its attack boost to level 4 and lower monsters. This was done as a direct response to For Hire, who would end their spam plays with a higher level For Hire, then trigger Beatdown to give all of their monsters at least a 300 attack boost, and usually more. This change would make it so only the level 5 and higher monsters would get the boost, moving For Hires off of the skill. As for card changes, Dinah, Hero For Hire, would be limited to 1, and Dampa, Marksman For Hire, would be limited to 2. Dino was for Hire's boss monster for most of its ending boards, so limiting it to one hampered the deck's power level overall, though it was still searchable with beat, so it didn't kill the deck. Similarly, Dampa was the deck's primary board clearing effect, clearing out monsters quickly for direct attack game enders. By limiting it to two, it would make an OTK less likely while also forcing for Hire's off using enemy controller, which it was abusing both effects of at the time. The last change would be the only one not targeted at for Hire, being the semi-limit of Amazonas Baby Tiger. This was another push to bring Amazonas back down in power level, effectively removing Baby Tiger from the deck as Onslaught, the far more useful linchpin in the deck, was also semi-limited, forcing most builds to remove Baby Tiger entirely. This would be a hard hit, as Baby Tiger was the primary recursive way to remove monsters the deck was using at the time. This set of changes would perfectly lead into the final box of the GX era within the same week.
Gaia Genesis was the eighth and final main box of the GX era, released on August 27th, 2018. The set was determined to end the GX era with a bang, which it managed to do by introducing two new archetypes to the game, UA and Koki Mirror. UA, also known as the Ultra Athletes, are a series of Earth Warrior monsters whose primary gameplay gimmick was being able to summon themselves from hand by returning another UA from field to hand, with each having their own unique ability while on the field. Their primary playmaker, and the only level 4 or lower monster of the deck, was UA Midfielder, whose unique effect allowed you to swap a UA on field with one in hand as a quick effect, bypassing the usual slow speed of the UA tagout effects. Other UA monsters included Dreadnought Dunker, who dealt piercing damage and destroyed a card on field when it dealt battle damage, Mighty Slugger, who stopped the opponent from activating cards or effects until the end of the damage step when he attacked, and Rival Rebounder, who special summoned a UA from hand or grave when normal summoned or when special summoned on the opponent's turn. The deck also had plenty of ways to search, such as UA Stadium, which searched for any UA monster when a UA monster was normal summoned, with the added bonus of boosting all UA monsters by 500 permanently when a UA monster was special summoned once per turn, and Penalty Box, which banished an opponent's monsters for two turns when it battled a UA monster, and let you banish it from grave to search for any UA spell card. The primary drawback of the deck was that Midfielder was the only level 4 or lower monster in the archetype, making it the only play starter. Players would circumvent this by playing the Tricky, who could special summon himself from hand by discarding a card, giving Tribute Fodder, and the Skill Cyber Style, which once again was being used to provide the deck's Tribute Fodder. Thanks to these factors, UA was able to make an impact rather quickly, becoming one of the top meta decks on release. The other archetype to come out of the set would be Koki Meru, a series of monster cards with insanely powerful effects, all punctuated by the requirement to either have a monster of that type in hand, or to discard the spell Iron Core of the Koki Meru at the end of the turn, otherwise they would be destroyed. Iron Core would be their primary card at this time, allowing you to add it back to hand from grave instead of drawing for turn, or by discarding a Kokimeru monster, giving Core essentially unlimited uses. As for their monsters, Kokimeru Sandman would let you tribute it to negate a trap card, Urn Knight would let you reveal an Iron Core in hand to special summon another level 4 or lower Kokimeru from deck, and Maximus could destroy a card your opponent controls, but could only be special summoned from hand by banishing an Iron Core in hand. Koki Mirror would soon become infamous in Duel Links, but for now was just regarded as a subpar deck, especially compared to UAs. Beyond these archetypes, some standout cards from the set include Sangan, who was reprinted from a previous selection box, Swap Frog, who could special summon itself from hand by discarding a water monster, and sent a water, aqua, level 2 or lower monster from deck to grave on summon, Gemini Spark, which would go on to promote a new deck known as Gemini Beat, and Gates of the Dark World, which would provide Dark Worlds with their field spell. However, two cards from the set would stand out as the most powerful of the staple cards, being Galaxy Cyclone and Drowning Mirror Force. Galaxy Cyclone would join the previously released Cosmic Cyclone as one of the game's premier back row removal options, destroying a face down spell or trap on activation, then, on a future turn, could be banished from the grave to destroy a face up spell or trap. While it wouldn't replace Cosmic in all situations, it would see play both alongside it and instead of it in many decks. Drowning Mirror Force was the other major standalone card, being able to shuffle all attack mode monsters from your opponent's field into the deck when your opponent declared a direct attack, being a last line of defense for any deck that opted to play it. Gaia Genesis was considerably powerful, bringing both new archetypes and new staples to the game with its release, making a noticeable impact as the final KC Cup of the GX era began just two weeks later. The final KC Cup of the GX era began on September 7th, 2018. This tournament would be considered a final look over of the format for the GX era, as the next era was just around the corner. With that in mind, six deck types did well enough here to earn multiple spots in the top cut. Tied in fifth overall would be UA and Spellbooks. Spellbooks still had their major pieces that helped them do so well in the World Championships, but simply didn't have the favorable matchups it needed to dominate anymore, resulting in a lower performance than expected. UA was the new deck from Gaia Genesis and would have a decent showing for its first real tournament. The deck primarily ran the skill Cyber Style, giving them tribute fodder for their larger UA monsters when needed. Beyond this, the deck ran Cosmic Cyclone to trigger Cyber Style, Paleozoic Kanadia as the Floodgate of Choice, and different builds opted for either Sphere Karibo or Treacherous Trap Hole, the latter being interesting as all of the traps used in UA besides it could remove themselves from Graveyard, making Treacherous live again. Titan 3rd overall would be for Hire and Mass Destiny Hero. For Hire was coming off its nerfs from the previous balance update, but was still a heavily consistent powerhouse in the meta thanks to its swarming ability. 
beat, Bladesman for Hire was still at 3, so the deck still had its main searcher available to them, making them consistent enough to stay relevant. The deck also had changed its main skill from Beat Down to Ties of the Brethren after the most recent changes, still giving most of their boards a full 300 attack boost. Mass Destiny Hero was in an interesting position at this point in time, as while its core cards only had one hit, it had lost its main consistency skills of Balance and Restart that made it so consistent up to this point. Most builds at this stage were opting to play the skill Switcheroo, enabling it with Cosmic Cyclone to cycle away a card. Other options at this time included Beat Down for the raw attack gain on Anki, and Titan Showdown, which had a very interesting interaction with Anki when Forbidden Chalice was used on him during the damage step while attacking directly. The Chalice would negate the part of Anki's effect that halved his direct attack damage, which resulted in 3200 direct damage, or 6400 if Titan Showdown was live, causing instant OTKs. While this wasn't consistent enough to be a major concern at the time, it did make players think twice about an Anki direct attack. And second overall was Amazonas, which rose in popularity here due to the number one deck of the tournament. Amazonas was in a situation of the perfect matchup for countering the major meta threat of the KC Cup, running Sealed Tombs as the skill of choice to drive this point home even further. Even after losing Baby Tiger, the deck was still able to play a powerful battle-focused game plan thanks to the combination of Amazonas Onslaught and Queen, which made all of your monsters both indestructible in battle and able to banish any threat on the board. And first overall would be Vampire, completely taking over the KC Cup near the end. This deck riding high off its boost and power from Empire of Scarlet would abuse the consistency boosting power of Gozuki and Samurai Skull to set up their graveyards fast and make big plays, not afraid to pay lots of life points to make use of their bigger monsters like Vampire Grace and Vamp. While the main skill of the deck was still Cyber Style, making use of the heavy amounts of life points being paid for effects, many players were opting to play Sealed Tombs themselves, as it would give a one-turn reprieve from other Vampire players being able to do anything, usually winning the match then and there if they set up first. This KC Cup showed that all types of decks, both new and old, could compete with each other effectively in the new meta environment, leading into the final character release of the GX era just three days later. Beginning on September 13th, 2018, the Ultimate Nightmare would be the last character unlock event of the GX era, bringing Yubel to the game. With Yubel, the Yubel series of monsters would also be released, a series of high-level monsters with no attack or defense that destroyed any monster that battled it, summoning a stronger monster from deck when destroyed by card effect. The series of monsters would see some play alongside the Fire Kings released before them, but wouldn't see serious meta success overall. However, one of Yubel's skills would see play, known as Allured by Darkness. This skill, whenever the user takes 1800 damage, would let the user draw a copy of Allure of Darkness for turn, which was a powerful card in the TCG that let the user draw to and banish a dark monster in hand. While not omnipresent, Allured by Darkness would be the most useful skill from Yubel, aside from Fiend Farewell, which was brought over from Yami Bakura. This would be the final major event of the GX era, as the 5Ds era was on the horizon and would begin just two weeks later, bringing the first real shakeup to the structure of Duel Links as a whole, as the game would be changed forever. When we last left off, the GX era was coming to a close. Vampire had situated itself at the top of the meta with Amazonas following directly behind. In addition, other meta decks like For Hire, Mass Destiny Hero, Spellbook, and UA were all viable picks at this time, forming a diverse meta around multiple viable decks. We now continue our look back over the history of Konami's venture into the mobile market with Yu-Gi-Oh!, its ups and downs, and its intricate and ever-evolving metagame. This is the history of Duel Links. The 5Ds era of Duel Links began on September 25th, 2018 with the simultaneous releases of 5Ds World, Structure Deck Synchro Connection, and the main box Stardust Acceleration. The major change that this era would bring would be the introduction of Synchro Monsters to Duel Links, and by extension, Tuners. Synchro Monsters were a type of monster in the extra deck that could be summoned by sending a Tuner and non-Tuner monsters to the graveyard from the field, whose total levels equaled the monster being summoned. This new summoning mechanic was the core focus of the 5Ds launch, starting with 5Ds World. Similarly to the GX era launch the previous year, 5Ds World would bring with it five new characters to the game, being Yusei, Crow, Akiza, Leo, and Luna. Each of these characters would once again bring unique skills and cards like characters before them, but these characters were different in that they each had a skill that would add their boss Synchro Monster to the extra deck at the start of the game, alongside two copies of a specific tuner. This was notable as it meant that the boss monster for each character was NOT included in their card pool, each being held for a later release. 
Yusei Fuda was focused around his series of Junk, Warrior, and Synchron monsters, such as Junk Berserker, Fortress Warrior, and Unknown Synchron. His primary skill, Mark of the Dragon Head, would add two copies of Junk Synchron to the deck as well as a copy of Stardust Dragon to the extra deck. A level 8 Synchro monster that could tribute itself to negate and destroy any card that had an effect to destroy cards, reviving itself in the end phase if this effect was used. Crow Hogan was focused around his Blackwing monsters, a series of dark winged beasts that specialized in board swarming for synchro plays. His unique skill, Mark of the Dragon Tail, added two copies of Blizzard the Far North to the deck, and a copy of Blackwing Dragon to the extra deck, a level 8 synchro monster that could stop effect damage by placing a counter on itself, then turn those counters into attack reduction for the opponent. Akiza Izinski was focused around general plant support with cards like Dark Verger, Botanical Lion, and Rosaria the Stately Fallen Angel. Her unique skill, Mark of the Dragon Foot, added two copies of Copy Plant to the deck and a copy of Black Rose Dragon to the extra deck, a level 7 Synchro Monster whose primary effect would allow the user to destroy everything on the board on Summon, including itself. Beyond this, her other skill, What Grows in the Graveyard, would add a copy of Dark Verger to the graveyard at the start of the game, enabling Synchro plays in plant-focused decks. Leo was focused around his Morphotronic monsters, a series of mostly machine monsters whose effect changed based on what battle position they're in. His unique skill, Courage and Strength, added two copies of Morphotronic Remoten to the deck, and a copy of Power Tool Dragon to the extra deck, a level 7 synchro monster that could add a random equip spell among three selections from deck to hand. Beyond this, he also had Equipment Exchange, which would let you place up to two cards from your hand on the bottom of the deck to draw two, as long as one of the cards put back was an equip spell. Similarly, his ability, Equipment Restock, operated as an equip spell version of Endless Trap Hell, adding a random equip spell from Grave back to hand, shuffling the remaining ones in Grave back into the deck. Finally, Luna was focused around generic fairy and beast monsters with a mythical beast theme. Her skill, Mark of the Dragon Hand, added two copies of Spore to the deck and a copy of Ancient Fairy Dragon to the extra deck, a level 7 synchro monster that could destroy a field spell on field to gain 1000 life points and search a new one from the deck, in addition to special summoning a level 4 lower monster from hand once per turn. Similarly to her brother Leo, she also had field spell equivalent skills to Leo's, in Field Exchange and Field Restock, which had the exact same effects as Equipment Exchange and Restock, just for field spells instead of equip spells. Finally, between all five characters were a new series of shared skills known as the Level Skills, which included Level Augmentation, which would let you increase the level of a monster on field by the level of a monster in hand once per duel, Duplication, which let you copy the level of a monster in hand to a monster on the field once per duel, Reduction, which let you reduce the level of a monster on field by the level of a monster in hand once per duel, and Tuning, which let you change two monsters on the field to a level between 1 and 4 once per duel. It's worth noting that for all except Yusei, their ace monsters were unavailable at 5D's launch outside of these skills, so the only way to play each of them was to use their corresponding skill for a time. In addition to these character releases, the Structure Deck Synchro Connection would be released on the same day, which for the most part had nothing of note outside of the Synchro Monster Gravity Warrior, a level 6 monster that gains attack on summon and can force the defense mode monster your opponent controls into attack mode and make that monster attack it once per opponent's battle phase. While not the most impactful card, as it was heavily situational, given the scarcity of Synchro monsters that could be put into the extra deck at the time, it did pop up from time to time. All of these releases would be complemented by a main box on the same day. Stardust Acceleration was the first main box of the 5Ds era, released on the same day as 5Ds World on September 25th, 2018. Being the first box release of the 5Ds era, many looked to Stardust Acceleration to bring the first real wave of Synchro Monsters to be used in most decks, which it brought a couple, but not nearly as many as people were expecting. For generic Synchros, Stardust Dragon and Flamvel Urukazaz would be considered the most useful, the former being available outside of Yusei's skill here, and the latter being a level 6 Synchro that deals piercing damage and gains attack every time it deals damage. X Saber would get their official start here, bringing a collection of their better main deck monsters in XX Saber Full Helm Knight, a tuner who negated an attack once while on the field and special summoned an X-Saber from Grave after destroying a defense mode monster in battle, Bogart Knight, who special summoned an X-Saber from hand when normal summoned, and Dark Soul, who searched an X-Saber during the end phase of the turn he was sent from field to Grave, as well as three of their extra deck bosses in X-Saber Wayne, who special summoned a warrior from hand on summon, Soza, who could tribute an X-Saber to either destroy anything it battled or make it immune to traps that turn, and XX Saber High End Lay, who could destroy up to three back row on summon. X Saber had some success in these early months with their support, but floundered a little as their main powerhouse support cards were not released with them, making them underwhelmed compared to the field of other meta decks. 
Blue Eyes would be the other deck to step into the Synchro era here, bringing their tuners, the White Stone of Legend, who searched a Blue Eyes upon being sent to Grave, and Protector with Eyes of Blue, which special summoned a Light Tuner from hand on summon, and can send an Effect Monster on field to Grave to summon a Blue Eyes from hand, as well as the spell Silver's Cry, which special summoned a Normal Dragon from Grave on activation. All of this was intended to facilitate the summon of Azure Eyes Silver Dragon, a Synchro Monster that could, during each of your standby phases, summon a normal monster from your graveyard for free, which generally was used to recycle the Blue Eyes used to make him. While not immediately meta-relevant, Blue Eyes would see success very soon after this with the release of further support. Other cards of note from the set included the reprint of Offerings to the Doom from the previous selection box, Unexpected Die, which could special summon a normal monster from deck when you controlled no monsters, Revival Gift, which special summoned a tuner from grave to your field and also gave the opponent two tokens that clogged their board, and Genex Undyne, who could send any water monster from deck to grave to search for a copy of Genex Controller, providing graveyard setup for water decks. Stardust Acceleration brought a lot of new tools to the game, but it felt a little underwhelming compared to Generation Next at the start of the GX era, as it brought no real powerhouse staples to the game. However, one archetype from the set would quickly rise to be a meta contender with the next release less than one month later. The White Dragon of Legend was the second ever EX structure deck, released on October 15th, 2018. This deck's main focus was to bring Blue Eyes the last pieces of support it needed to make an impact on the meta, which it managed to accomplish with three cards, Dragon Spirit of White, Cosmo Brain, and Bingo Machine Go. Dragon Spirit of White, which was always considered a Blue Eyes monster, gave the deck essentially three more copies of Blue Eyes to use in the deck, as it was considered a normal monster while in the hand or graveyard, making it synergize with many of the Blue Eyes support cards. It also banished an opponent's spell or trap on summon, and contribute itself to summon Blue Eyes White Dragon from hand, allowing you to remove it from the board to bring him back again. Cosmo Brain could special summon itself by sending a non-effect monster from hand or field to grave, then let you trade an effect monster on field for a normal monster in deck once per turn, effectively letting you trade your effect monsters for copies of Blue Eyes from the deck. Bingo Machine Go let you reveal three cards in your deck that were either Blue Eyes monsters or spell or traps that listed Blue Eyes White Dragon on them, letting you add one of them randomly to your hand. The randomness of this card could always be circumvented just by revealing three copies of the same card, guaranteeing that you'd always be able to add it. As for non-Blue Eyes cards, the Heretic Archetype, a series of dragons that could tribute each other for effects, then summon normal dragons from the deck when tributed, would gain support here with Heretic Dragon of Sue, who could special summon itself by tributing a Heretic monster, and then could tribute a dragon once per turn to destroy or spell a trap on field, Neptet, who did the same for monsters, and Esset, who could be normal summoned without tributing, and could copy the level of any dragon on field to all Heretic monsters. While the Archetype was introduced back in Valiant Souls, this was their first wave of support that could be considered good for the meta, though even this support wasn't enough to push them into the meta. Finally, being an EX structure deck meant that it also included reprints of older Ultra and Super Rares from previous boxes, bringing reprints of Symbols of Duty, First Aid Squad, and Birthright, the latter of which would see play in the meta Blue Eyes deck. The White Dragon of Legend would be the final push needed to bring Blue Eyes into the meta, giving the first real meta mainstay of the Synchro era. This would quickly be followed by the next set release just one week later. Power of Bravery was the first mini-box of the 5Ds era, released on October 22nd, 2018. The set would be focused around the Morphotronic monsters, bringing more of their key support to Duel Links and released Leo's boss monster Power Tool Dragon for use in decks without the need for his skill. These cards include Morphotronic Scopin, who could either special summon a level 4 Morphotronic from hand or make itself level 4, Selphon, who could roll a die and look at that many cards from the top of the deck, then special summon a Morphotronic among them, Radeon, who boosted all Morphotronics by either 800 attack or 1000 defense, Accelerator, which shuffles a Morphotronic from hand into the deck to draw one, then destroy a card on the field, Junkbox, which special summons a Morphotronic from Grave, and Double Tool C and D, which boosts a Morphotronic or Power Tool Dragon by a thousand attack and negates an attack target's effect during your turn, and makes the opponent unable to attack anything else and destroys anything it battles on your opponent's turn. While versatile in their effects, Morphotronic would not be a major meta deck due to the power of its competition, easily able to punish a suboptimal opening from Morphotronics, which standardly happened often. 
The far more impactful deck from this set would be the Destruction Sword series, gaining the tuner monster Buster Whelp of the Destruction Swordsman, which search for any Destruction Sword card on summon and contribute itself to summon Buster Blader from hand, then bring itself back from the grave by discarding any Destruction Sword card, and Destruction Swordsman Fusion, a quick play fusion spell for Buster Blader, the Dragon Destroyer Swordsman, that can use monsters on either side of the field and could recur itself from grave to hand by discarding a card once per turn. This support would bring Buster Blader into the meta alongside the previously released DNA Surgery, which could make all monsters into dragons for your various Buster Blader effects and to use the opponent's monster for fusion summoning. Other key cards from the set that would make an impact here include Memory of an Adversary, which could remove an attacking monster for two turns by taking damage equal to its attack, which was used to help trigger life point requirement skills, and Desynchro, which would be used in later decks as a combo enabler. Power of Bravery would make an impact on the meta, but not in the way it initially expected thanks to the Destruction Sword deck. However, it wouldn't be the only addition, as the next character unlock event would begin just one week later. Beginning on October 29th, 2018, Sector Security on the Move would bring Officer Tetsu Trudge, the first 5D's unlock character, to the game. Trudge would bring with him the skill Let's Go Goyo, which added two Jute fighters to the deck and a Goyo Guardian to the extra deck. A level 6 synchro that could steal any monster it destroys in battle. As for his cards, only two would see any form of play, being Goyo Chaser and Tore Apart. Goyo Chaser was a generic level 5 synchro with the same ability of Goyo Guardian to steal a monster it destroys in battle, with the catch that its attack is halved while on the field, letting the card see splash play in decks capable of making level 5 synchros. Tore Apart, on the other hand, was seen as a tech choice for X Saber decks, as it made an X Saber synchro monster that was made with it able to stun traps while attacking. Overall, Trudge's event wouldn't bring all that much to the game, aside from a couple of tech choice cards, leading into a balance update the next day. The October 2018 balance update would be seen as a push to bring the power level of the dominant decks of the format down, as so far many of them have been suppressing the possible success of the new Synchro Era decks due to their raw power. Starting with skills, Cyberstyle would receive a very heavy nerf, making the Proto Cyber Dragon summoned by the skill unable to be tributed or used as material for any kind of summon except Fusion Summon. This was a direct response to the skill being used in Vampires and UA as tribute fodder generators, in addition to future-proofing the skill so that Synchro decks couldn't use the Proto Cyber Dragons for Synchro summoning. Life Point Cost Zero would be changed to only discount a single Life Point payment once per duel, which was aimed at the rising amount of Cyberstein cheese decks on the ladder, which would reduce their life points to a thousand through card costs, then spam Cyberstein's effect to summon monsters from the extra deck like Cyber End Dragon, Ojama King, Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, and Gatling Dragon. This change effectively made the deck unable to clear the board and end the game immediately by making the Cyberstein summon only once, breaking the deck's game plan. As for cards, Vision Hero Vion would be limited to one as a response to the overwhelming power of Mass Destiny Hero on the latter since release, as the deck up until now was mostly unhampered outside of a single semi-limit. Amazonas Onslaught would be limited to one, and Princess would be limited to two, as Amazonas was still extremely oppressive on the latter, even after all of their hits. Even with these hits, Amazonas would still be a viable meta deck through it all, using one Onslaught and two Princess to max out their consistency. Wiz, Sage for Hire, would be limited to two to match Dampa, effectively removing Dampa from the deck as Wiz was way too critical to remove. Finally, both Hey Trunade and Treacherous Trap Hole would be limited to two, effectively removing the two arguably most powerful staples from most meta decks, as many meta decks at the time had at least one critical card in the semi-limit section. These changes to the meta would be felt almost immediately and would be further complemented by another main box release just two weeks later. Blackstorm Rising was the second main box of the 5Ds era, released on November 12th, 2018. The set was focused around various Winged Beast archetypes, providing them support in addition to fully releasing Crow's boss monster, Black Winged Dragon. His archetype of Black Wings would be one of the supported archetypes, gaining key archetype pieces such as Boar the Spear, a monster with piercing that could special summon itself if you control a Black Wing monster other than Bora, Shura the Blue Flame, who can special summon a Black Wing from deck when he destroyed a monster in battle, Harmaten the Dust, who could special summon itself from hand if you controlled another Blackwing other than Harmaton, then could increase its level by the level of another Blackwing, Breeze the Zephyr, who could special summon itself if added to the hand by card effect, Armed Wing, a Synchro with Piercing that gains 500 attack when attacking a defense position monster, Silverwind the Ascendant, a Synchro that could destroy two monsters on field on summon for the cost of your battle phase and protects Blackwings from being destroyed by battle once per turn, Cards for Black Feathers, which let you banish a Blackwing in hand to draw two at the cost of your special summons that turn, and Black Whirlwind 
which let you, when you normal summon a Blackwing monster, search for a Blackwing with less attack from your deck. While a lot of the monsters they received in the main deck were considerably powerful for pushing a synchro focused game plan, Black Wings lacked the necessary powerhouses of the extra deck to make any form of meta impact for the time being. The second archetype to receive support here was Dragoonity, a series of dragon and wing beast monsters who were focused around equipping the smaller dragons to their wing beast main deck monsters and synchro dragon monsters to enable their effects. Their main deck monsters included Dragoonity Ducks, who could equip a lower level Dragoonity Dragon and Grave to himself on summon, Phalanx, who could special summon himself if equipped to a monster, Ecclese, who could special summon a Dragoonity from hand on summon and then equip himself to that target, destroying a card on field when sent to the graveyard while equipped, and Militum, who could special summon a Dragoonity monster from the spell and trap card zone once per turn. However, where Dragoonity shined was their ability to pump out level 6 and 8 synchros with ease, thanks to Phalanx's ability to special summon himself. The three monsters primarily brought out this way were Gadurge, who could search and then discard a Dragoonity once per turn, Gibulge, who could banish a Winged Beast in Graveyard to gain that monster's attack that turn, and Vajriana, who could equip a Dragon Dragoonity to itself from the Grave on summon, then could send any card equipped to it to the Grave to double its attack that turn. The equip effect would either result in equipping Phalanx for easy access to a level 8 Synchro like Stardust Dragon, or in equipping Ecclees to quickly boost Vajrayana to 3800 and destroy a card on the field. In addition to these, the equip spell Dragoonity Divine Lance would also boost their consistency by providing easy access to Dragoonity Dragon monsters once per turn. Overall, while Dragoonity wasn't the biggest meta threat, their start was powerful enough to see play as a potent rogue strategy. The final archetype to receive multiple support cards here was Harpy, which received Hunting Ground, the first time the card was available outside of my skill, Queen, who could be discarded to search for Hunting Ground, and Hysteric Party, which could summon as many Harpy Lady monsters as possible from Grave by discarding a card. The support wouldn't be enough to make Harpy relevant again, but was still greatly appreciated. Other noteworthy cards from the set include Breaker the Magical Warrior, who could destroy a spell or trap once while on field, Card of Consonance, who could discard a Dragon Tuner to draw two, Sakuretsu Armor, which destroyed an attacking monster, Soul Release, which could banish up to five monsters from either player's graveyard, and Bujinji Crane, which was arguably the most impactful piece of Bujin support released up to this point, being able to discard itself from hand to grave to double the attack of any Beast Warrior Bujin for one battle. Overall, Blackstorm Rising would have a decent impact on the meta overall with the introduction of Dragoonity and support for previously established decks. This would be seen immediately thanks to the KC Cup just two days later. The first KC Cup of the 5Ds era ran from November 14th through the 26th of 2018, using the same format as the previous year, with the top 500 skipping stage 1 of this year's WCQ replacement, the Regional Representation Qualifier, or the RRQ. In addition to this, from now on, the first place finisher in the world for each KC Cup would get a free pass straight to the World Championships without needing to qualify in the RRQ. Decks with some representation, but not a whole lot from the top cut, included Battery Man, Bujin, Gemini, and Mast Hero, some of which had their first real tournament showing here. The top five, on the other hand, substantially had more representation in the top cut. In fifth was Amazonas, fresh off their hits on the last balance update. Even with three archetypal cards on the ban list alongside some of their preferred techs, the deck continued to perform even in the ever-changing meta. They would opt to play one Onslaught and two Princess to maximize their odds of seeing the Key Trap, as well as the skill Parasite Infestation and Lava Golem to disrupt their opponents long enough to establish their boards with very large trap lineups with cards like Kanadia, Drowning Mirror Force, Floodgate Trap Hole, and Wall of Disruption. In third overall was a tie between Buster Blader and Spellbook. Buster Blader was the big new deck on the scene, using the combination of Destruction Swordsman Fusion and DNA Surgery to control the opponent's boards by summoning Buster Blader, the Dragon Destroyer Swordsman, using the opponent's monsters, then forcing all of them into defense mode and unable to use their effects. If the opponent did not have any form of back row removal, they were usually not able to break the combination, leading to a Buster Blader win. Spellbooks were still in the same game plan as prior formats, using Silent Magician as their boss monster with the various spellbook cards backing her up, including the non-targeted removal of Fate. In second overall were various anti-meta strategies, seeing a surprising surge in popularity with this KC Cup. These strategies primarily were focused around cards like DD Assailant for banishing removal, Wind-Up Juggler for battle removal, Breaker the Magical Warrior for spell and trap removal, and the Skill Sealed Tombs to counter other strategies of the tournament. The most represented deck in this KC Cup was once again Vampires, still using the same strategy of steel tombs from the previous KC Cup, with some opting to use the skill Bandit to steal an opponent's back row without them having the option to counter it. This KC Cup showed many changes in the overall meta, but the number one deck remained unchanged since September. With this in mind, many looked to the next event for some kind of a meta change, but would be greatly disappointed.
Beginning on December 4th, 2018, tabletop RPG Monster World would introduce Tristan Taylor to the game. While he had been introduced earlier this year as an April Fool's roaming character, this was the first time he was fully unlockable, and his status as a joke character was on full display. Tristan brought with him no unique meta skills, no meta changing cards, and even his shared skills were nothing to be impressed with outside of Field of Warriors, which he shared with Joey. It seemed that even the game designers were in on the joke, as one of his unique skills, Super Strength, appeared to be a nod to the online comedy series Yu-Gi-Oh! The Abridged Series. With Tristan's launch taking up a character release spot, many immediately wrote him off and looked to the next mini box to provide any real meta changes. Secrets of the Ancients was the second mini box of the 5Ds era, released on December 7th, 2018. Similarly to prior boxes of the 5Ds era, this set was focused on Luna's boss monster, Ancient Fairy Dragon, making it available to play outside of her skill. Beyond this, the set didn't bring much overall to affect the meta, but it would have a couple of standout cards. Junk Synchron, one of Yusei's ace monsters, would be released here, giving a proper way to actually summon Junk Warrior. In addition to this, it would see tech spots in some decks with level 2 monsters, or the skill What Grows in the Graveyard, to summon one of the big generic synchros from this set, Armades. Armades was a generic level 5 synchro that stunned all opponents' effects when he battled, finding spots in decks that could easily make level 5 synchros. Powered in Zectron was a generic level 6 synchro that made itself unable to be destroyed the turn it was summoned, which would see occasional play in later decks of the 5Ds era. Finally, the Trap Trick series would be introduced here, a series of plant and insect type monsters that special in normal traps, specifically whole normal traps. This included Atrax, who made you able to activate whole normal traps from the hand and made them unable to be negated, Dionia, who revived the trap tricks from Grave on Normal Summon and reset a whole normal trap from Grave on Special Summon, and the Archetype's key trap, Trap Tricks Trap Hole Nightmare, which destroyed a Special Summon monster on your opponent's field when it activated its effect negating the effect in the process. These monsters would find a home in some variants of anti-meta strategies thanks to being able to power up cards like Floodgate Trap Hole and Treacherous Trap Hole. Overall, Secrets of the Ancients brought a couple generically splashable cards, but no real meta-defining strategies. Those waiting for the meta shakeup would finally receive it, however, with the next box release just one month later. Revolution Beginning was the third main box of the 5Ds era, released on January 1st, 2019. The set would bring support for various archetypes, bringing the game into a truly new meta. Of the three main archetypes supported here, Fabled was the least successful of them, garnering a little success here and there, but not a major meta following. Their support here included Grimro, who could discard herself to search for any Fabled if you control the Fabled, Cerubaril, who special summoned itself when discarded, Raven, who could discard any number of cards once per turn to gain attack and levels for each card discarded, and Raijin, who let you draw up to two cards when summoned. Karakuri would receive a major wave of support here after their introduction in Valiant Souls, bringing them back into the meta in a major way. This wave included Nanishi, who gave an additional normal summon once per turn, Inasichi, who searched a Karakuri on summon, Nizapachi, who changed the battle position of a monster on summon, Nizamu, who summoned a Karakuri from deck upon being destroyed by battle, Cash Cash, which searched for a Karakuri monster by changing the battle position of a Karakuri on field, and their boss monster Bure, who summoned a Karakuri from deck on summon and could change the battle position of a monster on field once per turn. This wave of support would make Karakuri an instant meta staple, able to generate a board of synchros quickly in addition to ridiculous amounts of advantage. The final archetype with major support here was Koki Meru, whose support here would be some of the most substantial support an archetype had received so far. This support included Wall, who could tribute itself to negate a spell, Rook Lord, who could banish a Koki Meru card in Grave on summon to destroy two cards, Core Reinforcement, which could revive a Koki Meru monster in Grave, and Reckoned Power, which could remove an opponent's back row by revealing an Iron Core in hand. However, all of these would pale in comparison to the big support card from this set, Diamond Core of the Koki Meru, a spell card that searched for any Koki Meru card in deck, then could banish itself from Grave to prevent Koki Meru monsters from being destroyed that turn, including by their own effects. This one card would push Kokimaru up to the top of the meta instantly, as being able to search and protect Maximus, Urn Knight, and their various tech choices in a limited format made the deck insanely powerful and consistent. Other key cards from the set would include Miracle Fusion, the key fusion spell of the Elemental Hero archetype, Doom Caliber Knight, a monster that negated the next monster effect used by tributing itself, Miss Judge, a monster with a 25% chance to negate the next card used by the opponent, and Justice Springer, who can negate a special summoned monster's effects once per turn. Overall, this was far and away the most impactful set of the 5Ds era thus far, bringing two decks into the forefront of the meta and providing support for many others. This would lead into the next set of reprints just two weeks later. 
Selection Box Volume 2 was the second main selection box, released on January 12, 2019. Similarly to Volume 1 and Mini Volume 1, this set would bring both reprints of meta-relevant cards from the past year of the game alongside new exclusive cards. For reprints this round, Masked Hero Anki, Elemental Hero Gaia, Noble Knight Madrat, Noble Knight Dristin, UA Midfielder, Spellbook Magician of Prophecy, Ties of the Brethren, Mask Change, Spellbook of Secrets, UA Stadium, Drowning Mirror Force, Sea Stealth Attack, and Call of the Archfiend would all be reprinted here, mirroring the relevant cards of the late GX era. For new exclusives this time around, none of these cards would become meta-defining like offerings before them, but some would have a place in specific decks that made them stronger. Mass Hero Diane and Elemental Hero Solid Soldier would be seen as a sort of package, with Solid Soldier providing field swarming for your hero monsters, and Diane being a target if mass change was used on Solid Soldier. Spore would be a powerful plant tuner that could fit into any deck with plant-type monsters, but wouldn't get big due to the low relevance of those decks at the time. Necro Valley would be a boost to the mostly irrelevant Gravekeeper's deck at the time, but would also see occasional tech play against graveyard-heavy decks, similarly to the skill-sealed tombs. Nightbeam would offer another option for back row removal, but would mostly be overshadowed by the already popular Cosmic and Galaxy Cyclone. Samsara, Dragon of Rebirth, and Scrap Archfiend would be seen as the most useful of the exclusives here, giving a level 5 and 7 generic synchro that could be splashed into a few different decks at the time, primarily Karakuri builds. Overall, this selection box would be seen primarily as just a really powerful set of reprints, since the exclusives didn't do much to the overall meta. But this wouldn't be the only release at the time, as the next structure deck also released on the same day. Swordbound Silence was also released on January 12, 2019, bringing Silent Swordsman to the game alongside reprints of the three older level variants. Silent Swordsman would find a home in some variants of anti-meta, since the deck was already running plenty of warriors for its summoning condition giving a powerful negation tool alongside a body to boost with Silent Sword Slash to make it unaffected by other cards. These releases would impact the meta a little, but not nearly enough to crack the top decks. This would lead into the second 5D's character unlock event just two weeks later. Beginning on January 24th, 2019, Atlas Rising would introduce Jack Atlas, the King, to Duel Links. Jack would bring with him his signature skill, Mark of the Dragon, Wings, which added two copies of Dark Resonator to the deck and a copy of Red Dragon Archfiend to the extra deck. A level 8 synchro that destroys all defense position monsters on the opponent's field after attacking a defense position monster at the cost of destroying all of your monsters that didn't attack at the end of your turn. This would be the only relevant skill brought by Jack for the time being, leaving his event as a little bit of a disappointment to most, as nothing truly meta-relevant came from it, being the second character in a row with nothing of note. However, a meta shift was coming, as the very next day, a balance update would release. The January 2019 balance update would be a very interesting balance update in the history of the game, as it would be primarily buffs for many different decks and archetypes with its changes. Starting with skills, Harpy's Last Will would be changed to require only having 4 Harpy monsters in the grave, rather than banishing 5 to activate it. Miracle Fusion Time would be changed to require the player to be at 2,000 life points or lower, rather than 1,000 or lower to activate it. In addition to these two, 11 additional skills would all be buffed to only require a 1,000 life point loss to activate. These skills included Zombie Draw, Bring It, Flight of the Harpies, Buzz On, Check Out My Ride, Gravekeeper's Lot, Cosmic Enlightenment, Dinos Find a Way, Sorcery Conduit, Cyber Dark Style, and by far and away most importantly, Kybercorp Bling. Kybercorp Bling only requiring a loss of a thousand life points now meant that you could use a Cosmic Cyclone, then search for literally any one card you want out of your deck by making it the only glossy or prismatic rarity card in your deck. This change would be immensely meta warping, as you would have many players opening far more packs than necessary for a deck just to get a single glossy or prismatic rarity copy because it now had a relevant impact on your deck's consistency. As for changes, Spellbook of Fate would be limited to two, cutting Spellbooks off being able to run Treacherous Trap Hole in their builds as a fallback option. Silent Sword Slash would be limited to two to match the other pieces of the Silent Swordsman OTK, as the deck was still popping up from time to time on the ladder. Doing this officially killed the deck, as you could no longer run the finisher spells alongside Silent Sword Slash in multiples, ruining the deck's consistency completely. Finally, Amazonas Baby Tiger was removed from the list, as most builds of Amazonas proved that Baby Tiger was not integral to the deck's performance, meaning it didn't need to take up space on the list anymore. This balance update would begin the reign of Kyvacorp Bling as the go-to skill for decks to play, which would only grow more apparent as time went on. This would perfectly punctuate the next mini box released on the same day.
Tornado of Phantoms was the third mini box of the 5Ds era, released on January 25th, 2019. The set would bring a couple of archetypes up in the meta, but nothing so powerful as to dethrone its current kings. Gusto would see a major wave of support here, finally having enough of their pieces to make an impact on the meta. These included Pilika, who special summoned a wind tuner from Grave on summon, negating its effects on field, Eagle, who special summoned a level 4 or lower non-tuner Gusto from deck when destroyed by battle, Goldo, who special summoned a level 2 or lower Gusto from deck when sent to the graveyard, and Winda, who special summoned a Gusto tuner from deck when destroyed by battle. Eagle, Goldo, and Winda formed a pseudo loop between themselves with Eagle summoning Winda, Winda summoning either Eagle or Goldo, and Goldo summoning Eagle, meaning you had a loop between them that could go through all 9 copies in a deck if established. In addition, they also received their Synchro Monsters Goldos, who could shuffle two Gusto Monsters from Grave into the deck to destroy a monster once per turn, resupplying the loop, and Falcos, who boosted all Gusto Monsters by 600 points on summon. While Gusto was not powerful enough to change the meta as a whole, it did enable various stall-related strategies alongside Lava Golem and Parasite Infestation, being quite viable in that regard. Mecha Phantom Beast would receive Tetherwolf, who summoned a token on summon and could boost itself by 800 in battle by tributing a token, making it a 2500 beater without much issue. Mistworm would be the first generic level 9 synchro with a powerful effect to boot, bouncing up to 3 cards the opponent controlled back to the hand when summoned. Only missing meta impact due to the lack of decks able to make him, as he required 3 materials. Stardust Assault Warrior was the generic level 6 synchro who dealt piercing damage and summoned a junk monster from Grave on summon, seeing play for both reasons. Mana Dragon Xernatron would see occasional play in Amazonas as a way to protect your copy of Onslaught from being removed, especially by Cosmic Cyclone. Lastly, Trap Stun would see occasional play in combo-oriented decks that were heavily susceptible to traps, making it easier to perform your plays. Overall, Tornado of Phantoms would bring minor changes to the meta, but no major shakeups in the long run. The set of changes would be undercut almost immediately by the next set of cards just one week later. Ancient Gear Awakening was the third EX structure deck, released on February 4th, 2019. This deck would bring a wave of new support for Dr. Crowler's key archetype of Ancient Gears, bringing the deck back into relevance in a major way. The main piece of support here was Ancient Gear Reactor Dragon, which had a standard Ancient Gear effect of stunning spells and traps while attacking, and gained piercing damage if summoned by tributing an Ancient Gear monster. While this card's effect was nothing special compared to Golem before it, what made it better than the former was the fact that it could be special summoned, meaning it could be summoned from the deck using the field spell Gear Town, which can summon an ancient gear monster from deck upon being destroyed. It also allowed you to tribute summon ancient gear monsters with one less tribute, making Middle Age mechs a really reliable way to tribute summon larger ancient gear monsters. They also received Wyvern, who could search your deck for any ancient gear card on summon at the cost of not being able to set cards for the rest of the turn, but this could be circumvented by setting your cards before summoning him. In addition to these, the EX deck would also bring reprints of Double Cyclone and Wild Tornado, both of which synergized heavily with Gear Town. This wave of support would push Ancient Gear back into the meta hard, making them quickly rival the mainstays of the meta like Kokimiro and Karakuri. This would only become more apparent as the next KC Cup began two days later. The second KC Cup of the 5Ds era ran from February 6th through the 17th of 2019, following the same format as the previous KC Cup. This KC Cup would be a spotlight of recent releases, as the meta was finally shifting away from the decks of the later GX era. Decks that had a couple of top spots, but not quite as many as others, included Mass Destiny Hero, Obelisk Turbo, Sea Stealth Attack, and Mecha Phantom Beast, gaining one or two spots in the top cut, but no more than that. The remaining six decks took the majority of the top cut here, giving us a good look at the meta at large. In six was Amazonas, which was in a position of being torn between the old way of playing the deck, being the Endless Trap Hell variant, and the new way of playing, using Lava Golem and Parasite Infestation. Most of the variants in the top cut fell into the latter category, running cards like Amazonas Swordswoman to remove Lava Golem summoned to the opponent's field, making them take the damage, and heavy trap lineups to stall the game into their favor. In fourth was a tie between Buster Blader and Spellbooks, both seeing a good level of success. Spellbooks may have lost a copy of Fate and their copies of Treacherous Trap Hole on the last balance patch, but in return gained Breaker the Magical Warrior, who provided them with back row removal that could instantly be turned into a Silent Magician once used. Buster Blader, on the other hand, was using a far more dangerous strategy of Go Big or Go Home, using the skill Last Gamble to fuel their plays. 
This skill, starting on turn 5, would let you discard two cards and reduce your life points to 100 to roll a die, then draw that many cards once per duel. The primary idea being that your key playmaker cards, like Buster Welp and Destruction Swordsman Fusion, could be added back to the hand after the fact, circumventing the discard cost of the skill and allowing you to go off of the play directly after. In third was Koki Mirror, writing off their powerful new wave of support. Their primary game plan involved getting an Iron Core in hand, then using Urn Knight to special summon a tech choice Koki Mirror from deck like Sandman, Ice, or Wall, then banishing the core from hand to summon Maximus, protecting all of them with Diamond Core in the grave, which most likely searched the missing piece. The deck also played Hey Trunade to remove back row threats like Kanadia or Floodgate Trap Hole for additional disruption, but the deck's core of at least 14 cards made it very difficult to fit in techs at all, as all of the core pieces were critical to make the deck function, leaving it unable to adapt to any meta calls that came around. The only spot that seemed prime for teching was the skill, which by default was the ties that bind to provide an additional attack boost to get over the mirror match, but occasionally ran sealed tombs to counter specific decks. In second overall was Vampire, where the deck itself was mostly unchanged since the last KC Cup. Where the deck differed now was in the skill, which almost every player that topped opted to use the freshly buffed Kaipacorp Bling, allowing them to make one card in their deck either glossy or prismatic rarity to guarantee drawing it after the first turn, as the deck paid enough life points to consistently trigger the 1000 threshold. The primary choice for the Bling draw was Enemy Controller, which was easy to get a foil copy of due to being a drop card, but the other options included Samurai Skull and Vampire Kingdom based on player preference. The most represented deck in the top cut by a fairly decent margin was Ancient Gear immediately proving the viability of the recent EX structure deck. Almost every player opted to run the same three monster core, being Breaker the Magical Warrior, Ancient Gear Wyvern, and Ancient Gear Reactor Dragon. Breaker served as the perfect utility choice, being able to use its counter to either pop an opponent's back row or your own gear town, the latter option letting you summon a Reactor Dragon from deck for free. This was also the first deck to opt for Galaxy Cyclone over Cosmic Cyclone entirely by default, as Galaxy's graveyard effect could always pop your gear town when needed to summon a Reactor Dragon. All top players also opted to run at least one copy of Ancient Gear Fortress, which you could pop to summon a Reactor Dragon from hand or graveyard, acting as an additional copy of Reactor Dragon in most cases, while also making Ancient Gears untargetable and indestructible during the turn they're summoned. This KC Cup was a true showcase of the more powerful decks of the 5Ds era so far, but was also a testament to how powerful Vampire was to still be on top this far into a new era. This would soon be followed up by the next main box just three days later. Absolute Inferno was the fourth main box of the 5Ds era, released on February 20th, 2019. The set's primary focus was on introducing support for various fire attribute archetypes along with releasing Jack Atlas's boss monster, Red Dragon Archfiend, to be usable outside of the skill. The first of these supported archetypes was Fire Fist, who were introduced back in Galactic Origin. This wave of support would bring the archetype into the Synchro era with cards like Bear, who could set a fire formation spell or trap from deck when it deals damage, then could send a face-up fire formation card from field to grave to pop a monster, Spirit, who revived a level 3 fire fist on summon, Rooster, who searched for any fire fist monster on special summon and could trade a fire formation on field for a fire formation in deck once per turn, Fire Formation Yoko, which would let you discard a Beast Warrior to destroy a face-up card on activation, and Horse Prince, a level 6 synchro that could special summon a level 3 fire monster from deck on summon. The primary combo of the deck was to use Spirit to revive Rooster for the search effect, or Leopard for a Fire Formation search. Then if the monster you summoned was Rooster, you could synchro summon Horse Prince directly after. While the deck was playable after this wave, Fire Fist wouldn't be impactful to the meta as a whole due to the power level of other decks. The second archetype supported here was Neftis, which would see a pivot to be focused around their new series of ritual monsters. This wave included Disciple of Neftis, who could destroy a card in hand once per turn to search for a Neftis monster, and, when destroyed by card effect, search to Neftis spell or trap during the next standby phase. Devotee of Neftis, who special summons a Neftis monster from deck on ritual summon, destroying itself in the end phase, then it can bring itself back by destroying a Neftis card in hand and Cerulean Sacred Phoenix of Neftis, who could destroy Neftis cards on the field in hand to destroy an equal number of cards from the opponent, then revived itself during your next standby phase if destroyed by a card effect. This wave of support would see experimentation with a couple of builds, a level augmentation build to copy Cerulean's level onto a monster on field to use for the ritual summon, and a Ubel build, which used Ubel as the ritual material and as a target to destroy by card effect in hand, which triggered its effect to summon the later stages of Ubel. 
While the deck saw a lot of experimentation, it similarly would not see a lot of success in the meta due to its low power level. The final major wave of support would be given to Laval, receiving their first wave of support since their introduction in Burning Nova. This included Laval Lakeside Lady, who could banish herself in another Laval from Grave to destroy a set card the opponent controls, Volcano Handmaiden, who could send a Laval from deck to Grave when she sent to Grave, Molten Conduction Field, who could send two Lavals from deck to graveyard, and Dust Flame Blast, which could banish all Laval monsters in the grave to destroy that many cards on the field. The deck's primary game plan was to fill the grave with Lavals, which was pretty easy to accomplish thanks to Volcano Handmaiden being able to send all three copies of herself to grave if one gets sent, then trigger cards like Lakeside Lady and Dust Flame Blast to banish them, bringing them back with Laval Cannon to make synchros and restock the graveyard. This wave also brought a few of their synchro monsters, like Lavaval Dragon, who could shuffle back two Lavals in Grave to bounce an opponent's card, Dual Slasher, who could attack twice if you had two or more Lavals in Grave and does piercing damage if you had three or more, and Stenon, who could send cards from hand to Grave on summon that could negate any card that targets himself by banishing a Laval from Grave. Laval would see the most success out of all of the archetypes supported here, but would soon after drop out of the meta almost entirely due to not being able to keep up with the other top decks. Other cards of note from this set that didn't fall into a specific archetype would include Living Fossil, which could revive a level 4 or lower at the cost of negating their effects and dropping their attack and defense by a thousand, Dark Bribe, which could negate any spell or trap by letting the opponent draw one, Skill Prisoner, which could give one of your monsters targeting protection, then banish itself from grave to do the same again, and Bad Aim, which let you destroy a card on the field when your opponent activates a card or effect, but you cannot target the card that activated. Overall, Absolute Inferno would bring lots of archetypal support, but not any meta-defining strategies to the plate. This would be highlighted even further by the next character unlock event one week later. Beginning on February 26, 2019, I've Got Dino DNA would bring GX's Tyranno Hassleberry to Duel Links. Like his name suggests, Hassleberry's cards were focused around general dinosaur support, some of which would go on to defining the newest meta threat in a new variant of dinos. The primary cards that would promote this were Giant Rex, who could special summon itself any time it gets banished, and then gains 200 attack for every banished dinosaur, and Survival's End, which could destroy normal monsters on the field to summon dinosaurs from the deck to replace them, then could banish itself from Grave to destroy a dinosaur and a card your opponent controls. These two cards, combined with the previously released Baby Sarasaurus, Evil Swarm Salamandra, Megalo Smasher X, and the Paleozoic cards would form the newest dinosaur deck, as the Paleozoics are considered normal monsters on the field, providing fodder for survival's end. Aside from this deck, Hasselberry would also introduce Stego Cyber, which could special summon itself from Grave by paying a thousand life points when the opponent attacks, blocking damage from that attack. This would go on to see play in various decks as an option to stop multiple battles, as you could summon it to stop the damage from a direct attack, then the opponent would still need to clear it with another attacker effect. Aside from cards, the notable skills Hassleberry brought with him were Dino DNA, which gave you an additional 200 life points each turn, seeing occasional play in some decks, and Unstoppable Dino Power, which could give your current dinosaur monsters a permanent 100 attack and defense boost once per turn, seeing play in the previously mentioned dinosaur deck on occasion. Overall, Hasselberry's event would be a welcome change from the previous couple of unlock events by bringing various useful cards and a couple of niche skills that would go on to see meta success, leading into the next set release just two weeks later. Dimension of the Wizards was the fourth mini box of the 5Ds era, released on March 12, 2019. This set would include support for various different strategies, including support for Madolce and the introduction of Stromberg. Madolce had been in the game since Burning Nova, but lacked many of the pieces needed to be viable until this set, bringing cards like Magilene, who searched a Madolce on normal summon, and Hootcake, who could banish a monster in Grave to summon a Madolce from deck. This would see experimentation and success alongside the skill What Grows in the Graveyard, which started the game with Dark Verger in the Grave giving you a monster engrave to banish for Hootcake's effect, which then let you special summon Messengelato from the deck to search for Chateau. While the deck would see success in the short term with the new cards, Madolce unfortunately wouldn't have any staying power due to the strength of the decks around it. Strongberg was the other major archetype here, focused entirely around their field spell Golden Castle of Stromberg, which let you special summon a monster that lists Stromberg in its text from the deck once per turn, and destroyed any monster your opponent attacked with while Strongberg was on the field, dealing damage to your opponent when it does. 
These powerful effects came with the heavy cost of banishing 10 cards from the top of your deck during each of your standby phases, meaning there was a short time limit on how long it could stay on the field. Luckily, the rest of the archetype would help with Stromberg's weaker points, such as Glyph the Phantom Bird, which could be discarded from hand to search for Stromberg or destroy a spell or trap on summon, Iron Hans, who special summoned Iron Knight from deck and gained a thousand attack for each Iron Knight you controlled while Stromberg was active, Iron Knight, who lost a thousand attack if you controlled Iron Hans, then searched for Iron Hans on destruction or any warrior monster if your Stromberg was active, Prince Essen, who special summoned Pumpkin Carriage from deck on summon if Stromberg was active, then equipped itself with the Glass Slippers from deck, letting you swap what monster has it equipped when Prince Essen does battle damage, Pumpkin Carriage, who let Prince Essen attack directly and protected Stromberg from targeting and destruction, Glass Slippers, which boosts fairy monsters by a thousand attack and lowers non-fairy monsters by a thousand attack, re-equipping itself to Prince Essen if the monster equipped to is destroyed, and Iron Cage, which let you send an opponent's monster to grave if Stromberg was active, then destroy itself to summon that monster to your field. Generally, when building a Stromberg deck, you would choose to either use the Iron Hans and Knight cards or the Prince Essen cards, not both due to deck size restrictions, though Glyph and Iron Cage were common between both builds. Overall, Stromberg wouldn't define the meta, but would pop up from time to time due to the inconvenience their cards placed on the opponent, even in metas where people wouldn't have expected them to do anything. Other standout cards from the set include Dimensional Prison, which banished an attacking monster, Naturia Landoys, a level 7 synchro that negated monster effects by discarding spells, Gaia Knight, the Force of Earth, a generic level 6 synchro with 2600 attack, and most importantly, Psychic Wielder, who could special summon itself from hand if you controlled a level 3 monster other than Wielder. Then, if used for synchro summon, destroyed a monster on field with less attack than the synchro monster. This would instantly find a home in various decks with level 3 monsters in them as an easy to tech tuner monster, giving various decks that previously did not have access to synchro monsters easy access and monster removal. Dimension of the Wizards would make an impact not on the immediate meta of the time, but on the game as a whole with its generic support and rogue strategies popping up in strategies from time to time across later eras of the game. For now though, this set would make ripples in the meta but not break through any of the top tiers, leading into the next balance update just two weeks later. The March 2019 balance update went into effect on March 25th, 2019, bringing a small number of changes when compared to the last few balance updates, but were impactful to the meta as a whole. For skills, a trick up the sleeves would be nerfed to no longer allow special summoning on the first turn when used, effectively stopping Blue Eyes, which was still lingering in the meta by not allowing them to use Cosmo Brain on their first turn. Last Gamble was severely changed here, now only being usable from the seventh turn onward and shuffling back the two cards for cost rather than discarding them effectively taking Buster Blader out of the meta with that one change as they could no longer stack their grave and end the game off their skill. For cards, Kokimeru Maximus would be limited to one, effectively forcing most builds of Kokimeru to search for it with Diamond Core to be consistent. In addition to this, Iron Core would be limited to two to further reduce consistency, making their powerful opening plays less consistent overall. Spellbook of Eternity would be limited to one as the recycling of cards banished by fate was too powerful for the current metagame. Lastly, Samurai Skull would be limited to two as vampires had been overperforming in the recent metas and they were gravitating more towards Samurai Skull over Gozuki as of late. These changes would effectively nerf the top decks of the meta, creating a more even playing field for other decks to rise, punctuated by the next character unlock event on the same day. Beginning on March 25th, 2019, Consumed by Light would introduce GX's Sartorius Kumar to the game, bringing his series of Arcana Force monsters. All of these monsters had two effects, determining which one was applied based on a coin flip when these monsters were summoned. Standardly, the head's effect would be positive, while the tail's effect would be negative, but this was not always the case. The primary skill used from Sartorius would be Master of Destiny, which would make the first three coin flips made in the game be heads, as long as you had at least five different cards in your deck that had coin flip effects. While the skill wouldn't be popular at launch, it would quickly become meta-defining with future support. As for cards, most of Sartorius' cards were considered not useful, but a couple would see play. Arcana Force EX the Light Ruler would see experimentation with decks using Cyberstyle, as its summoning condition avoided the restrictions placed on Cyberstyle recently. Fiend Comedian would also see occasional play in coin flip based decks as a card to get over the 5 card requirement to use Master of Destiny. Overall, Sartorius would seem like a disappointment on launch, but reception would quickly change in the near future. For now though, the meta would be left in a weaker state with the recent balance changes, just waiting for the next powerful archetype to come in and change the entire face of the meta. When we last left off, the meta was in a fresh state of balance. 
The March 2019 balance changes have just gone into effect, reducing the power level of Kokimeru, Spellbooks, Vampire, and Buster Blader to the point where anything could rise up as the next big deck. Ancient Gears were noticeably untouched on this list, meaning they were primed to fully take over the meta without a proper challenger. We now continue our look back over the history of Konami's venture into the mobile market with Yu-Gi-Oh!, its ups and downs, and its intricate and ever-evolving metagame. This is the history of Duel Links. Warriors Unite was the fifth main box of the 5Ds era, released on March 31st, 2019. This set would be arguably the most powerful support wave for a single deck so far in the history of the game, bringing the Synchro Era support for six samurai. This wave included all six of the legendary six samurai monsters, the remaining secret six samurai monsters in Fuma and Gemba, Legendary Secret, Elder, Kagemusha, United, Asceticism, and Six Style Dual Wield. This wave of support would completely revolutionize the Six Samurai deck into the absolutely dominant deck many players still recognize today, becoming the third Tier 0 deck of Duel Links. The deck's primary game plan involved any of the level 4 monsters with the spell Sheen's Dojo, gaining one counter when a monster is summoned, then immediately sending it to Grave to summon Fuma from the deck, allowing you to make the level 5 synchro Legendary Six Samurai Shien, who could, once per turn, negate any spell or trap activated. In addition to this, if he would be destroyed, you could destroy another Six Samurai monster instead, or if he would be destroyed by card effect, you could banish a secret Six Samurai monster from the grave, like Fuma, making Shien very difficult to deal with. Though the dojo play was the most famous combo for this, the deck had many ways into Shien on the first turn, such as opening Fuma and Kizan, the latter of which could special summon himself from hand if you control a Six Samurai monster, or Genba or Kagamusha with Kaigeki, the latter of whom could special summon a Six Samurai monster from hand on normal summon. In addition to all of this, the deck had Six Samurai United, which gained a counter each time a Six Samurai monster was summoned, up to two, and then could send itself to Grave to draw that many cards, giving the deck raw draw power in addition to their board flooding. Inishi was also a powerful follow-up option, able to banish two Six Samurais from Grave to bounce a monster on field, and Six Style Dual Wield was a tech choice that would let you bounce two cards on the field if you controlled only one Six Samurai monster, like Shien. All of these cards were in addition to their two previous waves of support, making the deck completely unmatched in terms of raw swarming and advantage generation, easily cementing it as the deck to beat for the format. Beyond Six Samurai, some other cards to come out of this set of note included Quick Draw Synchron, a level 5 tuner that could be used in place of any Synchron monster for a Synchro Summon, Herald of the Abyss, a spell that let you pay 1500 life points to make the opponent send a monster of a specific type and attribute to the grave, bypassing targeting restrictions, Stardust Charge Warrior, a generic level 6 synchro that let you draw a card on summon, and Concentrating Current, a quick play spell that let you add a monster's defense onto their attack for the turn with the caveat of being the only monster able to attack that turn. Though Warriors Unite brought many tools for decks to take advantage of, almost all players would purely see it as the 6 Samurai box, a point that would only be driven home further by the next KC Cup less than a week later. The third KC Cup of the 5Ds era ran from April 4th through the 14th of 2019, serving as a showcase of the new meta since the March 2019 balance update and the release of Warriors Unite. Some honorable mentions that had one or two decks in the top cut included Spellbooks, Hazy Flame, Vampire, and Dinosaur. Spellbooks and Vampire both had been hit hard by the previous balance update, losing their dominant positions in the meta. Spellbooks losing two copies of Eternity from their list made it difficult for the deck to make follow-up plays after Spellbook of Fate, still being possible, just a lot more difficult to do consistently. Vampires may have only lost one copy of Samurai Skull on the list, but the rise of poor matchups led to the deck underperforming majorly. Hazy Flame made a surprise appearance here thanks to cards that let them quickly tribute some in their playmakers, such as Dynatherium, Berlineth, the Firestorm Vassal, Gilosaurus, and Blackwing Gust the Backblast. In addition, the deck opted to play a copy of Genzo and two copies of Kokimeru Valifar to counter trap-heavy decks on the latter, allowing the deck to see some success. Finally, Dinosaur had been a deck for a while up to this point, but was finally seeing tournament success thanks to cards released in the Hassleberry event a month prior, leveraging cards like Giant Rex, Survival's End, and the Paleozoic cards to win games. The remaining five decks would see the majority of the top cut representation, marking their place in the current meta. In fifth overall was Ancient Gears, which came as a surprise to many as it was the only major meta threat from the previous meta that was completely untouched by the balance changes. The primary issue the deck faced now was a poor matchup with the current best deck in the format, Six Samurai. 
as their primary cards for starting plays were all spells, making them easily counterable. However, the deck still had good matchups with the rest of the field, making them still perform decently. In fourth was Amazonas, the deck that simply refused to die. Amazonas continued to see meta success thanks to the resilience of the deck's primary engine of Onslaught and Queen, alongside power cards like Swordswoman and various staple traps. At this point, the deck was essentially a core of cards that could be built into multiple techs to face whatever threat was dominant in the meta, able to shift their builds to counter it. For this KC Cup, with the primary threat being Six Samurai, most builds included the skill Parasite Infestation and copies of cards like Lava Golem, Cypher Soldier, and Jade Insect Whistle to make the Six Samurai matchups as painless as possible. In third overall were variations of Parasite Infestation Stall. With the rise of Six Samurai, stall decks quickly found themselves at the forefront of competitive play, using cards like Fortress Warrior and Obnoxious Celtic Guard to create walls of unbreakable monsters, Cypher Soldier and Sazank to remove larger Six Samurai threats, Mithra the Thunder Vassal to clog boards with tokens, Golden Ladybug to keep life points high, and the most important piece, Lava Golem for tributing key monsters and to provide burn damage. By clogging the board with tokens and Parasite Parasites, you could either set up Fortress Warrior or Obnoxious Celtic Guard as an unbreakable wall for your Lava Golem, winning the game in a matter of turns thanks to Lava Golem burning the opponent for a thousand per turn. This was further backed up by powerful staple traps like Floodgate Trap Hole, Paleozoic Kanadia, and Wall of Disruption to ensure the opponent could not break your board. In second was Kokimeru, which surprised many who expected the deck to be a lot lower on the tier list following the March 2019 balance update. Even though the deck had lost two Maximus and one Iron Core, the deck had recently gained a powerful tool in the previous balance update in Kaibacorp Bling, playing three glossy or prismatic copies of Diamond Core to ensure seeing it every game. This was a major controversial point at the time because Diamond Core was a super rare, meaning you were very unlikely to get it in any foil rarity, making the deck and skill combination extremely pay to win, and this point would only grow more apparent in the near future, as Kaipacorp Bling was quickly catching on as the consistency skill of choice, as long as you could acquire foil copies of key cards. Beyond this, Kokimaru saw success primarily thanks to it, similar to Amazonas, being able to run tech cards specifically to counter Six Samurai, such as Sazank or Cypher Soldier, in addition to the usual Urn Knight and Maximus play. Surprising no one, the most represented deck in the top cut of the KC Cup was Six Samurai, cementing its dominance over the meta of the time. Even with the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th place decks all specifically being built or teched out to beat Six Samurai, the deck was so consistent in setting up boards of Shein and other powerful Six Samurai or protections that the deck saw the overwhelming majority of the top cut, cementing itself as the true best deck of the format. What was interesting about the deck's ending in the top cut was that the deck was heavily modifiable to a player's preference, as the only core pieces of the main deck that were unchangeable were three copies of Kizan, Fuma, and Dojo to ensure making a Shein on the first turn. Beyond these, there was no real standard for counts of the other cards in the deck, changing from player to player, making it hard to determine which cards any particular player was using. Common cards to be played at higher counts included Anishi for targeted bouncing, United for the additional draw power, and Dual Wield for bouncing on the opponent's turn. But other cards that would see spots based on player preference included Kizaru for being summoned off Fuma, Legendary Secret and Grandmaster for the additional field swarming, Kaigeki and Kagemusha for additional ways into Shien, and Ascendicism for the situational monster summons. This KC Cup showed the absolute power of the Six Samurai deck, with most decks in the top cut being either Six Samurai or a deck specifically designed to beat Six Samurai. This meta environment would have held on for a while after the KC Cup, however, a new power deck was on the horizon, aimed to end the Tier 0 format as soon as possible. Neo's Fusion was the fourth EX structure deck, released on April 17th, 2019. This deck brought with it three pieces of very modern support for Neos from the TCG, as two of the three cards from the deck had only been in the TCG for about two months at this point, with the other only being four months old, being a noticeably quick turnaround time. These cards include Neospace Connector, an effect monster that would special summon either an elemental hero Neos or a Neospatian from deck on summon, then contribute itself to summon another one from grave, Neos Fusion, a spell that let you summon a Neos Fusion monster by sending two monsters from hand, field, or deck to grave. 
then could banish itself from Grave to prevent the monster from either returning to the extra deck or being destroyed, with the caveat of preventing any further special summons that turn when its special summon effect was used, and Elemental Hero Brave Neos, a fusion of Neos and any level 4 or lower monster that gains attack for every Neos Spatian and Hero in the graveyard, and could search the deck for any spell that mentions Elemental Hero Neos when it destroyed a monster in battle. Even though the clear intention was to make a meta deck focused around the Neos Fusion monsters with this support, Neos Fusion would instantly find a home in various anti-meta strategies as a way to send specific monsters from deck to grave, like AD Changer or Bacon Saver, acting as the Duel Link's equivalent to Foolish Burial, a powerful setup card in the TCG. Beyond these cards, the EX Structure deck would provide reprints of Neos Alias and Storm Neos from previous boxes, but these were measly extras compared to the powerhouse new cards. Around the same time as this release, Konami also opted to change the cap of the extra deck from 5 monsters to 6, locking the new slot behind a lifetime mission of performing 100 Synchro Summons, which at this stage was a simple task for anyone keeping up with the current meta. Neos Fusion would bring absolutely meta-changing cards to the game, as with the introduction of Brave Neos and Neos Fusion, the meta was able to shift into a more open state, further diversified by another set release just two weeks later. Lords of Shining was the fifth mini box of the 5Ds era, released on April 30th, 2019. The set would bring a new archetype to the game in addition to supports for previous archetypes to give them a boost in the rapidly changing meta. For the new archetype, Dark Lords would be the headliner of the set, a series of dark fairy monsters whose primary game plan involved using their monster effects and spells to quickly churn out multiple high-level Dark Lord monsters, then paying life points to use their effects, copying the effect of a Dark Lord spell or trap and grave as their own, bypassing any cost for the card itself. This wave of support included Ixchel, who could discard herself and another Dark Lord to draw two once per turn, Desire, who could drop his attack to send monsters the opponent controlled to the graveyard, Superbia, who special summoned a Dark Lord from Grave when special summoned from Grave, Morningstar, who could special summon multiple Dark Lords from deck on Tribute Summon, then mill cards from your deck once per turn for every Dark Lord on the field, gaining 500 life points for each Dark Lord card sent this way, Nastin, who could special summon himself from hand by discarding two Dark Lord cards, Tetscat Lapoka, who could discard itself to prevent a Dark Lord from being destroyed, Amdusk, who could discard itself in another Dark Lord card to return a Dark Lord card from grave to hand, Ukabok, who could send a Dark Lord card from deck to grave on summon, Contact, which could special summon a Dark Lord monster in Grave, and Sanctified, which could send a Dark Lord from hand or field to Grave to negate a monster's effect without targeting, then gain life points equal to that monster's attack. While Dark Lords were undoubtedly powerful, their consistency was just slightly off the mark to become a meta mainstay, but the pieces were clearly there for a meta powerhouse to sprout with just a little more support. Steel Swarm would receive further support here since their introduction in Crusader's Battlegrounds, bringing the archetype into the meta in a way that was not expected at first. This included Steel Swarm Moth, who could bounce two cards the opponent controlled if it was tribute summoned using a Steel Swarm monster, Gira Stag, who could be tributed with one Steel Swarm monster, then could send a monster the opponent controlled to the graveyard and gained a thousand life points, and Scout, who could special summon itself from grave at the start of your main phase if you controlled no spell or traps, providing tribute fodder for your Steel Swarm monsters. While many wrote the archetype off as pack filler at first, Steel Swarm would find a spot in the meta very quickly thanks to the previously released Neos Fusion, as you could send a Steel Swarm scout from deck to grave using the fusion spell, then bring it back on subsequent turns to tribute summon your Steel Swarm boss monsters, making the deck far more consistent than expected, being one of two decks boosted in the set that would knock Six Samurai out of their dominant tier 0 position. X Saber would see another wave of support here, bringing cards like XX Saber Fault Troll, who could special summon himself from hand if you controlled two other X Saber monsters, then could special summon an X Saber from grave once per turn, Ragagura, who could add an X Saber monster from grave to hand when summoned, Emmer's Blade, who special summoned an X Saber from deck when destroyed by battle, and X Saber Urbellum, who spun an opponent's card from hand back to deck if they had four or more cards in hand on battle damage. While this support was solid for the deck, X Saber suffered in Duel Link's format due to the lack of monster zones to facilitate their swarming strategies, though would see fringe success from time to time with this support. Noble Knights would receive further support here, bringing more of their swarming options and Synchro Era support. This included Noble Knight Brothers, who could special summon up to two Noble Knight monsters from hand on summon, and could shuffle three Noble Knights or Noble Arm cards in Grave back into the deck to draw one, Gwynefer, who could equip herself from Grave onto a Noble Knight monster as a Noble Arms Equip spell, 
giving Light Noble Knights destruction prevention and Dark Noble Knights the ability to destroy any monster at battles, Lady of the Lake, a tuner who special summoned a normal monster Noble Knight on summon and could bring herself back from the grave by reducing a level 5 Noble Knight's level by 1, and Ig Noble Knight of the High Lonsalen, who equipped the Noble Arms from deck to himself on Synchro Summon, then searched a Noble Knight or Arms when it destroyed a monster by battle. The support would be enough for Noble Knights to see some success on the latter, usually in combination with Neo's fusion, but wouldn't become a meta staple with his support. Other cards of note here included Raiko, Lightsworn Hunter, a flip monster that provided non-targeted spot removal and milled your deck by 3, Wiretap, a counter trap that negated any trap card and shuffled it back into the opponent's deck, and the most important single card release of the set, the White Stone of Ancients, a dragon tuner that special summoned a blue eyes monster from deck during the end phase of the turn it was sent to create then could banish itself from Grave to add Blue-Eyes monsters from Grave back to hand. Ancients alone would give Blue-Eyes the support it needed to come back into the meta in a powerful way, being the second deck to help knock Six Samurais out of its tier 0 position by swarming the board with powerful Blue-Eyes monsters, in a way the deck was unable to do prior. Overall, Lords of Shining would be a powerful set for months to come in the meta for multiple reasons both short and long term, giving three set releases in a row that changed the meta in very impactful ways. The streak would continue further with the next character release a week later. Beginning on May 7, 2019, Tag Duel Tournament would bring Loomis and Umbra to Duel Links. While this particular event had been run multiple times before, this was the first time Loomis and Umbra were unlockable through it, bringing with them a series of skills based around the duo's contrasting playstyles. The first of these was Light and Dark which would let you swap a dark monster in hand for a light one in deck with the same type and level as the return monster, and vice versa. This skill would see play in various decks that ran either light or dark monsters as their primary monsters, allowing them to tech in a couple of monsters that complemented the primary monster with the skill to essentially increase the number of copies of the key monster in deck. This included Spellbooks, who played Breaker the Magical Warrior, Kaiku the Ghost Destroyer, and Magical Something as complement pieces to Silent Magician, Heroes, who played Silent Swordsman as a complement piece to Destiny Hero Decider and Drill Dark, and Bujins, who played Pitch Black Warwolf and Exarian Universe as complement pieces to find Bujin, Yamato, and Mikasuchi, boosting the deck's consistency. The other major skill brought from these two was Mask Tribute, which would let you, twice per duel, return a card from hand to deck to special summon a copy of either Grand Tiki Elder or Melkid the Four-Faced Beast at random, but locked you out of summons for the rest of the turn. While not the most prevalent skill immediately, mainly seeing play in Dinos as an easy way to trigger survival's end, the skill would become far more popular soon after with the next set release. Card-wise, Loomis and Umbra would bring a single copy of Light and Dark Imprisoning Mirror, occasionally finding tech spots in decks when the meta was centered around either a Light or Dark-based deck, along with a single copy of Mask of Restrict, which saw similar tech play against decks based on Tribute Summoning. Overall, Loomis and Umbra's launch would make waves in the meta immediately, both skill-wise and card-wise, leading perfectly into the next Structure Deck release just one week later. Structure Deck Return of the Red Eyes was the ninth Structure Deck, released on May 13, 2019. The structure deck was entirely focused around bringing further support to Red Eyes, as the majority of Red Eyes decks had completely fallen out of the meta as of late. This wave would bring four new cards to Red Eyes strategies in Retro Dragon, Archfiend of Lightning, Return of the Red Eyes, and Red Eyes Fusion. Retro Dragon served as a pseudo backup plan for Red Eyes, able to special summon itself from hand if a Red Eyes you control was destroyed, bringing back that Red Eyes in the process, and also let you tribute itself to normal summon an additional Red Eyes monster that turn. Archfiend of Lightning was the Gemini monster with the ability to destroy all face-up monsters the opponent controlled with less defense than its attack, and Return of the Red Eyes let you special summon a normal monster from Grave if you controlled a Red Eyes monster. Though each of these had their places and uses in the meta, all of these paled in comparison to the true stand-up card from the structure deck, Red Eyes Fusion. Red Eyes Fusion would let you fusion summon any Red Eyes Fusion monster using monsters from the hand, field, or deck with the catch that you could not normal summon or special summon for the rest of the turn, usually summoning Red Eyes Slash Dragon this way. This one card would bring Red Eyes back up into the meta, though not as omnipresently as Blue Eyes or Neos decks, making it a solid option in the ever-changing meta. In addition to these new cards, the structure deck would also reprint notable cards like Red Eyes Wyvern, the Dark Hex Sealed Fusion, Birthright, and the previously mentioned Red Eyes Slash Dragon. Overall, Return of the Red Eyes would be a powerful boost to the meta relevance of Slash Dragon, finally giving it a place in the meta. However, even with all of these meta changes occurring from the new set releases, one deck was still a bit overtuned at this point, 
making Konami opt for a balance patch three days later. The May 2019 balance changes went into effect on May 16, 2019, being the smallest number of changes in the history of the game, not changing any skills and only changing the banless position of a single card. Sheen's Dojo would be limited to two here, as Six Samurai was still a very oppressive deck on the ladder, though its status as a tier zero deck had already faded at this point thanks to other decks challenging that status. Sheen's Dojo being limited to two was primarily aimed at reducing the consistency of opening with a turn one Sheen, as Dojo plus any level four Six Samurai made Sheen instantly by summoning Fuma. Though these changes were light, they would be effective at checking Six Samurai's power level, leading into the next main box four days later. Blazing Rose was the sixth main box of the 5Ds era, released on May 20th, 2019. This box's main goal was to provide a variety of support to multiple archetypes across the board, in addition to bringing Akiza's boss monster, Black Rose Dragon, to be usable outside of her skill. The first archetype to gain support here was Subterror, making their Duel Links debut. Subterror is an archetype of monsters based around flip effects, able to special summon their boss monsters when the monster you control is flipped face down, and you control no face-up monsters each bringing their own powerful flip effects. Subterra Behemoth Umastrix banished a monster the opponent controls, Ultra Mathis flipped all other monsters face down, Stygio Kraken destroyed set cards on the field up to the number of Subterra Behemoths you controlled, Spelio Geist changed a defense position monster into attack mode and made its attack zero, Stalagmo could discard a Subterra monster to draw two, Phosphero Glacier sent a card from deck to graveyard, and Dragosurary protected Subterra monsters from being destroyed by card effects that turn. In addition to the Behemoths, they also received Nemesis Warrior, who could send a Subterra from deck to grave, then tribute himself and another monster whose total level equals or exceeds that monster to special summon it in attack or face down defense position, able to special summon itself from grave as a Subterra Behemoth is flipped face up. And Final Battle, which resets itself after being used and can flip up or flip down a Subterra monster, combine the attack and defense of a Subterra on field, or made your opponent unable to negate Subterra cards that turn. All in all, this wave of support would be considered immensely powerful, quickly establishing Subterra as another powerful meta option in the Sea of Meta decks. This would be mainly due to the skill Mask Tribute, which would let you special summon a normal monster, then the following turn tribute it alongside Nemesis Warrior to special summon a Subterra from deck quickly establishing your board without needing much for setup. Red Eyes would receive further support in addition to the previous structure deck, gaining cards like Black Metal Dragon, which could equip itself from hand to a Red Eyes monster, boosting its attack by 600 and let you search a Red Eyes card when sent from field to grave, Red Eyes Baby Dragon, who special summoned a Red Eyes monster from deck when destroyed by battle, equipping itself to it, then search the level one dragon if sent to grave while equipped, and Blackstone of Legend, which could tribute itself to special summon a Red Eyes monster from deck, then while in Grave could shuffle a Red Eyes monster from Grave into deck to add itself back to hand. This package of support would further push Red Eyes into the meta in addition to enabling a new variant of Buster Blader to re-enter the meta using Light and Dark with Black Metal Dragon to enable searching for Buster Whelp. Crawlers would make their debut here, a series of flip effect insects, bringing cards like Deus Ex Crawler, which could flip itself face up to negate a card targeting it while face down, and after being flipped, negates all monster effects on the opponent's field, Crawler Spine, who destroyed a monster on flip, Glial, who special summoned a crawler from hand or grave in attack or face down defense mode on flip, and Receptor, who adds a crawler from deck to hand on flip. All of the lower level crawlers also had the same effect to special summon two crawlers from deck if removed by an opponent's card effect making them an annoyance to remove. Aside from a couple of fringe cases, crawlers did not make any impact on the meta at large, primarily due to subterrors essentially doing their playstyle of flip effect control far better. The last major archetype to get support here was Metaphys, a series of light worms based on powerful monsters from previous eras of the game. Each Metaphys monster had two effects, one that activated when special summoned by a Metaphys monster, and one that activated the next standby phase after they were banished, shuffling themselves back into the deck in the process. Their cards here included Metaphys Daedalus, whose summon effect banished all other special summoned monsters on the field, and his banished effect banished any Metaphys card from deck, Neftes, who banished all spells and traps on field on summon, and added a Metaphys card from deck to hand when banished, and Tyrant Dragon, who was unaffected by traps and could attack twice when summoned, or special summon a Metaphys card from hand when banished. 
In addition to these monsters, they also had the continuous spell Ace of Metaphys, which could banish a Metaphys from hand to draw one once per turn, then once per turn applied an effect when a Metaphys is banished based on whose turn it was, and the continuous trap Metaphys Dimension, which special summoned a banished Metaphys monster when the opponent special summons a monster, and banished an opponent's card when a Metaphys monster is banished. Though the deck was clearly powerful, it was prone to heavy brick hands due to needing to run so many high-level monsters to operate letting the deck see some meta success, but not long-term staying power. Other cards from the set that were relevant, but not belonging to a larger archetype here, included Vermilion Dragon Mech, a powerful level 9 synchro that could banish a tuner from hand or grave for targeted spot removal, then recycle the banished tuner when destroyed by card effect, Cockadoodle 2, a tuner that could be level 3, 4, or 5 depending on how it was summoned, Golem Sentry, a monster that bounced an opponent's monster on flip summon and could flip itself face down, triggering the subterror summon requirements, Aloof Lupine, a monster that on summon could banish a monster in hand to banish a monster of the same type from deck, recycling a banished monster to hand on destruction, finding a comfortable spot in Metaphys, and World Legacy Clash, a quick play spell that could banish a monster from your side of the field for a turn to drop an opponent's monster by that banished monster's attack and defense, fizzling an attack if used in the damage step. Overall, Blazing Rose brought a series of new playable archetypes to the table right before the biggest tournament of the year so far, the RRQ, which began just a week later. The 2019 Regional Representative Qualifier ran from May 28th to June 9th of 2019 with Stage 2 beginning on June 6, 2019. This tournament replaced the World Championship Qualifier from previous years, essentially following the same format, just under a different name. Three spots in the World Championships were up for grab in each North America, Latin America, Europe, and Japan, with one spot available for Oceania and two spots available for Asia, meaning a total of 15 spots were available from this tournament. Of the players that qualified for the World Championship spots, six decks would make appearances, marking them as the most capable decks of the current meta. Tied for fifth place overall were Spellbooks and Six Samurai. Spellbooks had made a bit of a comeback in this tournament after their hits a few months back, sporting the new skill Light and Dark to consistently find their key card in Silent Magician, or to quickly pull out tech choices like Breaker the Magical Warrior or Kaiku the Ghost Destroyer, bringing the deck's consistency up considerably. Six Samurai had fallen quite substantially since their dominance in the last KC Cup, but were still viewed as a potent deck in the meta, able to make Xi'an with ease and quickly dominate games through Xi'an's negations and bouncing with Anishi and Dual Wield. In fourth was Blue Eyes, riding high off the addition of the White Stone of Ancients to the deck, consistently spamming out copies of Blue Eyes and Dragon Spirit of White thanks to cards like Snipe Hunter and Dawn Knight loading stones into the graveyard. On top of that, Blue Eyes was the only deck in the format able to consistently make level 9 synchros, meaning Vermilion Dragon Mech had found a home rather quickly alongside Azure Eyes. In third was Subterror, making a powerful first impression off their debut in the previous box using cards like Golem Sentry and Subterror Nemesis Warrior in combination with the skill Mass Tribute to quickly bring out Subterror Behemoth Umastrix and Stygio Kraken to control the board through their flip effects. With the Behemoths in Subterror Final Battle, Control would quickly get away from their opponents and Subterror could easily close out games thanks to the raw power of the Behemoths. In second was a collection of decks using the newly released Neos Fusion package, all aimed at inconveniencing the opponent as much as possible before swiftly closing out games in a single turn. Primarily, this was done thanks to Lava Golem, who could tribute over an opponent's board, then be either returned to hand with Gale Lizard, able to trigger its effect that turn thanks to an AD changer placed in the grave with Neos Fusion, or to have Control switch with a combination of the skill Mass Tribute summoning a free normal monster, an enemy controller to tribute it and steal the Lava Golem, attacking directly for 3000 damage, then letting it return to the opponent in the end phase to burn for the following turn for the last 1000. While Lava Golem was not the only style the deck was played with, as a Koki Meru variant of Neos would also top here, Neos Fusion in combination with AD Changer and Bacon Saver was common across the board, as the utility provided from the one spell made the deck a force to be reckoned with. In first place overall, with the most representation in the qualifying spots was Red Eyes, making a powerful comeback into the meta almost entirely off the back of Red Eyes Fusion. Like Neo's Fusion, Red Eyes Fusion was being used to set up AD Changer in the graveyard to summon out Red Eyes Slash Dragon. Where Red Eyes differed from the former was in the ability to search out Red Eyes Fusion thanks to Red Eyes Insight, bumping your effective copies of the key spell from 3 up to 6, making it very likely to open a copy in almost every game. In addition to this, most variants ran the skill Sealed Tombs as an effective way to stop Bacon Saver setups from stopping Slash Dragon's initial attack. 
meaning it could quickly load up on equips to make itself immune to targeting, further backed up by cards like Black Metal Dragon and Power of the Guardians being ran alongside it. Overall, the regional representative qualifier showed just how much had changed with the past few months of releases, as the meta landscape was completely different from the last KC Cup. This landscape would only continue to grow and shift in the months leading up to Worlds, as more releases on the horizon aimed to shake up the game further. Guardians of Rock was the sixth mini box of the 5Ds era, released on June 18th, 2019. The set would be focused around rock monsters in the form of generic rock support, as well as two rock archetypes, starting with Magnet Warriors. Magnet Warriors had been in the game for a while now, seeing success in the early to mid GX era, but they would receive more of their modern support here with Alpha and Gamma the Electromagnetic Warrior, and Berserkion the Electromagna Warrior. Alpha would search a Magna Warrior monster on summon, and Gamma would special summon another Magnet Warrior from hand on summon, both also having the ability to tribute themselves on the opponent's turn to summon a level 4 Magnet Warrior from deck, which would standardly be Delta, able to then use Delta's effect to set up major swing plays. These were used in combination with the previously released Beta the Electromagnet Warrior to summon their boss monster, Berserkian the Electromagna Warrior. Berserkian could summon himself by banishing Alpha, Beta, and Gamma from hand, field, or grave then being able to banish a Magnet Warrior from Grave to destroy a card the opponent controlled, which was notably not once per turn. If Berserkian was destroyed by the opponent, he would then summon back the copies of Alpha, Beta, and Gamma that were banished to summon him, triggering their summon effects. Magnet Warriors would become a powerful deck on the ladder with his support, not quite reaching top tier status, but still being well respected with the results they put up. The other rock archetype supported here was Triamid, an archetype based around controlling the board with their various field spells. All of their monsters shared an effect between them, allowing you to, on the opponent's turn, destroy your field spell to activate a new Triamid field spell from deck, which would also trigger an effect from the field spell if it was destroyed this way. Their cards include Master, who could send a Triamid card from field to grave to destroy a set card on field, Hunter, who would let you normal summon an extra rock monster each turn if a field spell was active, Dancer, who could shuffle a Triamid card from grave into the deck to boost all rock monsters by 500 attack and defense permanently, Cruiser, which let you gain 500 life points when a rock was summoned, letting you draw one and discard one if a Triamid was summoned, and searched a Triamid monster when sent from field to grave, King Golem, which boosted a rock monster by 500 attack, stunned the opponent's cards when a Triamid monster battled, and special summoned a Triamid from hand when sent from field to grave, and Fortress, which boosted a rock monster by 500 defense, prevented Triamids from being destroyed by card effects, and recycled the Triamid monster in grave when sent from field to grave. Triamids would see far more immediate success than Magnet Warriors, reaching around mid-tier status on release thanks to their consistency with the skill Balance, and the card trader card Triamid Pulse, able to reliably start with a monster and field spell for combos to quickly fuel plays with Pulse. Other cards of note from the set included Debris Dragon, who special summoned a monster with 500 attack or less from Grave on Summon, negating its effects, Magician Navigation, which special summoned a Dark Magician from hand and a level 7 or lower spellcaster from deck, then could banish itself from Grave to negate a spell or trap if you controlled the Dark Magician, Revival Golem, who either special summoned itself or added itself to hand when sent from deck to Grave, Rock Bombardment, which sent a rock monster from deck to grave to deal 500 to the opponent, and Block Dragon, who could special summon himself by banishing three earth monsters from hand or grave, protected rock monsters from battle destruction, and searched for up to three rock monsters in deck whose total levels equaled 8 when sent from field to grave, being an instant problem card on release. Block Dragon's release enabled a new FTK using Gem Knights and that grass looks greener to mill your deck by 10 on the first turn, fueling Block Dragon's effect to summon itself, then looping with Gem Knight fusion monsters like Lady Brilliant Diamond, Lady Lapis Lazuli, Zirconia, and Master Diamond to quickly burn the opponent out of the game. This deck would become feared on the ladder, much like the FTKs and OTKs before it, slowly becoming refined over the next few weeks. Overall, Guardians of Rock would successfully push multiple rock decks into the meta with its release, in addition to providing generic support and a couple of other strategies, keeping with the recent trend of every box having meta impact. This wouldn't be the only new addition to the game this month, as the third 5Ds character launch would start just a week later. Beginning on June 27, 2019, the Flame of Vengeance would bring Darksiner Kalen Kessler to Duel Links, and with him, the first wave of his Infernity monsters. 
The Infernity monsters all shared similar effects in that you could only use them if you had no cards in your hand, but in return they were generally powerful and required no other major costs. This wave included Infernity Necromancer, who could special summon an Infernity from Grave once per turn, Beetle, who could tribute himself to summon two more Beetle from deck, Mirage, who could tribute himself to summon two Infernity monsters in Grave, though they could not be summoned from Grave at all, and Break, which could banish Infernities from Grave to destroy a card on the field. His boss monster skill, Dark Tuning 100, would start the duel with two copies of Infernity Adventure in the deck and a copy of Hundred Eyes Dragon, a level 8 synchro that could banish a dark monster from Grave to copy its effect that turn, searching an earthbound immortal monster on summon. While Infernity at this point was nowhere near viable, the pieces were there for a powerful Infernity deck with the right future support, especially with the skill Infernity Inferno, which would let you discard two cards to send two Infernity monsters from deck to Grave, easily kickstarting a combo from your second turn onward. Overall, Darksiner Kallen's event would be a little lackluster compared to Lumis and Umbra's before it, but it would set the stage for a viable Infernity deck sometime in the future. This would lead into the last month of releases before the World Championships, starting with the main box two weeks later. Cybernetic Rebellion was the seventh main box of the 5Ds era, released on July 11th, 2019. The set would be focused around various water or machine strategies, starting with the cover archetype of Cyber Dragon. Cyber Dragon would finally receive their archetype's titular monster, a 2100 attack monster that could special summon itself from hand if your opponent had a monster and you didn't. In addition to this, they would also receive the fusion Cyber Twin Dragon, the two Cyber Dragon counterpart to Cyber End Dragon, which could attack twice in a turn. Even though the Cyber Dragons were the cover card of the set, the set would actually be primarily focused around various water attribute archetypes and support cards, starting with Crystrons. Crystrons were a series of water monsters focused around destroying themselves to quickly special summon their tuner monsters, then making larger synchro monster plays. This includes Sulfefnir, who could special summon himself by discarding a Crystron card, destroying any face-up card on your side of the field when it does, and special summon a Crystron from deck on being destroyed, Smiger, Rosenix, and Preysordal, who could all destroy a face-up card on field once per turn to summon a Crystron tuner from deck, then could banish themselves from grave to search a Crystron spell or trap in Smiger's case, summon a level 1 token in Rosenix's case, or special summon a Crystron from hand in Preysordal's case and Citri, Rion, and Quan, tuner monsters that could, on the opponent's turn, special summon a Crystron non-tuner from Grave in Citri's case, Banished in Rion's case, and Hand in Quan's case, then immediately Synchro summon using that tuner and the monster special summon. These effects were useful to make responsive Synchros on the opponent's turn, such as Amatrix, who could change all special summon monsters the opponent controlled to defense position on summon, or Powered in Zectron, who could protect itself from destruction that turn. Their boss synchro monster, however, was undoubtedly Quarion Gandrax, who could banish up to three monsters from the opponent's field or grave on summon, special summoning a banished monster to your field upon being destroyed. Crystrons would see some success out the gate, situating themselves as a low-tier meta pick bouncing in and out of relevance based on the format. The other water deck to come out of the set was Mermail, a series of water monsters that aimed to quickly special summon their larger level 7 mermails through various means. This deck had seen very little success since their release back in Gaia Genesis outside of splash play in various water decks from time to time. This wave of support included Mermail Abyssland, who special summoned a mermail from deck when destroyed, Abystius, who could special summon itself by discarding a water monster, then search the level 4 lower mermail from deck on summon, and Abyssphere, which special summoned a mermail from deck, destroying it in the opponent's next end phase, which primarily combined with Abyssland to special summon another mermail on her destruction. This archetype would see some fringe success in the meta, but never reach tier status, primarily relying on other generic water support, such as the Atlantean monsters, to see relevance. Other key cards from the set included Nightbeam, Scrap Archfiend, and Samsara Dragon of Rebirth, all being released from their selection box exclusivity, White Aura Dolphin, a level 6 sinker that could resummon itself on destruction by banishing a water monster in Grave, Nightmare Penguin, who boosted all water monsters by 200 attack and bounced an opponent's monster on flip, and Deep Sea Diva, who special summoned a level 3 or lower Sea Serpent from deck on normal summon, enabling quick and easy synchro plays. Overall, Cybernetic Rebellion would make ripples in the meta at the time, but not change much in the meta environment at the time. This set would eventually be seen as more impactful as time went on, but for now, most look to the next release for the major meta shakeup.
Full Metal Desperado was the fifth EX structure deck, released on July 23rd, 2019. The structure deck was focused around bringing the retrain of Bandit Keith's ace monster Barrel Dragon, known as Desperado Barrel Dragon, to Duel Links. This monster could special summon itself from hand if a dark machine on your field was destroyed, allowing you to flip three coins in the battle phase and destroy a monster for each head's flipped, drawing a card if three heads were flipped. The catch to this effect is that he couldn't attack the turn it was used, but since it was usable in the opponent's battle phase too, this downside wasn't always relevant. In addition to this effect, it also let you search for any card with a coin flip effect other than another copy of itself from your deck when sent to grave. Although this was advertised to be used with Bandit Keith, unquestionably the best version of the deck was with Satorius Kumar, whose skill, Master of Destiny, could be leveraged with Desperado's effect to instantly clear boards of monsters. Other powerful cards from this deck included BM4 Blast Spider, which could destroy a dark machine you controlled to destroy any face-up card the opponent controlled, triggering Desperado's summon condition, Machina Armored Unit, which would let you, upon a machine being destroyed by battle, summon a machine with the same attribute but less attack from deck, as well as reprints of previously released cards like Blowback Dragon, Genex Ally Power Cell, Axe of Fools, Autonomous Action Unit, and Regretful Rebirth. Overall, Full Metal Desperado would rock the meta to its core, as Desperado was almost instantly a meta staple, quickly becoming a top deck in the format. This impact would be further emphasized by a balance update just three days later. The July 2019 balance update hit the game on July 26, 2019, bringing a handful of changes to card balance and to skills to try and bring the game more in balance right before Worlds. For skills, Mass Tribute would now only summon its monster in defense position, in addition to restricting the user's summons through the opponent's next turn. This was done as a direct response to the quick rise of various decks abusing the skill, primarily with cards like Survival's End, which you could use the skill, pass turn, and then use Survival's End to destroy the normal monster for a free dinosaur in deck, then banish the Survival's End to pop the summoned monster and another card, as well as Subterror Nemesis Warrior, who could tribute itself and the normal monster to special summon a Subterror boss monster from deck during the opponent's turn. This interaction, along with general enemy controller shenanigans, would get Mass Tribute changed to be less openly abusable. Parasite Infestation would be adjusted to require at least four insects in deck to activate, as various decks were abusing its interaction with Lava Golem to lock up the opponent's board. Finally, Three Lord Pillars was changed slightly to no longer start the duel with Spiritual Lord and Sky Lord on the bottom of the deck, as the skill could theoretically be used to start with three copies of each on the bottom of the deck to enable playing a 14 card deck. While the skill had not been abused yet at this point, the skill was ripe for abuse because of this interaction, so it was a smart choice to go ahead and fix it now. As for card balance, Lady Lapis Lazuli would be limited to one to prevent the rampant Gem Knight FTK from affecting worlds. As with only one copy of Lady Lapis Lazuli, the FTK was far more inconsistent. Amazonas Swordswoman would be limited to two, as Amazonas continued to perform in the meta despite the numerous hits, effectively removing Swordswoman from the deck as you needed the full lineup of Princess to search Onslaught for the deck's game plan. Finally, Diamond Core would be limited to two, and Iron Core would be removed from the ban list, swapping the consistency enabler for the card critical to make the deck function, effectively keeping the deck in the same position. This balance update was effective in shaking up the meta further so the same decks would not dominate going into Worlds, further complemented by a character release on the same day. Beginning on July 26, 2019, Soul Polymerization would bring the fusion of Jaden and Yubel to the game. Jaden and Yubel would bring with themselves their key skill of Ultimate Fusion, which could add a copy of Super Polymerization to hand after losing 1500 life points. This card would let you fusion summon using both sides of the field and could not be responded to by the opponent, making it insanely powerful as a removal option, restricted only to being usable if the skill was used. While this skill was not impactful to the meta, Ultimate Fusion would pop up from time to time in decks with generic fusion materials. Wounded Hero was the other useful skill introduced here, giving hero decks a quick unrespondable summon from deck, but didn't trigger any summon effects. The skill would become a lot more powerful in the near future, but for now is at least worth mentioning. As for their cards, Mass Hero Blast would be available here as a level 45 reward, making it only available at one copy, making Wind a possible mass change target. Similarly, Form Change would be available as a level 40 reward, similarly locking it to one copy per account. While no good win targets were available at this time, it did lay the groundwork for Hero to re-enter the meta with the right support weight. Overall, this event wouldn't do much in the short term, as none of the cards here would impact the World Championships just two weeks later. The third Duel Links World Championships took place from August 10th through 11th, 2019 in Berlin, Germany, being the first time Worlds was held outside of Japan. 
The format for this year remained unchanged from the previous year, having all players bring five decks in total, two required to be legendary decks, and a total of three copies of any card being shared between all five decks. Unfortunately, coverage of this event over the years has been lackluster, leaving us with only the decks of the top two players to review. The finals of this event would be between two Japanese players, being Are, the champion from last year, bringing six Samurai, Desperado, and Triamid for his standard decks, and Magnets and Neos for his legendary decks, and Kobayashi, who brought Blue Eyes, six Samurai, and Desperado for his main decks, and Magnets and Crystrons for his legendary decks. The finals of this tournament followed the tradition of Worlds up to this point, being a swift 3-0 sweep, crowning Kobayashi as the Duel Links World Champion of 2019, dethroning the previous World Champion in the finals. This championship proved the power of Six Samurai and Desperado as the go-to decks of the format, being the common standard decks played between the top two players. However, this format would not hold for long, as the very next day, the next mini box would be released. Curse of Dread was the seventh mini box of the 5Ds era, released on August 12th, 2019. The set would make immediate waves following the World Championships the previous weekend by introducing a new meta archetype in Vendred. Vendred was a series of ritual and ritual support zombie monsters, focused on ritual summoning monsters from the graveyard, gaining effects based on which monsters you attributed to summon them. This wave of support included Vendred Revenants, which gave Monster It Help Ritual Summon a quick effect to banish special summon monsters once per turn, Hound Horde, which gave them a quick effect to banish a spell or trap once per turn, Anima, which made its ritual monster banish anything it destroyed in battle, their ritual monsters, and Slayer, which could banish the zombie in grave to boost its attack and search a ritual spell on destruction, dumping a Vendred from deck to grave in the process, Executor, which blocked targeting to any card except itself and searched a Vendred card on destruction, Battle Lord, which could banish a Vendred from grave to stun an opponent's monsters, spells, or traps that turn, searching a ritual monster and dumping a Vendred on destruction, and their spells in Origin, which ritual summon from grave by banishing zombies from grave, Evolution, which ritual summon from grave by dumping a Vendred from deck, and the field spell Knights, which could discard one to search a Vendred monster, giving Vendreds the ability to attack twice per turn. This deck would quickly make an impact on the meta on release, seeing varying levels of immediate success, but would quickly fall out of the meta about a month later. Other cards of note here included Beast King Barbaros, a monster that could be summoned for no tributes, Plague Spreader Zombie, a powerful zombie tuner that could summon itself from Grave, Glow Up Bloom, a tuner that searched a higher level zombie monster, Archfiend Zombie Skull and Revive King Hades, level 6 zombie synchros to go with Plague Spreader, and Mud Dragon of the Swamp a fusion that could be made with any two monsters with the same attribute but different types, which saw occasional play with Ultimate Fusion. Overall, Curse of Dread would quickly make a splash in the meta with the introduction of Vendred, but ultimately lost its staying power quickly. Most would forget the set quickly, as the game continued to quickly evolve, bringing the next set of changes two weeks later with the next balance update. The August 2019 balance update would match the May update, being the smallest update in the game's history as it only affected one card. Legendary Six Samurai Anishi would be limited to two alongside Sheen's Dojo to further reduce the power of Six Samurai, as the deck was still considered a powerful option in the meta. This change would be complemented by the next character unlock event the same day. Beginning on August 27th, 2019, Destiny decided would bring Dark Signer Carly Carmine to the game. Carly's key archetype of Fortune Ladies would be brought with her, a series of spellcaster monsters whose attack and defense were determined by their level, gaining one level every turn to boost their power levels. This wave included Fortune Lady Light, who special summons a Fortune Lady from deck when removed from the field, Wind, who destroyed spells and traps on normal summon, Water, who let you draw two if special summoned, and Fortune Vision, which searched a Fortune Lady on activation. These monsters would be further supported by Carly's exclusive skill, Time Passage, which originally would let you boost a Fortune Lady monster's level by 3 until the end of the turn, once per turn and twice per duel. The skill would be seen on launch as an extremely reliable way to boost a Fortune Lady monster over the threshold for attack needed to clear specific monsters. Overall, Destiny decided would be a very successful launch compared to the previous character launches of the era thanks to focusing in on making the archetypes supported playable especially because the next main box release four days later would bring the last couple of pieces to make the deck into a meta threat. Valhalla Calling was the eighth and final main box of the 5Ds era, released on August 31st, 2019. 
the set was determined to end the 5Ds era with a bang, giving the last support needed to Fortune Ladies and bringing a couple of other archetypes into the meta. For Fortune Ladies, Past, Every, and Calling would be the final pieces needed to push the deck into the meta as a true contender. Past was the archetype tuner, starting as a level 1 and able to banish any number of spellcasters from hand, field, or grave to boost a Fortune Lady's level by the number banished that turn to facilitate the summoning of Fortune Lady Every, a level 7 synchro that gains a level every turn, banishing a face-up monster any time it gains a level, and resummoned itself from grave by banishing any spellcaster from grave. Lastly, Fortune Lady Calling would let you special summon a Fortune Lady from deck if you controlled a Fortune Lady, which standardly would summon either Past or Light, so that Time Passage could increase Past level to 4, Past could then banish Light to summon Water, while reducing Past level to 3, drawing 2 from the Water effect, and enabling summoning Fortune Lady Every. The support would push Fortune Lady into the meta instantly on release, but it wouldn't become the top deck thanks to another powerful piece of support released in the same set. Dark Lords would receive Banishment of the Dark Lords here, a spell that could search for any Dark Lord card on activation. This one card would instantly boost Dark Lords to the top of the meta, giving them the consistency needed to completely take over, as not only did it unbrick the previously dead hands Dark Lords tended to open, but it also could be copied from the grave by most of the Dark Lord monsters, allowing them to continue plays beyond the initial search the card provided. Dark Lord would quickly take over the meta, becoming a mainstay for many months to come, even with the changes on the horizon of the new era. Other cards of note from the set included the release of Mass Hero Diane and Elemental Hero Solid Soldier from their Selection Box exclusivity, the Flower Cardian series, a series of monsters that swarmed off of one normal summon, then quickly destroyed the opponent's cards through their monster effects, drawing off their summons, and quickly making synchros with their swarm fields. The Agent series, a series of fairy monsters based around the field spell The Sanctuary in the Sky, focusing on quickly searching and summoning their boss monster, Master Hyperion, to control the board. Hecatrice and Valhalla, the Hall of the Fallen, which gave fairy decks quick special summoning. UA support in Perfect Ace, who negated a card once per turn. And Blockbacker, who could change the battle position and negate the effects of a monster the opponent special summoned once per turn. Scrap Dragon, a level 8 synchro that could destroy a card on each side of the field once per turn. Star Eater, a level 11 synchro whose special summon can't be responded to and is unaffected by other cards when attacking, HTS Sahemoth, a level 6 synchro that could banish itself in any monster it battled, and Forbidden Lance, a spell that could drop a monster's attack by 800 to make it immune to spells and traps that turn. Valhalla Calling would greatly change the face of the meta directly before the turn of the new era, giving one last hurrah for the 5Ds era in terms of viable decks, which would be on full display in the final KC Cup of the era beginning just a week later. The final KC Cup of the 5Ds era ran from September 5th through the 16th of 2019, giving one last showcase of the 5Ds meta before the DSOD era would begin. This KC Cup would act as a sort of showcase of the big decks of the era, as most of the top decks here were introduced in the 5Ds era. Decks that would end with one or two spots in the top 100 included Red Eyes, Metaphys, Gem Knight, and Stromberg. The remaining seven decks would have multiple top spots in the top 100, marking them as the current meta decks of the format. Tied for six in representation was Spellbooks and a Mono Stun. Spellbooks was still seeing success thanks to the power of the skill Light and Dark, able to swap copies of Breaker the Magical Warrior and Silent Magician for each other where needed, letting the player choose which one they needed in any situation. Amano Stun was the new deck on the scene, using the skill Dual Standby to have a high chance to open with Amano Iwato in your opening hand, then using the downside of the skill to disable its effect to return to hand at the end of the turn letting it remain on the field and disable opponent's monster's effects that turn. This was further backed up by cards like World Legacy Clash, Concentrating Current, and Wall of Disruption to stop attacking threats, and cards like Dark Bribe, Rebirth of Parshath, and Wiretap to stop spell or trap threats, ending the game shortly after with the advantage gained. In fifth in representation was Fortune Ladies, showcasing their debut support here. The power of Fortune Lady Every, in addition to their ability to quickly generate advantage from summoning monsters like Fortune Lady Water, would carry the deck through the tournament, even taking the first place spot in the world. In fourth in representation was Desperado, showcasing the absolute power of Master of Destiny, using cards like Cup of Ace essentially like Pot of Greed, Misjudge to guarantee a negate, and Desperado to control the board through reliable monster removal. In third in representation was Triamid, using the skill Balance to guarantee opening at least one monster and one field spell, allowing the user to quickly cycle through field spells for use with Triamid Pulse to control the board. While the deck's power ceiling was low compared to the field of other meta decks, the consistency was unquestionable. 
as any monster in Field Spell could start their cycle with little issue. And second in representation was Six Samurai, still going strong after all of their nerfs. The power of Shein backed up with Dual Wield was still a strong opening board, even in the ever-shifting meta, allowing Six Samurai to continue seeing success in the meta. The biggest change of the deck was that players had to choose to either run two Shein's Dojo for consistently opening Shein, or one Dojo and one Anishi to give more power to a follow-up play with Anishi's bouncing effect. The top deck of the KC Cup was unquestionably Dark Lords, quickly able to fill the board with high-level Dark Lords along with cards like Sanctified Dark Lords to negate effects and gain life points, backed up further by either Treacherous Trap Hole or Hey True Nade based on player preference. The deck's consistency issues had been completely resolved by the release of Banishment, allowing Ixgel to turn Dark Lords into a full-on consistency engine, able to turbo through your deck, flooding boards with Dark Lords, and controlling the board until triggering beat down to go for game. Overall, this KC Cup was the perfect showcase for the 5Ds era to act as a proper send-off. With the Desod era on the horizon, the game was about to shift into a far stronger field of decks going forward, challenging what decks, and by extension, what cards, could completely change the game compared to the TCG. When we last left off, the 5Ds era was coming to a close. With the meta finally reaching an influx of newer decks, Six Samurai, Desperado, and Fortune Lady were all proven viable decks in the meta at Tier 2, with a Mono Stun, Spellbooks, Sub Terror, and Vendred following directly behind at Tier 3. Dark Lords were undeniably the top deck at the time, standing alone in Tier 1 thanks to Banishment released in the last set. We now continue our look over the history of Konami's venture into the mobile market with Yu-Gi-Oh, its ups and downs, and its intricate and ever-evolving metagame. This is the history of Duel Links. The DSOD era of Duel Links began on September 26, 2019 with the simultaneous releases of DSOD World, the Master of Chaos Structure Deck EX, and the main box Dark Dimension. DSOD World, short for Dark Side of Dimensions, was based on the movie released a few years prior of the same name, being focused on the characters of the original anime a few years after the end of the series. At launch, only three duelists were made available for unlock, being Seto Kaiba, Mokuba, and Scud. Seto Kaiba would once again be based around his Blue Eyes monsters, bringing new skills to help push Blue Eyes strategies up in the meta. Of the two used at this time, the least used was Ultimate Dragons, which added a copy of Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon and Neo Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon to the extra deck, being the only way to access the latter in Duel Links. At the time, this skill was considerably weaker than his other key skill, Alternative Evolution, which once per duel let you transform a Blue Eyes White Dragon you controlled into the far superior Blue Eyes Alternative White Dragon. A level 8 that could be special summoned from hand by revealing a Blue Eyes White Dragon in hand, then could destroy a monster on field once per turn at the cost of its attack that turn. The skill would instantly find a home in Blue Eyes variants, as the deck regularly summoned the vanilla Blue Eyes for the skill trigger and could recycle the one copy back to hand using the White Stone of Ancients, allowing you to summon it again by revealing a Blue Eyes in hand. Mokuba Kaiba would be focused on the Thunder Dragon archetype, even though he did not use them in the anime or movies. Each of the Thunder Dragon monsters he provided had an ability that could be activated from discarding themselves from hand and a separate effect that activated upon being sent from field to grave or banished, only being able to use one effect a turn. This included Thunder Dragon Dark, who could be discarded to search for another copy of itself, or search any Thunder Dragon when banished or sent to grave. Thunder Dragon Roar, which could be discarded to add a Thunder Dragon that's in grave or banished to hand, or special summon a Thunder Dragon from deck when banished or sent to grave, returning that monster to hand at the end of the turn. Thunder Dragon Matrix, which could be discarded to boost a Thunder Dragon by 500 attack, or searched another copy of itself when banished or sent to grave and Thunder Dragon's Hundred Thunders, which could special summon a Thunder Monster from Grave, then summon as many monsters as possible of the same name from Grave, banishing them when they leave the field, and restricting the user to only summon Thunder Monsters while the summoned monsters are on field. These monsters were obviously powerful, but had no way to be leveraged at the time, as they were missing a couple key pieces of support. As for skills, the only good unique skill Mokuba would bring with him was See You Later, which, once per duel, let you return a monster you control to hand for no cost being an effective way to reuse monsters with summon effects. Scud was the final character added at world launch and was undoubtedly the least useful, bringing no good skills or cards with him, being comparable to Tristan from the early 5Ds era. In addition to these characters, a couple of new sets of cards would also be released alongside them. Masters of Chaos was the sixth EX structure deck, also released on September 26, 2019. 
Comparably to other world release structure decks, Master of Chaos was considerably powerful, bringing cards like Dark Cavalry and Keeper of Dragon Magic. Both powerful fusion-focused cards, the former being a fusion of Dark Magician and a Warrior that dealt piercing damage, gained attack for each spell or trap on field or in grave, and could negate a targeted effect once per turn, and the latter of which could search for Palmerization or a fusion spell on summon, and once per turn could reveal a fusion monster in the extra deck and summon a monster from grave listed on that fusion. In addition, Magician of Chaos and Advanced Ritual Art would be ritual-focused support. The former being considered Dark Magician on field, destroyed a card on field once per turn when a spell or trap is used, and floated into a Chaos or Blackluster Soldier ritual in hand on destruction. And the latter could be used as a ritual spell for any ritual monster, sending normal monsters in deck to grave as the ritual requirement. This EX structure deck also included reprints of Gateway to Chaos and Sky Galloping Gaia the Dragon Champion to round out the deck. Overall, Masters of Chaos was undoubtedly powerful as a structure deck EX, having its pieces find their way into various decks alongside cards from the main box released the same day. Dark Dimension was the first main box of the Desod era, released on the same day as Desod World on September 26, 2019. This box, to this day, is widely considered to be the most powerful singular box in Duel Links' history bringing various new archetypes, supporting old favorites, and introducing a couple powerful staples to the game. Where most world box launches were held back by the developers wanting to ease players into a new summoning mechanic, the Desod era had no new mechanics, meaning the existing mechanics could be expanded upon in new ways, starting with the fusion mechanic with Invoked. Invoked was a popular archetype in the TCG, focused on their singular main deck monster, Alistair the Invoker who searched their archetypal fusion spell, Invocation, on Normal Summon, which could fuse with monsters in hand or by banishing monsters from your field or either player's graveyard to summon an invoked fusion monster from the extra deck. Invocation also had the added benefit of shuffling itself back into the deck by returning a banished Alistair to hand once per turn, allowing the user to either summon Alistair again the following turn for another fusion, or discard him to boost a fusion monster's attack and defense by a thousand that turn. The invoked fusions all had similar requirements of Alistair and a monster of a specific attribute, making invocation very valuable for removing specific threats in the opponent's grave by fusing them with Alistair. At this time, the fusions available included Kaliga, made with a dark monster, who restricted both players to one monster effect and one monster attacking per turn, Magellanica, made with an earth monster, who was a 3000 attack beater or 3300 defense wall, and Cocytus, made with a water monster, who could not be targeted or destroyed by card effects and could attack while in defense position. These fusions, and the fact that Alistair with Invocation didn't take up much deck space, allowed the archetype to see splash play in various strategies of the time, not always being the core focus, but instead being an engine that only required a normal summon to be used in addition to spawning its own standalone deck with cards like Retaliating Sea and Flip Flop Frog to provide the fusion materials, the latter of whom actually helped majorly in the mirror match, as it provided non-targeted bouncing to out Cocytus. Cocytus specifically would shape the meta around it as undeniably one of the most powerful cards released up to this point, as targeting and destruction immunity, a 2900 defense body, and the ability to attack in defense mode made it immune to most forms of removal and disruption in the current meta. In addition to this, its defense could be boosted to 3900 on a whim thanks to Invoker, which would block most threats from attacking over it. Element Sabers were another archetype introduced in this set, a series of monsters, one of each attribute, that could send another Element Saber monster from hand to grave to activate their effects, then could change their attribute while in the graveyard. This included Makani, who searched an Element Saber or Elemental Lord monster, Aina, who summoned an Element Saber or Element Lord from graveyard, Malu, who returned an Element Saber or Element Lord from Grave to Hand, Mallow, who sent an Element Saber or Elemental Lord from Deck to Grave, Lapulia, who negated a spell or trap once per turn, and Mullahu, who flipped a monster into face-down defense position once per turn on either player's turn. The archetype's field spell, Palace of the Elemental Lords, bypassed the major cost of the archetype by allowing the user to send Element Sabers from Deck to Grave to activate their effects rather than from Hand, quickly filling the Grave for their other needs. It also let the user search for an Element Saber once per turn, but skip the battle phase of the next turn when used. Their final card was Elemental Training, which protected the field spell from targeting and destruction, and let you tribute a monster to summon an Element Saber from deck with a different original attribute. It also let you send it and your entire hand to grave to add Elemental Lord monsters from grave to hand for each card you discarded. This archetype was occasionally played with the Elemental Lords, as it was intended, which were all powerful monsters that could only be summoned when you had exactly 5 monsters of a specific attribute in your graveyard, which was easy to manipulate thanks to the Element Saber monsters able to change their attribute in Grave. 
gaining the effect of a powerful card from the TCG when summoned this way. This included Pyrorex, who destroyed an opponent's monster and dealt damage to both players equal to half its original attack, Umbra Mirage, who added a monster with 1500 or less attack from deck to hand, or Windrose, who destroyed all spells and traps on the opponent's field. The other option for the deck, and the far more widely used option, was the Invoked Package, as the Element Saber monsters being able to change their attributes in Grave made it far easier to handpick which Invoked monster you summoned with Invocation. Magician Girls were a new archetype focused on the new Magician Girl monsters, an offshoot of Dark Magician Girl. This included Chocolate Magician Girl, who could discard a spellcaster to draw one once per turn, and if she was attacked, could special summon a Magician Girl from Grave, swap the attack to that target, and have the attack of the monster attacking. Berry Magician Girl, who searched a Magician Girl on summon, and special summoned a Magician Girl from deck when targeted for an attack or effect. Apple Magician Girl, who special summoned a level 5 or lower Magician Girl from hand when attacked, having the attacking monster's attack and added three Magician Girls from Grave to Hand when destroyed, Lemon Magician Girl, who could tribute a Magician Girl other than Lemon to search for a Spellcaster monster, then could Special Summon a Spellcaster from Hand when attacked, negating its effect, and swapping the attack target to it, having the attacking monsters attack, and Kiwi Magician Girl, who could discard herself to boost a Magician Girl by 300 for each Magician Girl with a different name on field or in Grave, and prevented Spellcasters from being targeted or destroyed by card effects while on the field. These monsters were often played alongside either the Invoked Package, as each of the Magician Girls was a different attribute for the Invoked Fusions, or alongside the newly released Magicalized Fusion, which could Fusion Summon a Spellcaster by banishing materials from Field or Grave. This was used to facilitate the summoning of Quintet Magician, a fusion of five Spellcasters who, when fused with five differently named Spellcasters, could destroy all cards the opponent controlled, while also protecting itself from being tributed, used as fusion material, or being destroyed by card effects. Gravekeepers received major support here, providing the deck with a majority of their primary support. This included Necro Valley, being brought out of its selection box exclusivity, Necro Valley Throne, which could either add a Gravekeeper from deck to hand or summon an additional Gravekeeper monster that turn, Gravekeeper Spy, who summoned a 1500 or less attack Gravekeeper from deck on flip, Descendant, who could tribute a Gravekeeper to destroy a card on field, Guard, who bounced a monster on flip, Headman, who summoned a level 4 Gravekeeper from Grave on Summon, Nobleman, who sets a Gravekeeper from Deck on Destruction, Shaman, who negates all monster effects in Grave and protects your Necro Valley from Destruction, Heretic, who is unaffected by all card effects while Necro Valley is active, Spiritualist, who could fusion summon a Gravekeeper monster using itself and other Gravekeepers from Hand or Field while Necro Valley was active, and Supernaturalist, who gains attack from the levels of its fusion materials, protects Necro Valley on field from destruction by card effects, and searched a Gravekeeper monster or Necro Valley card from deck every turn. The support would push Gravekeepers up in the meta, though not quite reaching tiered status. Other key cards from the set include Thunder Dragon Hawk, who could be discarded to special summon a Thunder Dragon from Grave or Banished, or could mulligan cards in hand if sent from field to Grave or Banished, Yellow, Red, and Green Gadget, who searched each other on summon, Karakuri Beredo, a level 8 synchro monster that summoned a Karakuri from deck on summon, letting you draw a card when a Karakuri changes their battle position once per turn, Palladium Oracle Mahad, who could special summon himself when drawn, doubled its attack and defense when battling a dark monster, and special summoned a dark magician from hand, deck, or grave on destruction. Chaos Sorcerer, who could special summon itself by banishing a light and dark engrave, then could trade its attack each turn to banish a monster on field, Ally of Justice Quarantine, who stopped the special summon of light monsters, and Samurai Destroyer, a level 7 synchro that negates the effects of monsters it battles and stuns card effects while battling a monster, able to special summon a machine engrave when destroyed or banished by a card effect, which could include itself. Overall, Dark Dimension would be majorly impactful with the introduction of multiple meta archetypes, engines, and support pieces that would go on to shape the meta of the entire DSOT era going forward. While it may not have been apparent at the time of release, the set would set the standard for new sets going forward, starting with the next mini box one month later. Spirit of the Beast was the first mini box of the DSOT era, released on October 25th, 2019. The set would introduce new archetypes to the meta in addition to support for previously released archetypes that would change their position in the current meta. Starting with new archetypes, Ritual Beast would be the set's primary focus, a series of monsters based on contact fusing their beasts and tamers to make powerful fusion monsters that could return to the extra deck to resummon the banished tamer and beast. The archetype's main deck monster lineup consisted of two subseries. Spiritual Beasts, and Ritual Beast Tamers, all of whom can only be special summoned once per turn, needing one of each to summon their fusion monsters. For the Spiritual Beasts, 
Kanahawk could banish a Ritual Beast card from deck on summon, adding it to hand two turns later. Petalfin could banish a Ritual Beast card from hand to bounce an opponent's card. Rampengu could banish a Ritual Beast from extra deck to send a Ritual Beast of the same type from deck to grave. And Apelio could banish a Ritual Beast card in Grave to boost all Ritual Beasts by 500 attack and defense during either player's turn. The Ritual Beast Tamers all had effects that helped facilitate the summoning of a Spiritual Beast monster for the summoning of their extra deck monsters. Being Elder, who gave you an additional normal summon for a Ritual Beast monster the turn he's normal summoned, Wen, who special summoned a banished Ritual Beast on normal summon, and Laura, who special summoned a Ritual Beast from Grave on normal summon. The final main deck monster, being a bit of an anomaly compared to the others, was Spiritual Beast Tamer Winda, who was a member of both sub-archetypes, able to be used as either material for the summoning of an extra deck monster. Her effect letter, On Destruction, summon a Ritual Beast from deck or extra deck, letting you cheat out the extra deck monsters without needing to properly summon them. For their extra deck monsters, each of them had the same condition to be summoned by banishing a Spiritual Beast and a Ritual Beast Tamer from field able to return themselves to the extra deck to summon a banished Spiritual Beast and Ritual Beast Tamer during either player's turn. For their unique effects, Ulti Apelio was unaffected by card effects while attacking, Ulti Petalfin could not be destroyed by card effects, and Ulti Kanahawk could return two banished Ritual Beast cards to the graveyard to search for a Ritual Beast card in deck, which could be chained with his tag out effect to bring back one of the targets and still send the remaining target to search. As for the spell and traps, Ritual Beast Return let you banish a Ritual Beast from hand to special summon one from grave or banished. Bond let you banish any two Ritual Beast monsters you control to summon one from the extra deck, ignoring summoning conditions. And Ambush let you special summon a Spiritual Beast and Ritual Beast Tamer from grave or banished, restricting the user to only summoning Ritual Beast monsters that turn. Ritual Beasts would quickly gain traction in the meta, both on their own focus on the control through their fusions, and as an engine in other decks using Winda to cheat out the fusion monsters or to stall. Yosenji was the other new archetype introduced here, a series of beast warriors that enabled themselves to normal summon multiple times in a turn while returning to hand at the end of the turn. This includes comma 2 and 3, both of which give you an additional normal summon for a Yosenji on normal summon, with comma 2 able to attack directly for half damage, and comma 3 able to search for a Yosenju when another Yosenju deals battle damage. Sujik, who could boost a Yosenju on field by a thousand and could be discarded from hand to boost a Yosenju by a thousand in the damage step. Izna, who drew a card once per turn if another Yosenju is on the field and could be discarded to protect your Yosenju summons from responses that turn. Training Grounds, which gained a counter every time a Yosenju was normal summoned, able to remove 1 to boost a Yosenju's attack, or 3 to search for a Yosenju card. Secret Move, which could negate any effect if you controlled a Yosenju card. And Sword Sting, which could, while you controlled no face-up monsters, reveal up to 2 Yosenju monsters in hand to bounce that many face-up cards from field to hand. While Yosenju got a good portion of their support here, the deck was not quite powerful enough for meta contention at the time relying on cards like Lava Golem to help carry them through games. The other archetype to get major support here was Christron, who received Thystorm, who had the standard non-tuner effect to destroy a face-up card and summon a Christron tuner from deck, and whose graveyard effect let you banish itself to add a Christron monster from deck to hand, as well as Christron Impact, which summoned a banished Christron monster and dropped all opponent's monsters' defenses to zero on activation, then could be banished from grave to negate an effect that targets a Christron monster. These two pieces of support would be greatly accepted by Christrons, boosting them back up into meta contention in the lower tiers. Other key cards from the set include Magnetic Field, which special summoned a Magnet Warrior monster from Grave once per turn if you controlled a level 4 lower rock monster, bouncing a monster not destroyed in battle with your rock monsters, Divine Wind of the Mist Valley, a field spell that special summoned a level 4 lower wind monster from deck when a wind monster is returned to hand once per turn, and Super Team Buddy Force Unite a trap that special summoned a monster from hand or grave with the same type but a different name as one on the field, replacing itself with another copy from deck if destroyed by card effect. Overall, Spirit of the Beast would be a greatly received set, bringing both new and old archetypes into the meta as contenders. However, the meta was undoubtedly unbalanced at this point, with a couple of holdover decks from the 5Ds era oppressing new decks from breaking through, leading to a balance update three days later. The October 2019 balance update went into effect on October 28th, 2019, bringing a wave of changes to bring the powerhouses of the late 5Ds era back in check for newer decks to have a chance to rise. Starting with skills, Beatdown was changed to only be usable once per duel, as Dark Lords were abusing the once per turn nature of the skill to consistently boost their boards by 900 every turn. Light and Dark had a 1000 life point cost added to the skill, still being usable with cards like Cosmic Cyclone, but not quite as consistently as before. 
A quick note about this nerf was that the skill had been seen enabling a new variant of Invoked with Spellbooks since the release of Dark Dimension. Being able to swap Silent Magician with Alistair at will, and using Spellbook Magician as material to summon Cositas. Even though this variant was nerfed before it could perform in a KC Cup setting, it was still a powerful deck worth noting. Master of Destiny had the number of unique coin flip cards needed increase from 5 to 7, making Desperado decks a little more inconsistent from that perspective. Blessing of the Cyber Angel was buffed to both include Cyber Angel Izana in the pool of possible monsters, in addition to allowing the user to select which card they wanted when used. Fusion Reserve's Roids had its life point cost decreased from 1800 to 1500. The same was done for Dragonic Fusion, which now also traded a card from hand during main phase rather than replacing your draw for turn. Fusion Time also now let you trade a card from hand during the main phase rather than replacing your draw for turn, in addition to now adding a level 4 or lower normal elemental hero monster from grave to hand when used. Master of Fusion had the same swap effect change, had the life point cost decrease from 1800 to 1000, and was now twice per duel. Finally, Master of Rights had the same swap effect change, had the life point cost decrease from 1800 to 1000, was now able to choose between a monster or a ritual spell, and was now twice per duel. For cards, the Sanctified Dark Lord was limited to 1 and Dark Lord Contact was limited to 2, both being attempts to rein in the power level of Dark Lords as they were dominating the current meta. Sanctified being limited now restricted how much life points the Dark Lords could regain per turn, and Contact cut them off being able to use staples like Hate Grenade and Treacherous Trap Hole. Cyber Petite Angel was moved from limited 2 to limited 1, which seems like a nerf at first glance but was actually a buff, as now you could run a copy alongside the limited 2 cards like Dakini and Machine Angel Ritual. Neos Fusion would be limited to 2 as an attempt to rein in the power of the Neos Fusion engine that many decks were abusing at the time. World Legacy Clash was now limited to 2 to prevent it from being usable in a couple of strategies alongside other cards, such as 6 Samurai using it to enable dual wield in a pinch. Finally, Samurai Skull, Destiny Hero Celestial, and Sylvan Martial Leaf were all released from the ban list, as their power levels were now in balance with the current metagame. This set of changes would shake up the meta a little, but not as much as one would expect initially, leading into the first Desod character unlock event a week later. Beginning on November 5th, 2019, Transcend Game would bring Sarah to Duel Links. Sarah would bring with her the introduction of the Cubic Archetype, with Dooza the Meteor Cubic Vessel. But the deck would not be playable for some time since this was the only Cubic monster released at the time. Artifact Vajra would also be included in her drop rewards, an artifact monster that could be special summoned when the opponent declares a direct attack, nuking all of your spell and traps in the process. As for skills, the only notable one here was Mind of the Plana, which, once per duel, fully removed an opponent's banished cards from the game, making them completely inaccessible for the rest of the game. This skill was used as a tech choice against various decks that specialized in the banished zone, such as Thunder Dragon and Ritual Beast. Overall, Sarah's event would not change anything in the meta aside from the one skill, but it would serve as a good lead-in to the next main box a week later. Aerial Assault was the second main box of the DSOD era, released on November 12, 2019. This set had a lot of expectations placed upon it following the powerhouse release of Dark Dimension a couple months prior, which it managed to live up to thanks to the introduction of support for various archetypes previously introduced. The most impactful of these was undoubtedly Black Wings, receiving a major wave of support after their introduction at the start of the 5Ds era. This wave included main deck monsters like Samoon the Poison Wind, which searched your deck for a Black Whirlwind, activated it, then normal summoned itself in addition to your normal summon for the turn, instantly triggering Black Whirlwind's search effect, but restricting the user to dark extra deck monsters and destroyed the Black Whirlwind at the end of the turn, dealing a thousand to the user. Zephyros the Elite, who could bounce a card on field to hand and deal 400 damage to the user to summon itself from the grave once per duel, saving the Black Whirlwind placed by Samoon. Gale the Whirlwind, who had the Black Wing special summon effect to special summon himself from hand if you control the Black Wing, and could have an opponent's attack and defense once per turn. Chris the Crack of Dawn, who once per turn had the Black Wing special summon effect and couldn't be destroyed by spells or traps once per turn. Steam the Cloak, who creates a token when he leaves the field and can special summon himself from grave by tributing a monster once per duel. Blizzard the Far North, who special summons a Black Wing from grave on normal summon. Oroshi the Squall, who had the Black Wing special summon effect and changed a monster's battle position if used for a synchro summon. Extra deck monsters, such as Onomaru the Divine Thunder, a level 12 synchro that couldn't be destroyed by card effects and increased its attack to 6,000 while attacking if it was made using only synchro monsters. 
Chidori the Rain Sprinkling, a level 7 synchro who was a tuner if he was made using black wings, gained 300 attack for every black wing in the grave, and special summoned a black wing synchro from grave other than itself when destroyed, Rakiri the Rain Shower, who was a tuner if made using black wings, and could destroy cards the opponent controls up to the number of other black wings you controlled once per turn, Blackwing Tamer Obsidian Hawk Joe, who special summoned a level 5 or higher Blackwing from Grave once per turn, and could swap effect targeting or attack targeting from itself to another Blackwing. Graham the Shining Star, who special summoned a level 4 or lower non-tuner Blackwing from hand on Synchro Summon. Zohaya the Rainstorm, who was a tuner if made with Blackwing monsters, special summoned an Assault Blackwing from Grave on Synchro Summon, and could banish other copies of itself from Grave to resummon itself. And the Traps Delta Crow Anti-Reverse, which destroyed all face down spell and traps if you controlled a Blackwing monster, able to be activated from hand if you controlled three black wings, and blackbird close, which negated a monster effect by sending a black wing you controlled to the grave, summoning a copy of black wing dragon from the extra deck when resolved, and able to be activated from hand if you controlled a black wing synchro monster. To say that black wing support was game changing was an understatement, as this wave fully brought black wings into the meta as a top tier threat, rocking the meta with their release. Other archetypes to be supported here included Insector, receiving their key piece in Hornet, Monarchs, receiving Landrove, Eidos, and Erebus, and Battery Man, receiving 9-Volt and Fuel Cell, but none of these archetypes would see any form of relevance here due to the overwhelming success of Black Wings. Other key cards introduced in the set included Bryonic Dragon of the Ice Barrier, a level 6 Synchro who could discard any number of cards from hand to bounce that many cards to hand once per turn, Jet Synchron, who searched a junk monster upon being used for a Synchro Summon, and could special summon itself from Grave by discarding a card, banishing itself when it leaves the field, Dark End Dragon, a level 8 Synchro that could reduce its attack and defense by 500 once per turn to send a monster the opponent control to the Grave, Spore, who was released from its Selection Box exclusivity here, Swallow's Nest, which could tribute a winged beast to summon one of the same level from deck, and arguably just as important as the Blackwing support, Invoked Percatrio, a fire-invoked fusion monster who could attack all monsters the opponent controlled once each, gain 200 attack for every card the opponent controlled, and dealt piercing damage. This would instantly find a home in most decks playing the Invoked package, as fire was an easy attribute to either tech into your deck or access through other means, making Purgatrio a game ender by itself. Overall, Aerial Assault was easily able to live up to the expectations placed upon it by Dark Dimension before, releasing a powerhouse deck into the meta and increasing the power of an already popular engine. This would be perfectly accented by the next KC Cup beginning just two days later. The first KC Cup of the DSOD era ran from November 14th through the 24th of 2019. While there were multiple decks that persisted in the meta as the era changed, this KC Cup was a good demonstration of the raw power of new decks in the format as many of the new decks were highly represented in the top 100. Decks that had one or two top spots, but not major representation, included Vendred, Dark Cavalry, Ancient Gears, Red Eyes, and Gem Knights. The remaining eight decks took the remaining positions in the top 100, cementing them as the top decks of the format in some shape or form. An eighth in representation were invoked variants that were outliers from the other lists in the top cut. While Invoked as an engine slotted itself into many decks cleanly, these variants used Invoked as the primary game plan with no real backups, using cards like Retaliating Sea, Scrap Golem, Nightmare Penguin, and the Magician Girl cards to fill the fusion requirements for the various Invoked fusion monsters. The tech that ended up in most of these builds was Concentrating Current, which could, when used on Cositas or Magellanica after boosting with Alistair, boosted them to ridiculous levels of attack to end games reaching 6700 in Cositas' case, and 8300 in Magellanica's. In 7th in representation was Crystron, which was at an influx point with their builds. While the deck had seen success for a bit now in lower tiered settings, builds were starting to get refined and fast, using cards like Scrap Recycler, Card Trooper, Mermail Abyss Spike, Genex Undyne, and the skill Transcendent Crystals to quickly set up Crystron monsters in the graveyard to set up for their effects. Transcendent Crystals in particular here was interesting, as you could discard Crystrons from hand to place Crystal Beasts from deck in the Spell and Trap Zone, giving you face-up targets to pop with your Crystron effects to start place. In 6th in representation was Invoked Roids, a brand new deck on the scene with the addition of a couple of new cards from the Desod era, some of which were added during this KC Cup. The deck consisted of two engines, being the Invoked Engine and the Roid Engine. The Invoked Engine at this point needs no introduction, as its game plan has been stated multiple times. The Roid Engine, however, was truly revolutionized in this event with the introduction of a new tour guide mission bingo card, Kite Roid. Kite Roid was a Dual Links exclusive card that let you discard him to block damage from a direct attack that could be banished from Grave to do the same again, effectively blocking two direct attacks with a single hand trap. 
What made him really stand out, however, was the previously released field spell Megaroid City, which let you destroy another card you control to search for a roid in deck once per turn. And it could also dump a roid from deck to grave to swap your roid monster's attack and defense during damage calculation. This field spell could be used in combination with Alistair the Invoker by normal summoning Alistair to search invocation, popping the Alistair to search for either a roid to fuse with or a kite roid for protection, then using Invocation to summon an Invoked Fusion, recycling the Alistair to do it again next turn. Other popular roids to use with this deck included Submarine Roid for Cocytus, Drill Roid and Truck Roid for Magellanica, and Rescue Roid for the newly released Purgatrio. In addition, this deck also ran the skill Sorcery Conduit, which let you quickly and easily find Alistair after taking a thousand damage. In fifth in representation was Ritual Beast, showing the versatility of the new deck. The power of the Ritual Beast combo lied in the fact that once it gets going, it's very difficult to stop, as most of the interruption points for the combo only stop certain sections of the combo rather than the entirety of it. The most common combo would be with Spiritual Beast Kanahawk and Ritual Beast Tamer Elder, who could use Elder's effect to get both on board, Kanahawk's effect to banish a Ritual Beast from deck, then using those two, make Ulti Kanahawk, who had three banished Ritual Beast monsters at that point to begin the combo of searching and setting up. In addition to this, the power of Spiritual Beast Tamer Winda being able to summon out any Ritual Beast from deck or extra deck made the deck even more of a pain to get through. Since the deck didn't require any specific skills to function, most players opted to run sealed tombs to lock out other decks that relied on the graveyard. In fourth in representation was a mono stun, picking up popularity since the last KC Cup. Because of the interactions the deck had with Dual Standby, the deck was able to counter many other decks in the tournament due to their reliance on monster effects. In addition, the deck standardly ran one additional monster line to complement the Amano game plan, such as Spiritual Beast Tamer Winda to cheat out Ritual Beast fusions, Alistair the Invoker to make the invoked fusions, or Guardian Iados for a free beat stick since your grave usually had no monsters in it. In third in representation was Dark Lords, still riding high off their support from the end of the 5Ds era. With the nerf of Beatdown, a couple of new skill options were popping up for the deck, primarily in the skills Destiny Draw, Compensation, and Kaiba Court Blink. Destiny Draw was the standard go-to skill for any deck with life point payments at the time if you were free to play, being able to search for any card in your deck after taking 2,000 life points of damage. Compensation was an interesting direction for the deck to take, as every time you took 1,000 damage, you could mill one from the top of your deck and gain 300 life. This in combination with Dark Lord's natural tendency to pay 1,000 to use their effects made it go off multiple times in a turn, quickly setting up the graveyard and fueling more plays. The final skill used, and arguably the most powerful of them all, was Kaipacorp Bling, which was a major controversial point. The players using Kaipacorp Bling generally played at least one foil copy of Banishment of the Dark Lords, allowing the user to pay to use a Dark Lord effect, then every turn use Bling to draw a copy of Banishment, giving them access to the entire deck. What made it interesting was that Banishment didn't need three foil copies to operate properly, unlike Diamond Core before it as you could always shuffle back the one foil copy every turn and then redraw it with Blink. The controversy around this was that Banishment was an ultra rare from a main box, making it harder to get in general and exceptionally difficult to get foil copies of, usually costing hundreds to even thousands of dollars if you wanted a full playset. Because of this factor, Capricorn Bling became known as the pay to win skill, making a clear difference between the players who could spend lots of money on the game and those who couldn't. And second in representation was Blackwings, riding high off their support from the previous set. The primary issue of Blackwings in that they lacked extra deck powerhouses had been completely resolved with the new support wave, using the Assault Blackwing synchros to completely control games with their powerful starts in Black Whirlwind. In addition, the trap Blackbird Close was a seriously powerful option for the deck, enabling monster negation from the hand. The most represented deck, as well as the deck that took first place, was Element Savers, showing their versatility as an archetype. The Element Saber monsters all had powerful effects for controlling the board, specifically in Molahu with his Book of Moon-like effect that could easily set up the grave with Palace of Elemental Lords. However, where the deck really shined was as a perfect shell for Alistair the Invoker, as all of the Element Saber monsters could change their attributes in the graveyard, allowing the user to handpick any invoked fusion for any situation. In addition, the deck ran three copies of Cosmic Cyclone to easily pay a thousand life points, triggering the skill Sorcery Conduit to search for Alistair and begin the invoked plays. This KC Cup showed the clear power level of the Desod era decks at this point, demonstrating that each set so far had brought a new powerhouse to the format. Some of these decks, however, were clearly problematic for the health of the game purely due to their skills, leading to a skill balance update the very next day. Going into effect on November 25th, 2019, the November 2019 balance update would entirely be a balancing of skills, 
buffing a couple, but mainly targeted at nerfing two skills in particular that were extremely problematic at this point. The first of these was Kaibacorp Bling, which needed a nerf as soon as possible to prevent the game from further favoring pay-to-win strategies. This nerf increased the life point requirement to 2,000, effectively making the skill unplayable since for the same cost, Destiny Draw could get you literally any card in your deck of your choice, regardless of rarity. Dual Standby would be the other major change, restricting normal summoning on your first turn, effectively killing a mono stun as a deck, as you could no longer summon a mono on the first turn to lock out the opponent. One Card Wonder would have a restriction added to only allow Dark Monsters in the deck, which wasn't an issue yet, but could very quickly get out of hand under the right circumstances. Reinforcement would receive a minor buff, decreasing its life point requirement to 1500, and Miracle Fusion Time would have its reduced to 1000. Respect My Authority was nerfed to only affect one Goyo monster, which never saw relevance, and Silent Duelist was buffed to now include Silent Swordsman level 3. These changes would be primarily felt in the nerfs of Kaibacorp Bling and Dual Standby, shifting the placement of Dark Lords and completely removing a mono stun from the meta. This would be followed by a new EX structure deck released 5 days later. King's Resonance was the 7th EX Structure deck, released on November 30th, 2019. This deck would be primarily focused on the new Assault Mode sub-archetype, bringing their modern support to the game with Psy Reflector, Assault Beast, and Assault Mode Activate. The series was intended to facilitate the quick summoning of an Assault Mode monster, specifically the deck's cover card, Red Dragon Archfiend Assault Mode, which nuked all monsters when it attacked. The standard combo here was to summon Psy Reflector to search for Assault Beast, discarding him to add Assault Mode Activate to hand, then revealing Assault Mode Activate in hand to revive the Assault Beast, increasing its level by 3, and Synchro Summoning Red Dragon Archfiend to turn him into the Assault Mode the next turn. Unfortunately, the deck would flounder in the refined meta, as its power level was far below that of any of the other major meta threats of the time. However, the engine of Psy Reflector, Assault Beast, and Assault Mode Activate would see play as an engine in its own right to summon level 6 through 9 synchros and provide discard fodder with the trap. The deck also brought reprints of Red Dragon Archfiend and Powerful Rebirth, both of which would be greatly appreciated for making both easier to access. Overall, King's Resonance did nothing to the metagame, but did bring good reprints in its contents, being the first structure deck in a while to not make any real waves in the meta. This would lead into the next character unlock event just three days later. Beginning on December 3rd, 2019, the Neverworld Cometh would bring Dark Signer Rex Goodwin to the game. Of the three Dark Signer characters introduced through these events, Rex Goodwin was easily the worst of the bunch, as he brought no good skills and only a single decent card, being Black Salvo, a Dark Machine tuner that revived a Dark Machine on summon. This would find a spot in some variants of Desperado as a tech choice, and could bring back BM4 Blast Spider to perform synchro plays. Aside from this, the Netherworld Cometh would come and go without much fanfare, leaving the game in a state of two dud releases in a row, further emphasized by another set of balance updates a week later. Going into effect on December 11th, 2019, the December balance changes were widely considered to be the second half of the changes introduced in November, as this set only brought card changes to complement the skill changes from before. Invoked Cositas would be limited to 1, and Invoked Magellanica would be limited to 2, both hampering what cards could be ran in any deck that intended to run the Invoked engine. Pushing the point further, both Kiteroid and Concentrating Current would be limited to 2, effectively cutting Current and Kiteroid from being played with Magellanica in higher quantities, heavily hitting the power level of Invoked Droids. Assault Blackwing, Rakiri the Rain Shadow, would be limited to 2, restricting the power level of the Blackwing ending board slightly, and cutting them off being able to run cards like Hatronade and Treacherous Trap Hole. Iron Core would once again be swapped with Diamond Core for the semi-limit position, as Kokimaru had completely fallen out of favor with the previous changes. Finally, Spellbook of Eternity was taken off the list, as spellbooks were now more in line with the power level of the Desod era decks and still had Fate on the list. These changes would be felt quickly, but not shake up too much, as the top decks were still very playable with these changes in effect. Any changes to the meta would have to come with the next mini box released the next day. Soul of Resurrection was the second mini box of the Desod era, released on December 12, 2019. The set would be focused around various zombie support, centralized on the new key zombie archetype of Shiranui. Shiranui was an archetype based around synchro summons and banishing their monsters from grave to trigger other effects, 
generating an insane amount of advantage off of these effects. This wave included the main deck monster, Shiranui Solitaire, who could tribute himself to summon a zero defense zombie from deck, then when banished, special summoned a banished Shiranui monster other than Solitaire, Squire, who summoned a Shiranui Spectral Sword monster from deck on normal summon, then let you draw and discard one when banished, Samurai, who could banish a zombie in grave to boost itself by 600 and let it banish anything it battled with that turn, then added a Shiranui from grave to hand when banished, Spirit Master, who special summoned a Shiranui from hand or grave on normal summon, then destroyed an opponent's face-up card upon being banished, Smith, who searched a Shiranui when used for synchro material, then protected zombies from battle destruction that turn when banished, Spectral Sword, who could banish itself in another Shiranui in Grave to special summon a zombie synchro monster from the extra deck, whose levels equal their total levels. Spectral Sword Shade, who could tribute itself to summon two banished Shiranui monsters. The extra deck monster Samurai Saga, who could shuffle a banished Shiranui into deck to shift all monsters with less attack than the shuffled target into defense mode on a quick effect, then dropped an opponent's monster by 500 attack when banished. Squire Saga, a generic synchro who could banish a monster on field or grave to trigger a series of effects, including attack boosting, spell, trap, and monster removal, all of which did not target, and you could choose what to banish on resolution. Shogun Saga, who could banish the zombie in grave on summon and gain its attack that turn, then return a banished zombie to grave when destroyed. And Sun Saga, who return any number of zombie synchro monsters from grave or banished to the extra deck to destroy that many cards the opponent controlled without targeting, then could protect zombies from destruction by banishing a Shiranui from grave. This introductory wave would instantly make Shiranui a meta threat, able to cycle through their synchros with ease thanks to Spectral Sword easily being able to summon synchros from Grave, in addition to main deck Shiranui monsters pushing the advantage forward in some way when banished. This was even more of a threat because of the interaction with Samurai Saga and Shogun Saga, the latter of whom posed an OTK threat to any board with a 2000 or less attack monster thanks to the attack gain and reduction the two provided. Other key cards from the set included further zombie support in Zombie Master, who could discard a card to revive a zombie, Book of Life, which revived a zombie and banished a monster from the opponent's grave, and Dragon Necro Nether Soul Dragon, who couldn't destroy monsters in battle, dropped an opponent's monster's attack to zero when it battled, and summoned a token with its attack stat afterward, Assault Mode Support and Assault Mode Zero, a spell card version of Assault Mode Activate that set Assault Mode Activate by banishing itself from the graveyard, and Assault Teleport, which returned an Assault Mode monster from hand to deck to draw two, Dragon's Mirror, which could fusion summon any dragon monster by banishing materials from field or grave, Vulcan the Divine, who bounced a card on both sides of the field on Synchro Summon, and Raigeki Break, a powerful staple trap that could discard a card to destroy any one card on the field. Overall, Soul of Resurrection would once again impact the meta heavily with its release, bringing Shiranui into the meta with a powerful introduction, making four boxes in a row with major meta relevance. With the power from this set, the expectations continued to grow moving into the next main box two weeks later. Future Horizon was the third main box of the DSOD era, released on December 31st, 2019. The set wouldn't have a specific headliner archetype this time, compared to the previous few boxes, focused on providing smaller batches of support for various archetypes. The least impactful of these would be Super Heavy Samurai, a series of monsters who could equip themselves as equip spells, attack from defense position with their synchro monsters, and gain bonus effects when played with no spell or traps, who received a substantial wave for their Duel Links introduction. This included main deck monsters Wagon, who could change his battle position to search for any super heavy monster, Soul Piercer, who could equip himself from hand to give a super heavy piercing, and search the super heavy on being sent from field to grave, Soul Peacemaker, who could equip himself from hand to make the opponent only able to attack the equipped monster, then can send itself and the equipped target to grave to summon a super heavy from deck, Big Waraji, who could special summon itself from hand and be used as two tributes for a super heavy monster, Flutist, who could tribute itself to summon a Super Heavy from hand and banish itself from grave to negate a card that targeted a Super Heavy you controlled, Giga Gloves, who stacks the top 5 cards of your deck when sent to grave, that could banish itself from grave to drop the direct attacking monster's attack to zero if the top card of your deck was a Super Heavy monster, adding it to hand if it was, Soul Shield Wall, who could equip itself from hand to boost a monster's defense by 1200, then could send itself to grave to negate an attack on the equipped monster, Trumpeter, who could special summon itself from hand and re-special summon itself from grave if tributed for a tribute summon of a super heavy monster, Soul Horns, which could equip itself to give a monster two attacks that turn or special summon itself from the spell and trap zone, the extra deck monster Swordmaster Musashi, who returned a machine from grave to hand on summon, Ogre Shooten Doji, 
who nuked an opponent's back row on summon, Stealth Ninja, who could have its defense to attack directly and resummon itself when destroyed by card effect, and Beast QB, who gained 900 defense for every special summon monster the opponent controls. While this wave was substantial, Super Heavy Samurai wouldn't break into the meta at large, though it did bounce around the rogue setting with occasional pop-ups. Cyber Dragon would also receive a good wave of support here in Cyber Dragon Core, who could search a cyber spell or trap on normal summon, then could banish itself from grave to summon a cyber dragon from deck, Overload Fusion, which was a dragon's mirror for dark machines, Cyberload Fusion, which returns Cyber Dragon monsters from the field or banish to fusion summon a fusion that lists Cyber Dragon monsters as materials, Cybernetic Overflow, which banished Cyber Dragons of different levels from hand, field, or grave to pop that many cards without targeting, then search the cyber spell or trap it destroyed by a card effect, and their new headliner fusion monster, Chimera Tech Rampage Dragon, a fusion of at least two cyber dragon monsters that destroyed spell and traps up to the number of fusion materials used, then could dump up to two light machines from deck to grave to gain that many attacks this turn. The support would create a new variant of Cyber Dragon in the meta, which became known for quick OTKs through the skill Cyber Style, which could give the use of up to three Proto Cyber Dragons to facilitate the summoning of Rampage Dragon. The skill was also extremely easy to trigger at this point through cards like Cosmic Cyclone, Herald of the Abyss, and Cybernetic Fusion support dropping your life points. Although the deck would only see minimal tournament success in structured tournaments, it would see consistent success on the latter through the nature of the deck being able to do quick games that would either be blowout victories or quick defeats. Other key cards from the set include Artifact Lancia, which could tribute itself from hand to prevent banishing that turn, which saw play as a side deck option for structured tournaments, Start a Spark Dragon, a level 8 sinker that could prevent a monster's destruction once per turn, Chain Disappearance, which banished a 1,000 or less attack monster on summon and all remaining copies of it from the opponent's hand or deck, Angel Trumpeter, a normal monster tuner, Thunder Dragon Duo, a boss monster for the Thunder Dragon archetype that could be summoned by banishing a light and dark in grave, banished a card in grave to search for a thunder monster when it destroyed a monster in battle, gained 300 attack once per turn when an effect in hand is used, and returned a banished card to deck at the end of the opponent's turn. And arguably the most important card in the set, Dark Magical Circle, a continuous spell that let you add a Dark Magician card from the top three cards of your deck to your hand, then restack them however you'd like then banished a card on field when you summoned a Dark Magician monster. This one card would be combined with the previous waves of Dark Magician support to push Dark Magician back into the meta in an extremely impactful way, quickly rising to become a major meta threat. Overall, Future Horizons would bring many archetypes support and establish threats through different settings with Cyber Dragons and Dark Magician, making it the fifth box in a row with meta relevance. This would tide players over until the next Structure Deck EX released just two weeks later. Dragoonity Overdrive was the 8th EX Structure Deck, released on January 11th, 2020. This EX Structure Deck's goal was to give Dragoonity a new push of support to try and establish the deck in the meta. These cards included Arma Levaton, who could special summon itself from hand by banishing a monster equipped with a Dragoonity card, equip the Dragoonity to itself from grave on summon, and summon an equipped monster on destruction. Senatus, who could discard a card to equip a Dragoonity from deck to itself, and their new boss monster Ascalon, a level 10 synchro that could banish a Dragoonity from grave for targeted spot removal any number of times and summon another Dragoonity synchro from the extra deck on destruction. This deck also included reprints of Vajrayana, Phalanx, Parallel Twister, and Bad Aim, making them easier to attain copies of. While the deck did have a showing on the latter, the overall consensus was that Dragoonity suffered heavily from the size of the extra deck, as while climbing into Ascalon was possible, it required either three extra deck spots or using Arma Levaten to make it happen, the latter of which left you with little fodder for Ascalon's effect, meaning the deck didn't quite crack into tiered status. Overall, Dragoonity Overdrive brought great support for Dragoonity as an archetype, but not quite enough to make them compete in a meta of powerhouses. This release would also be complemented by a new selection box the same day. Selection Box Volume 3 was released on January 11, 2020, bringing a large wave of new exclusive cards and reprints to the game. The new exclusives here would vary in their meta impact overall, However, a couple cards would stand out among the rest as the absolute forces to be respected. The first of these was Elemental Hero Stratus, 
a card that single-handedly brought Hero back into the game, as it was either able to search a Hero monster or destroy back row without targeting on summon. Being a powerful addition as it now gave Heroes both the ability to search, but also the ability to go into Masked Hero Blast, a powerful option that was previously unreachable without making suboptimal deck building choices. The other absolute force of a card from the set was Fiendish Chain, a trap that would quickly reach staple status as an attack blocker and effect negator, filling a niche that was previously only filled by Forbidden Chalice. These two releases would fully justify digging into the newly timed release box, alongside other good exclusives like Eren Lightsworn Monk, Goyo Guardian, Naturia Barkion, and Vision Hero Adoration. Noteworthy reprints included here would be Genex Sundine, Plague Spreader Zombie, The White Stone of Ancients, Beast King Barbaros, Block Dragon, Glyph the Phantom Bird, Dawn Knight, Crystron Citri, The White Stone of Legends, Vermilion Dragon Mech, Stardust Dragon, Armades Keeper of Boundaries, Card of Consonants, Gold Sarcophagus, Concentrating Current, Magician Navigation, Dimensional Prison, Wiretap, Necrofusion, and Fusion Reserves. Overall, the selection box would make waves compared to Volume 2, and this wouldn't be the only change on the horizon, as the next DSOD character unlock event would begin two weeks later. Beginning on January 27th, 2020, Memories of a Friend would bring the DSOD variant of Joey Wheeler to Duel Links. This version of Joey for the most part didn't bring anything useful in the skill department outside of the skill Red Eyes Fusion, which was occasionally used in builds of Red Eyes. However, he did bring a couple of really good cards based on gambling that would see a good amount of play. The first of these was Dice It, which would either mill your deck or banish from your graveyard cards equal to a die roll based on whose turn it was. The milling effect of this card would find niche play in some decks that needed more consistent milling setup. The other card of relevance here, and the far more commonly played, was Head Judging, which would flip a coin once per turn when a monster effect activates on the field, negating the effect of heads and stealing control of the monster. This card would take a little while to catch on, but would eventually become staple for the Desperado Master of Destiny deck, as it provided a card name towards the skill requirement and was powerful disruption. While the Joey event wouldn't change the meta at large, a couple of cards would eventually find homes, both niche and meta, leading into the next box four days later. Masters of Shadow was the third mini-box of the DSOD era, released on February 1st, 2020. This box would mainly be focused on a new series of ninja support, aimed to bring the all-star Duel Links archetype back into the meta. This wave included cards like the main deck monsters Ninja Grandmaster Hanzo, who searched a ninjutsu art card on Normal Summon and searched a ninja on Flip or Special Summon, Yellow Dragon Ninja, who could discard a ninja or ninjutsu art card to destroy two spell or traps each turn, Yellow Ninja, who special summoned a ninja from hand on normal summon, and spells like Hidden Village of the Ninjutsu Arts, which added a ninjutsu art card from grave to hand when a ninja is summoned, and could banish ninjas in grave to prevent ninjas or ninjutsu art cards from being destroyed, and ninjutsu art of super transformation, which sent the ninja you controlled and a monster the opponent controlled to the grave to summon a dragon, dinosaur, or sea serpent with lower or equal level to the total tributed monsters. This wave would let ninjas see some fringe success, but no long-term staying power, following out just as fast as they came. Melodius would see their introduction to Duel Links here, a series of fairies focused on swarming and summoning their boss fusion monsters. This wave included Soprano, who could fusion summon using monsters on the field, Sonata, who could special summon herself from hand if you controlled a Melodius monster, boosting all Melodius monsters by 500 attack and defense, Solo, who special summoned itself if you had no monsters and your opponent did, able to float on battle destruction, Schuberta, who could banish up to three cards in either grave to boost herself by 200 for each, Bloom Prima, able to attack twice and recycle the Melodious monster on destruction, and First Movement Solo, which special summoned a level 4 lower Melodious from deck if you controlled no monsters. While Melodious would do absolutely nothing on release, the support would set a baseline for a deck in the future if enough support was released. Other key cards in the set include Worm X and Yagen, a dual card combo to swarm with both and bounce an opponent's monster, and Yosenju Kama 1, who could normal summon an additional Yosenju on normal summon and could bounce an opponent's monster to hand once per turn, returning to the hand in the end phase, which rounded out the Yosenju monster core, seeing play later on. Overall, Masters of Shadow would be the first set of the DSOD era that fell flat on release, leaving the meta completely unchanged going into the next KC Cup a week later. The second KC Cup of the DSOD era ran from February 6th through the 16th of 2020, which continued to show the raw power of the DSOD era decks almost completely dominating the tournament. 
Decks that had one or two top spots, but not major representation in the top 100, included Neos, Dark Cavalry, Thunder Dragon, Hero, and Cyber Dragon. The remaining seven decks would see multiple spots in the top 100, showing their power in the current meta. In seventh in representation was Crystron, which had slowly refined itself over the past few months. All players in the top 100 ran the skill Transcendent Crystals, able to quickly fill the grave with Crystrons and play Ruby Carbuncle in their spell and trap zone, destroying it to activate the Crystrons effects and swarm the board. Carbuncle specifically was used thanks to its interactions with Citri, enabling Amatrix on the opponent's turn when Carbuncle was in the graveyard. They also ran Scrap Recycler for setup and 30 cards to reduce the odds of drawing Carbuncle in the opening. In 6th in representation was Black Wings, showcasing the raw power of Black Whirlwind. With both Whirlwind and Samoon, the deck effectively had 6 copies of Black Whirlwind, able to start plays easily with either one to quickly swarm and control the board. All variants opted to play just one copy of Rakiri since the balance changes, able to play a copy of either Treacherous Trap Hole or Hey Trunade based on player preference. In 5th in representation was Ritual Beast, seeing a bit of a split in how to play the deck. The decks in the top cut almost were perfectly split down the middle of playing Sealed Tombs and My Monster cards, the latter of which increased your odds to open with a level 4 lower monster, making your openings with the Ritual Beast combo more consistent. Interestingly, all variants were running copies of Lancia, Herald of the Abyss, or both, as the deck had a poor matchup with Invoked Cositas being untargetable and indestructible. And fourth in representation was Dark Lords, having fallen a bit since their dominance in the early DSOT era. Builds at this stage were leaning more towards using Compensation as the skill of choice, with a couple of players opting to play Destiny Draw for the additional searching. This would be one of two decks used by the first place finisher in the world, with the other deck being the number one represented deck. And third in representation was Dark Magician, making their first real KC Cup success. The deck had been completely revolutionized with the release of Dark Magical Circle, giving the deck a powerful removal tool in addition to the consistent ability to put Dark Magician on the board, triggering the circle almost every turn if needed. In addition, they also ran Kaiku the Ghost Destroyer to be summoned off Magician's Navigation to counter specific decks in the meta. Almost every top deck also ran the skill Sealed Tombs, able to lock up the grave in poorer matchups. And second in representation was Shira Nui, showcasing the raw power of their graveyard strategies. This deck was standardly in one of two builds, in a lower count build using Sealed Tombs to counter other Shira Nui builds, and a 30 card build with Spell Specialist and That Grass Looks Greener, able to almost guarantee opening grass to mill heavily at the start of the game to set up plays with Spectral Sword, essentially being able to play the entire game from the graveyard. With a 30 card build, an interesting tech choice that found its way into multiple builds was Burgeoning World Flame, a trap that was practically useless on the field as the deck ran no Lavals, but when milled with either Grass or Needlebug Ness, became an enabler from being able to banish two fire monsters to add itself back to hand, triggering the effects of the Shiranui monsters. In first place for both representation and the top spot in the world was Element Savers, which was practically unchanged since the previous KC Cup thanks to the synergy and power of the Invoked package with the Element Saver package. Able to control the board through Fiendish Chain and Molahu's flipping down effect, able to quickly shift the Percatrio when ready to push for an OTK. At this stage, most players were opting to run 3 Alistair and 2 Invocation, as even though Invocation was easily searchable, running 2 prevented the deck from losing to a single Cosmic Cyclone. What had become far more apparent now, however, was the raw power of Invoked Cositas, as a 2900 defense untargetable, indestructible wall that could attack in that state was too much for many decks to overcome. Because of this, many decks in this KC Cup ran a copy or two of Herald of the Abyss, as it was one of the only cards in the game that could out Cositas without fail, warping the format around that one wall of a monster. Overall, this KC Cup showed that the Desod decks were going to be difficult to shake overall, with the top Element Saber deck remaining mostly unchanged since the last KC Cup. Because of this, many players started looking for the next few releases to knock this wall off the top of the meta, starting with the next EX Structure deck three days later. Gladiator Storm was the ninth EX Structure deck, released on February 19th, 2020. This deck brought with it a new wave of support for Gladiator Beasts in an attempt to bring the deck back into the meta, as it had been a while since the GX era deck had seen competitive play. This included Sagittari, who discarded a Gladiator Beast to draw two when specialed by the Gladiator Beast effect, Gazarus, a contact fusion of Bestiari and another Gladiator Beast that destroyed two cards on summon, tagging out for two Gladiator Beasts instead of just one, and War Chariot, 
which negated a monster effect and destroyed it if you control the gladiator beast. While the support was solid, along with reprints of Nerakius, Andal, and Unexpected Die, Gladiator Beast was still missing that last little bit of support to become meta-relevant. Overall, Gladiator Storm would be a good push, but not quite enough to bring Gladiator Beast back into the meta, leading into the next character release just one week later. Beginning on February 25th, 2020, Maiden in Love would bring GX's Blair Flanagan to Duel Links. Though she was supposed to support a series of anime-exclusive cards centered around Maiden in Love, she would instead be focused around a new wave of Light Sworn support, the Twilight Swarms. Twilight Sworn was a sub-archetype of Light Sworn monsters, based around the concept of banishing Light Sworn cards from hand or grave to fuel effects. This included Lumina, who could bring back a banished Light Sworn, Lila, who could destroy a face-up spell or trap, Jane, who could reduce the monster's attack and defense by the level of the banished Light Sworn times 300, and Raiko, who banished a card on field without targeting. While these cards were not as widely used as the standard Light Sworns, they would see play from time to time based on player preference and Light Sworn decks. Overall, Maiden in Love wouldn't change anything in the meta at large, but would give Light Sworn decks a few new tools to play with, leading into the next box release four days later. Judgment Force was the fourth main box release of the DSOD era, released on February 29th, 2020. The set would introduce support for many established archetypes up until now, in addition to introducing a new archetype in Luna Light. Luna Light was a fusion archetype, based around quick resource generation and recovering their resources off fusion summoning their boss monsters. This wave included the main deck monsters Yellow Martin, who searched a Luna Light spell or trap when sent to the grave by card effect, that could bounce a Luna Light on field to hand to resummon herself from grave, Purple Butterfly, who could send herself from hand or field to grave to boost a Luna Light by a thousand attack, Crimson Fox, who dropped an opponent's monster's attack to zero when sent to the grave by card effect, that could banish itself from grave to negate an effect that targets a Luna Light monster, Emerald Bird, who could discard a Luna Light to draw one on summon, then summon a Luna Light from banished or grave when sent to the grave by card effect, White Rabbit, who summoned a Luna Light from Grave on Summon and could bounce spell and traps the opponent controls up to the number of other Luna Lights you controlled, the Fusion Monster's Cat Dancer, who couldn't be destroyed by battle, dealt 100 when it attacked, and could tribute a monster to attack every monster the opponent controls twice each, not destroying them on the first attack, Saber Dancer, who couldn't be targeted, gained 200 for every Beast Warrior in Grave or Banished, and could banish itself from Grave to boost a Fusion Monster by 3000 attack that turn, and the spell Luna Light Fusion, which was an archetypal polymerization that could also send a monster from deck to grave if the opponent controlled a monster summoned from the extra deck. This archetype would quickly make an impact on the latter meta, as it could quickly and effectively end games off the power of Saber Dancer being untargetable, quickly ending a game off the consistency boosting of Yellow Martin and Emerald Bird and the attack drop of Crimson Fox. Blue Eyes would be the cover archetype here, gaining a seriously impactful wave of support here with cards like Maiden with Eyes of Blue, which special summoned a Blue Eyes from deck if targeted for an attack or card effect, Sage with Eyes of Blue, who searched a level 1 light tuner on summon and could be discarded to turn an effect monster on field into a Blue Eyes from deck, and the new extra deck boss monster Blue Eyes Spirit Dragon, a level 9 synchro that can negate an effect that activates Engrave once per turn, restricted both players from summoning more than one monster at a time, and could tribute itself to summon a light dragon synchro from the extra deck, destroying it during the end phase. The last effect would standardly be used to summon Azure Eyes, as its effect prevented the destruction at the end of the turn and brought back the materials used to summon Spirit Dragon. This wave would rocket Blue Eyes back up to the top of the meta, as the various effects of Spirit Dragon and the consistency boosting of Maiden and Sage became difficult to deal with for many decks. Light Sworn would receive a significant boost to their consistency here with Raiden, who can mill two once per turn, Felis, who summoned herself when milled by a monster effect, able to tribute herself to destroy a monster on field, Lumina, who could discard a card to revive a Light Sworn monster, Michael the Arc Light Sworn, a level 7 synchro that could pay a thousand to banish a card on the field, Charge of the Light Brigade, which milled three to search any Light Sworn monster, Solar Recharge, which discarded a Light Sworn to draw two and mill two, and the boss monster of the Light Sworn strategies, Judgment Dragon, who could special summon itself when you have four or more Light Sworn names in the grave, and could pay a thousand life points to nuke the entire field except himself. This wave would bring Light Sworn into the meta as a very potent threat, able to quickly fuel the grave with names for Judgment Dragon, nuke the board, and attack for gain, 
making their games go quickly for climbing the ladder. Other archetypes that received support here included Gladiator Beast, receiving Vespesius, who could summon itself when a Gladiator Beast monster battles, boosting all Gladiator Beasts by 500 attack, and Domitianus, a contact fusion of Vespius and two other Gladiator Beasts that can negate a monster effect once per turn and let you choose the opponent's attack targets. Dragoonity, receiving Kos, who let you special summon itself when equipped to a monster and let itself be treated as a level 4 monster to synchro summon, and Orcist, receiving Harpor, who could banish itself from grave to summon an Orcus from deck, and Symbol Skeleton, who could banish itself from grave to summon an Orcus from grave. The final noteworthy card of the set was Glow Up Bulb, a level 1 tuner that could special summon itself from grave once per duel by milling a card off the top of the deck, instantly finding a home in Light Swarm builds and various other decks as both a free monster summon and a tuner. Overall, Judgment Force would bring back the notion that all boxes in the DSOT era would be meta impactful, as it fully shook up the meta on release, and this would be further emphasized by a balance update a month later. The March 2020 balance update went into effect on March 24th, 2020, being an extremely historic balance update as this was the first balance update to make the use of the tri-limited functionality of the ban list. This section was specifically intended for cards that needed a slight adjustment to the total amount that could be played between it and other cards on the tri-limited list, being a more specialized hit than others. Starting with skills, sealed tunes would be changed to require your life points to be at least a thousand lower than the opponent's, effectively nerfing the skill as a go-to in grave-heavy formats as it made it far less consistent. Sorcery Conduit would have its cost increased from 1000 to 1500, as the skill was being used almost exclusively as a free draw for Alistair the Invoker in any deck that ran him, nerfing the consistency of the skill as you could no longer trigger it off a single Cosmic Cyclone. Compensation was nerfed to only be usable once per turn and twice per duel, as Dark Lords was abusing its unlimited nature by milling multiple cards in a single turn to set up the grade for their effects. Spell Specialist, Trap Layer, and My Monster cards would all have the odds on their skills reduced, as too many decks had been swapping to the skills for higher consistency with little deck concessions up until now. Creator would once again be buffed to include new, more powerful cards in its card pool, and finally, Cyberdark Style, Bring It, and Might of the King would all be changed to now let you swap a card in hand during the main phase rather than replacing your draw for the turn, increasing the versatility of the skills. As for cards, That Grass Looks Greener would be limited to one, as the card had become way too powerful of an engine for 30 card decks. This hit discouraged using the card in 30 card builds, as it was far more difficult to find at a single copy. Dark Lord Ixchel would be limited to two, as it was the key card for Dark Lords at the time, giving the deck raw draw power. This hit would put both Ixchel and Contact into the limited two spot, making each be run at one while fully cutting Hatronade and Treacherous Trap Hole from lists. Shiranui Spectral Sword would be limited to two, limiting how many times Shiranui players could make Grave Synchro pushes in addition to cutting the deck off of Hatronade and Treacherous Trap Hole. Blackwing Oroshi the Squall would be limited to two, as it was a critical piece for the Blackwing strategy in addition to Raikiri, finally cutting the deck off of Hatronade and Treacherous Trap Hole. Ritual Beast Tamer Elder was limited to two as an attempt to push Ritual Beast decks off of Treacherous Trap Hole, as Elder was the prime enabler of the Ritual Beast combo. As for the first ever Tri Limits, Palace of the Element Lords and Cosmic Cyclone would be limited to three, cutting element sabers off using Cosmic Cyclone in high quantities as a way to trigger life point based skills like Sorcery Conduit, effectively reducing the consistency of the Alistair engine in the most abused deck. Finally, Wiz Sage for Hire, Cyber Petite Angel, and Vision Hero Vion would all be removed from the ban list, as the metagame had advanced so far in the last few months that it was believed that none of them would be an issue any longer. This would leave the game in a newly changed state going into the late March releases, and with them would come a series series of changes to the metagame that would change which decks were on top once again, showing that any deck could rise to be a serious meta threat with even a single card release. When we last left off, the power level of the DSOT era was on full display. With the introduction of meta threat after meta threat, a balance update had just gone into effect, trying to rein in the power of the top decks like Element Saber, Ritual Beast, Shiranui, Blackwing, and Dark Lords. We now continue our look over of the history of Konami's venture into the mobile market with Yu-Gi-Oh! Its ups and downs, and its intricate and ever-evolving metagame. This is the history of Duel Links. Selection Box Mini Volume 2 was the fifth overall selection box, released on March 24th, 2020. This selection box would once again bring new exclusive cards, including a couple of far more powerful cards into the meta, similarly to previous selection releases. Less notable exclusives included Witch of the Black Forest, 
Fairy Tale Rella, United We Stand, Prideful Roar, and an alternate art version of Cyber Dragon, though its standard art was still available in standard boxes. However, the remaining two cards in the exclusive section would be considerably more powerful, seeing play in the current meta. The first of these was Karma Cut, a trap that let you discard a card to banish a face-up monster on the opponent's field and all copies of it from their graveyard. While not instantly staple in everything, Karma Cut would find spots in decks as a substitute or replacement for Raigeki Break, as you'd lose the ability to target anything but gain the ability to banish the target instead. The other card introduced here, causing immediate impact on the meta, was Chaos Dragon Levianir, who could be special summoned from hand by banishing any combination of three lights or darks from the graveyard, gaining an effect based on what was banished. If all lights, he special summoned a monster from the grave in defense position, if all darks, he spun a random card in the opponent's hand back into deck, and if a mixture, he popped two cards on the field without targeting. The final effect of this card is what was considered so powerful, and with it brought Thunder Dragons into the meta in force, as through summoning Levianir you wouldn't just get a non-targeted pop too, but also the effect of any Thunder Dragon you banished to summon him as their effects triggered on being banished. Regardless of which effect you used, Levianir could not attack the same turn, but you could always use it for a synchro that could, or bounce and resummon it with no effect to attack with it. Through this one card, Thunder Dragons became one of the top threats of the current meta, especially in the wake of the previous balance update. Other notable reprints here include Element Saber Molahu, Trimid Master, Dragoonity Ducks, Revenge Red Slayer, Fortune Lady Every, Forbidden Lance, Black Whirlwind, Galaxy Cyclone, Hey Trunade, Magnetic Field, Palace of the Elemental Lords, Revenge Red Origin, Trimid Cruiser, Super Team Buddy Force Unite, and Treacherous Trap Hole. Overall, Selection Box Mini Volume 2 would make waves off the back of Levianir and Karma Cut, further emphasized by the next character unlock event the next day. Beginning on March 25th, 2020, Carly Carmine's Dual Link Spotlight brought Carly Carmine to the game. Carly Carmine, though technically a variation of Dark Signer Carly Carmine, would be focused on her archetype of the Fortune Fairies, a series of spellcasters that could special summon themselves from hand when drawn, generating advantage when summoned this way. Though this archetype did nothing in the meta, she also did bring an interesting wave of support for spellbooks. Spellbooks would gain new pieces in Temperance of Prophecy, who could tribute herself to summon a higher level, lighter dark spellcaster from deck if you play a spellbook that turn, Star Hall, which boosted spellcasters by 100 for every spellbook used since it was activated, and Grand Spellbook Tower, which let you put spellbooks from Grave back on the bottom of the deck to draw one during the standby phase, special summoning a spellcaster from deck on destruction with a level equal to or lower than the number of spellbooks in Grave. While this support was good for spellbooks, it wasn't nearly enough to make them relevant again. The final card worth noting here was Dwimmered Path, which let you add a spellcaster from Grave to hand, seeing occasional tech play in decks needing recycling for their spellcaster monsters. As for skills, the only one worth noting here was Draw Loan, which let you add a copy of Lucky Loan to hand and skip your next draw phase, which did nothing on release but would eventually see play, although not for the intended reason. Overall, Carly Carmine brought multiple interesting tools for spellcaster decks to play with, but nothing instantly meta-defining, leaving the main bulk of the meta changes on the new mini box the same day. Fortress of Gears was the fourth mini box of the DSOT era, released on March 25th, 2020. The set would be focused on a couple of previously introduced archetypes, giving them new support. The first of these was Machina, a machine archetype with various smaller monsters released previously, who would receive three more main deck monsters to give the archetype an actual focus in Fortress. Fortress could special summon itself from hand or grave by discarding machines whose total level was 8 or more, which if used from hand could discard himself as 7 of the 8 levels needed. While on field, he destroyed a card on field when destroyed by battle, and discarded a random card from the opponent's hand when targeted by a monster effect. In addition to Fortress, they also received Gearframe, who searched a Machina on normal summon, and Megaform, who could special summon itself from grave when a fortress is destroyed, banishing that fortress, then was able to tribute itself to special summon a Machina from deck. While Machina would do nothing as its own deck, Fortress and Gearframe would find spots in some builds of Desperado, forgoing the standard Master of Destiny build to play Super Team Buddy Force Unite in baggy sleeves, since Desperado itself provided all eight levels to summon back a fortress from grave, seeing some play but not really any meta success. Aromas would gain more support here, a card trader introduced archetype that focused on life point manipulation to control the board. This support included Major Am, who could special summon herself when a plant is destroyed in battle, gaining 500 life when you do, protected you from battle damage with your plant monsters when your life points are higher than your opponents, and banished cards in the opponent's grave up to the number of aroma monsters you control when you gain life points. Laurel, 
who could special summon itself when your life points are higher, able to turn a plant into a tuner when you gained life, and let you gain 500 life when sent to grave, Gardening, which gave you 1000 life when you summon an aroma monster, and let you summon an aroma monster from deck if you're attacked while your life points are lower than your opponent's, Blessed Winds, which could either send a plant from hand or field to grave to gain 500 life, shuffle a plant from grave into deck to gain 500 life, or pay 1000 to summon an aroma from grave once per turn, Dried Winds, which destroyed an opponent's face-up monster when you gained life, and, if your life points are at least 3,000 higher than the opponent's, let you pay the difference to destroy monsters with a combined equal or less attack the opponent controlled, and Humid Winds, which let you pay 1,000 to search for an Aroma monster, then let you gain 500 life each turn when your life points are lower than your opponent's. Aromas would see the occasional fringe pop up here and there, but had no meta staying power overall compared to the other decks of the time. The final, and arguably most impactful archetype to receive support here, was Vision Hero. Though the archetype had primarily been seen as an accent piece for hero strategies in recent months thanks to Vion and Adoration, the support here would boost the archetype into a full-on engine that would make Hero a consistent meta threat once again. This included Ferris, who could discard a hero to special summon itself from hand, placing a Vision Hero from deck onto the field as a continuous trap when it did, Increase, who could place itself from grave onto field as a continuous trap when you took damage, then could tribute a hero on field to summon itself from the spell and trap zone, special summoning another level 4 or lower vision hero from deck when you did, and Minimum Ray, which had the same continuous trap placement and summon effect, destroying a level 4 or lower monster when summoned that way. Ferris and Increase, when used in combination with Vion, could turn a single copy of Ferris into a hero in grave, a Palmerization in hand, and two hero monsters on the field, providing fodder for various plays without even using your normal summon. This, in addition to Stratos and Adoration from the last selection box, led to Hero becoming a feared deck in the meta, able to use Hey Trunade to clear out back row, then OTK the opponent with a combination of Hero Fusions and Masked Heroes. The only other key card from the set was Ballista Squad, a trap that could tribute a monster on field to destroy a card the opponent controlled. This would instantly find a home in builds of Shiranui, as the ability to move monsters off the field for graveyard plays was pivotal for the deck's game plan, as well as other decks that specialized in monster swarming, giving them fodder for removal. Overall, Fortress of Gears would impact the meta thanks to heroes and a new trap for decks to play with, which would be emphasized by the next KC Cup a week later. The third KC Cup of the Desaad era ran from March 31st through April 13th of 2020. This KC Cup would be the first one in a long time to not provide an invite to the World Championships that year, as the World Championship had to be cancelled due to world events at the time making in-person events unsafe to attend. As an apology, any invites to either Worlds or the Regional Qualifiers second stage for 2020 would now be applied to the 2021 tournaments of the same level, as long as in-person events were safe to hold once again. Decks with one or two top spots, but no major representation in the top 100, included Stall, Sea Stealth Attack, Invoked Neos, Lunalite, Lightsworn, Yosenju, Dragoonity, and Blue Eyes. The remaining 9 decks would take a majority of the top 100 for the KC Cup. In ninth in representation was Shiranui, reaching an influx point on how to build the deck. With nerfs to both Spell Specialist and Sealed Tombs, the deck had to adapt its build to function properly in the new environment. The common build at this stage was a trap-heavy build, taking advantage of the recently released Ballista Squad in Fiendish Chain, using the skill Level Augmentation, which could, by revealing a level 4 in hand, turn your level 6 synchro play into a level 10 synchro, giving easy access to Sun Saga to recycle your synchros and clear the board on a whim. The deck was also in a difficult position in this tournament due to the influx of players now using the skill No Mortal Can Resist, which could, when your life points are a thousand lower than the opponent's, change every monster in the opponent's graveyard into Skull Servant, being a full removal of all monsters from the opponent's grave. The skill being popular after the nerf of Sealed Tombs put Shiranui in a really difficult position going forward, as any monsters left in the grave could be removed from the game on a whim. An eighth in representation was Ritual Beast. The deck had shifted slightly since the last KC Cup due to the nerf of My Monster cards and Sealed Tombs, removing their two go-to skills. Instead, they were now playing No Mortal Can Resist to counter various decks in the tournament, in addition to once again running Artifact Lancia and Herald of the Abyss to counter specific difficult matchups. Even with Elder at 2, the deck was still consistent enough in its game plan to see success, showing its resilience. In 7th in representation was Cyber Dragon, marking its first KC Cup success. Cyber Dragon was one of the many decks in this KC Cup focused on OTKs, paying life with cybernetic fusion support, Cosmic Cyclone, and Herald of the Abyss to trigger Cyber Style, then fusing for Chimera Tech Rampage Dragon to quickly attack for game. Other cards played, based on preference at the time, included Fusion Gate for further fusion monsters in combination with fusion support, Concentrating Current to push further damage, and Necrovalley to stop various decks from banishing from the grave. 
Cyber Dragon, though not popular in structured tournaments, found itself doing incredibly well in the KC Cup thanks to the nature of the deck's quick games. While its win rate could be considered lower than most decks in the meta, it was able to combat this with extremely quick games, usually being won or lost by turn 3, resulting in a player being able to churn out 5 games in roughly the same time it would take another to do 2 or 3. As long as you are winning a majority of these, even by a little, you were gaining points, meaning you were more likely to end in a higher placement. In 6 in representation was Dark Magician. The deck at the time found itself able to succeed off the back of Dark Magical Circle and Magician's Navigation, able to banish threats on the board while also summoning specific counters from the deck, primarily in Kaiku the Ghost Destroyer, locking up Banishing from Grave. In addition to this, most builds ran No Mortal Can Resist to further lock up the Grave, though some ran the tie that binds to win the Mirror Match. In 5th in representation, as well as the first place finisher, was Hero, making an impact with their new support wave. The new Vision Hero Monsters, in combination with Stratos, the Destiny Hero Monsters, Mask Change, and Hey Trunade, proved to be a consistent OTK deck. Able to remove back row, then able to remove boards and kill the opponent with the raw power of various hero monsters. The deck was always paired with Grit in this tournament, able to prevent the deck from dying for a turn and then OTK on the crackback. And fourth in representation was Thunder Dragons, seeing their first real KC Cup success. While the deck had technically been present since the start of Desod, they had no real game enders until recently with the release of Chaos Dragon Levianir, able to banish Thunder Dragons from Grave to summon itself, destroy two cards on the field, and trigger all of those Thunder Dragons effects. The deck's main strength of the time was the ability it had to go off from very little, as it had various playmaker cards that could start the deck's chain of events, such as Gold Sarcophagus being able to banish any Thunder Dragon from deck, triggering its effect, Charge of the Light Brigade and Raiden, able to mill cards from the top of the deck to fill the grave, Glow Up Bulb and Jet Synchron as level 1 tuners that also help fill the grave, Melody of Awakening Dragon to search for Levianir, and various hand traps like Artifact Vajra and Sphere Karibo to block lethal pushes, fueling the grave with lights and darks for Levianir. In addition, the skill Baggy Sleeves let you draw 2 the following turn if a level 5 or higher monster is destroyed in battle, meaning that any time the opponent tried to push for advantage, they just give more to the Thunder Dragon player. All of these combined together to push Thunder Dragons to be able to do a ton in the current meta, further helped by the fact that Levianir was naturally a 3000 attack monster, able to attack over Cocytus when not boosted by Alistair, giving them an out to the meta's largest wall. And third in representation was Black Wings. While the deck had been hit twice now by the ban list, a new tech the decks could produce ended up letting them do well thanks to the rest of the field. This tech was Necker Valley, completely locking out grey focused decks from the game. The reason Black Wings could leverage this card the best, however, was due to their ability to make the level 7 Synchro Ancient Fairy Dragon. By using the skill Harpy's Hunting Ground, you could make an Ancient Fairy Dragon on your first turn, pop the Hunting Ground, gain a thousand life, and then search for Necro Valley, instantly locking the opponent out of using the graveyard. Even if you didn't go into Ancient Fairy Dragon for the search, Hunting Ground still boosted your Black Wings by 200, meaning you could get better searches with Black Whirlwind. This, in addition to cards like Ballista Squad, Blackbird Close, and Cosmic Cyclone, allowed Black Wings to counter out multiple other matchups in the meta. In second in representation was Crystrons. The deck once again had two different builds seeing success. The previously successful Transcendent Crystals build, which had seen little change, and the new Mythic Depths build. Thanks to the deck's innate ability to swarm with water monsters, the previously meta Sea Stealth Attack and Citadel Will could slide in very comfortably, giving an alternative game plan aside from the standard synchro control. For the third time in a row, the number one deck in representation was Element Saber Invoked. The deck had seen some change this time around, having to fully remove Cosmic Cyclone from builds as Palace of the Elemental Lords was too pivotal to remove, in addition to mostly swapping to Destiny Draw as the skill of choice. In addition to this, many builds began to run the trap Fusion Reserve as an additional copy of Alistair the Invoker, as you could reveal any invoked fusion in your extra deck to search for Alistair, which was still ideal as Alistair was standardly used as a follow-up play rather than the initial one. Cocytus was still an absolute behemoth in this current meta, only being removable by specific cards like Herald of the Abyss or stopped from being summoned by Artifact Lancia. In addition to all of this, Molehu's ability to flip an opponent's monster face down on a quick effect made the deck really difficult to out, as usually any monster you'd summon to counter the deck would just get flipped by Molehu. Overall, this KC Cup would show how much had changed from the last few releases, but also how much hadn't. The meta, while it had widened with new decks in recent releases, was still filled with the same decks we've seen for months now. Because of this, many look to the next main box to bring something new to change the current status quo.
Truth Universe was the fifth main box of the DSOD era, released on April 30th, 2020. The set would be focused on a couple of high attack beater archetypes, starting with Malefix. Malefix were a series of monsters based on the boss monsters of various characters across the earlier histories of the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, able to summon themselves by banishing the original from deck or extra deck, only being able to stay on field if there's an active field spell, and only allowing one Malefic to be on field at a time. This wave included Malefic Blue Eyes and Rainbow Dragon, who had no additional effects, Stardust Dragon, who protected field spells from destruction, Truth Dragon, who could only be summoned by paying half your life when a Malefic dies, destroying all monsters the opponent controls when it destroys a monster in battle, Parallel Gear, a tuner who can synchro summon using a Malefic in hand, Paradox Gear, who could tribute itself to summon a Parallel Gear from deck and search a Malefic and was able to be banished from Grave in place of their requirement to summon a Malefic monster, Paradox Dragon, who revived a Synchro from either player's Grave on Synchro Summon, Malefic World, which let you randomly add one of three selected Malefic cards from deck to hand per turn instead of using your normal draw, Malefic Selector, which could banish two Malefic cards from Grave to search for two Malefic cards with different names, Malefic Territory, which searched for Malefic World on activation, protected it from targeting, and removed the restriction from Malefic monsters that prevented multiple from being on the field, and negated their effects in the battle phase and Claw Stream, which destroyed an opponent's monster if you controlled a Malefic monster. While the deck had a lot of raw power behind it, the need for a field spell constantly left the deck in a weak position, as their primary protection in Malefic Stardust did nothing in the meta where Cosmic Cyclone was the primary removal option, leaving the deck behind the meta instantly. The other major archetype here was DDD, a series of fiend monsters based on accessing multiple extra deck summoning methods using their various monsters and dark contract continuous spells and traps, providing powerful effects at the cost of increments of a thousand life point burn during your standby phase. While these could access all extra deck methods in the TCG, in Duel Links they only had access to fusions and synchros at this time, as Exceeds, Pendulum, and Link Summoning was not yet present in the game. This included Swirl Slime, which could fuse itself with another DD in hand, or banish itself from grave to summon a DD from hand, Vice Typhon, who could fusion summon a level 8 or higher DDD by banishing itself and another monster from grave as material, Dragon King Pendragon, who could discard a card to destroy a spell or trap on field, then gain 500 attack that turn, Night Howl, a tuner that could special summon a DD from graveyard on normal summon, Ghost, who sent a DD or dark contract to grave when sent to the grave, and returned one to grave from the banished zone when banished, Burfamet, who changed the level of another DD on field once per turn, the extra deck monsters Flame King Genghis, who summoned a DD from Grave when another DD is special summoned, recycling a dark contract on destruction, Ghost High King's Alexander, who revived a DD monster when another DD is summoned, raising its own attack by 3000 if there are at least three DDD monsters on field, Wave Oblivion King Caesar, who could bounce a DD or dark contract to hand when he attacks to steal a monster the opponent controlled that is not the attack target, equipping it to himself as an equip spell, Oracle King Dark, who made all effect damage gain life instead, pairing well with the Dark Contracts, and the Dark Contract cards like Contract with the Gate, which searched a DD once per turn, Contract with the Swamp King, which could fuse any fusion monster using materials from hand or field, and being able to banish from grave if summoning a DDD monster, and Contract with the Witch, which could discard a DD or Dark Contract once per turn to destroy a card on field. While the swarming and raw attack power of DDD was a huge draw for the deck, the deck lacked protections, disruptions, and a primary game plan going first, leading to it popping up from time to time in a rogue setting, but not finding any long-term success in the meta. Other key cards from the set include Rainbow Bridge, a search spell for any crystal spell or trap, and Crystal Conclave, which let you special summon a crystal beast from deck when one is destroyed by battle, able to send itself to grave to bounce a crystal beast card and any other card on field, Dark Dust Spirit, a spirit monster that destroys all other face-up monsters on normal summon, Ancient Pixie Dragon, a level 7 synchro that let you draw one when you resolved a field spell on your turn and let you pop an attack position monster once per turn if you controlled a field spell, and Miscellaneous Saurus, who could be discarded during either player's main phase to make your dinosaurs unaffected by the opponent's activated effects that main phase, then could be banished from grave with any number of dinosaurs to summon a dinosaur of that level from deck, which could be used by banishing just himself for a level 1 dinosaur. Overall, Truth Horizon would be the first main box in the DSOD era to completely fall flat on release, doing nothing to change the meta overall. With this in mind, all eyes turn to the next set of releases and changes to shift the meta, beginning a month later. Structure Deck Hero Generation was the 10th standard structure deck, released on May 20th, 2020. 
This deck's goal seemed to be for pushing further variants of Hero up in the meta with the release of more niche options for Hero decks to use. The headliner of this was Masked Hero Koga, a light mass change target that gained attack for each monster the opponent controlled, and could banish a hero from grave to drop an opponent's monster by that monster's attack. Koga would help bring a more modernized variant of Neos back up into a rogue setting, as Keeper of Dragon Magic could both search for Neos fusion and bring back the Neos used on subsequent turns, giving targets for mass change to bring out Koga. In addition, they also ran the new equip spell Favorite Hero, which could be equipped to a level 5 or higher hero monster, letting you activate a field spell from deck at the start of the battle phase, boosted the equipped monster's attack by its defense, and made it untargetable while you controlled a field spell, and could be sent to grave when the equipped monster destroys something in battle to let it attack again. With this card, Neos builds were able to tech in a copy of Necro Valley to activate it with the equip spell, able to shut out grave-centric strategies on a whim. The last exclusive, Hero Blast, would see tech play from the previously mentioned Neos deck as a way to recycle your Neos back for further Neos fusion plays, though it wouldn't be staple like the previous cards. As for reprints, Nova Master, Escuriado, Neos Alias, and most importantly, Mask Change were all reprinted, giving the latter easy access for both the Neos deck and the recently supported Hero deck, though Anki was still in its previous main box. Overall, Hero Generation would bring a new rogue deck into the scene, but do nothing to the overall meta in terms of shakeups, leaving that for the balance update the next day. The May 2020 balance update would be a massive change to the overall meta with various changes to skills and card position since the previous update in March, attempting to break up the continuously stale meta from the previous KC Cups. Starting with skills, Grit would be adjusted to only allow one special summon on the turn after it's procced, keeping hero decks from using it as an OTK tool. Baggy Sleeves would now only apply to level 7 or higher monsters as opposed to level 5, as well as now being once per duel, primarily aimed at stopping Thunder Dragons from using the skill. No Mortal Can Resist was changed to be once per duel and required to be at 2,000 lower than the opponent to use, firmly placing it as a stronger yet harder to use variant of Sealed Tombs rather than just a better version. Heavy Starter would have its odds reduced, as it could be seen as a replacement skill for both Crystron and Thunder Dragon with their primary skill being nerfed, as well as cutting Black Wings off the skills so they were using it as of late to practically guarantee opening Samoon in the starting hand. Transcendent Crystals could now be only used from the third turn onward, cutting Crystrons off using it to set up their initial plays. Fusion Time would have its cost reduced from 1500 to 1000, but had a once per turn restriction added as an attempt to get the skill to see more play while not making it overpowered. Finally, Deckmaster Effect Cyber Commander could now draw sense for Cyber Commander, which was useless both before and after this buff. As for cards, Desynchro would be limited, as it was being used in Fortune Ladies as essentially a pot of greed by summoning back Fortune Lady Water to draw two repeatedly, enabling OTK since Fortune Lady Water was not once per turn. Cyberstein was limited, as light point cost zero cheese decks were still seeing some usage on the latter, able to cheat out Ojama King on turn one and lock the opponent out of the game. Element Saber Malo was limited to 1, as it was the most played piece of the Element Saber deck that wasn't high rarity, being a fire monster in the hand for Purgatrio, bypassing the need to put an Element Saber in the grave to fuse, making it the ideal hit for the deck, limiting the deck's grave setup, in addition to cutting off variants of Element Saber that wanted to use Malo from being able to play Cositas. Magician of Dark Illusion would be limited to 2, preventing Dark Magician decks from playing other limit 2 cards in higher quantities like World Legacy Clash and Treacher's Trap Hole but would actually end up just making players cut Dark Illusion from decks to play other limited 2 cards, as it wasn't critical to the strategy. Vision Hero Vion would be limited to 2, a hit that would reduce the amount of hate nade that a hero deck could play, reducing the rate of OTKs coming out of this particular deck. Crystron Rion would be limited to 2 to put Crystrons off of Enemy Controller and World Legacy Clash, the popular limited 2 picks for the deck. As for Tri-Limits, Thunder Dragon Dark, Gold Sarcophagus, and Charge of the Light Brigade would all be limited to three, forcing Thunder Dragons to choose between their Key Searcher and their two most popular consistency options. Finally, Shiranui Squire would be limited to three to limit the amount of Cosmic Cyclone being played in Shiranui builds, as well as to limit the usage of Gold Sarcophagus as a Banish setup and Charge of the Light Brigade in builds being used as a milling tool. Overall, this balance update would hit most meta decks in some relevant way, as well as remove the most abused skills from the meta for a time. To further shake up the meta, this update would be complemented by a new character unlock event beginning on the same day. Beginning on May 21st, 2020, Dimensional Disaster would bring the Desod variant of Yugi Moto to Duel Links. 
This variant of Yugi would be primarily focused on generic support for rock decks, as well as further support for Magnet Warriors in the form of two additional copies of Beta the Electro Magnet Warrior, who previously only had one copy available. Century Soldier of Stone and Tackle Crusader would be made available here as generic rock support, the former able to summon itself from Grave if you only control rock monsters, and the latter being able to flip a monster face down or bounce a spell or trap when sent to Grave. As for skills, Born from Earth would let you set a Metamorph Fortress when you control the Dark Magician while at 2000 or lower life, which would see some success in variants of Dark Magician by providing an option to reach 3500 attack without much commitment. Finally, Centrification would let you turn all copies of Giant Soldier of Stone and Grave into Century Soldier of Stone, which wouldn't see play for the time being due to Giant Soldier of Stone only being available at one copy for most players, as well as having no real way to set up or leverage the skill but would see niche play in later eras of the game. Overall, Dimensional Disaster would bring a couple of tools for rock archetypes, but no real meta shifts overall. This would leave the pressure of the changes to the meta on the next minibox released a week later. Flames of the Heart was the fifth minibox of the Desaad era, released on May 29, 2020. The set's focus was on two archetypes from the more modern era of the TCG, bringing their Duel Links introduction to try and shake up the meta. The first of these was Mayakashi, a zombie synchro archetype meant to serve as the counterpart to Shiranui, which could synchro climb off of a single summon. The primary method of doing this was Daki, the graceful Mayakashi, a level 2 who could special summon herself from Grave when a Mayakashi is summoned from the extra deck, locking you into Mayakashis for the turn. This, in combination with Yuki Musume, the Ice Mayakashi, who could special summon itself by sending a zombie from deck to grave while you control the Mayakashi card, could quickly make the level 3 Mayakashi Synchro, triggering Daki's effect. With this effect, once you Synchro summon one of the Mayakashi Synchros, you could continuously bring her back and Synchro from the next one two levels up until you reach the top, each being able to special summon themselves from the grave when a Synchro that is two levels higher dies, triggering an effect on being summoned from the grave by any means. This includes Ouroboro Garuma, the level 3, who prevented battle destruction, Suchigumo, the level 5, who milled both players by 3, Tengu, the level 7, who destroyed a spell or trap, and Yoko, the level 9, who destroyed a monster. They also received the spells Mayakashi Return, which either searches a Mayakashi from deck or sends it to the grave, and Mayakashi Winter, which reduces the opponent's monster by 100 attack and defense for each Mayakashi name in the grave and could send itself in a Mayakashi from field to grave to draw one, or banish itself in a zombie from grave to special summon a Mayakashi from grave. While their game plan was unique, Mayakashi suffered from being both weaker than Shiranui on launch, and from being countered by the same cards already being teched or sighted for Shiranui, leading to them seeing rogue play at best. Goki was the other archetype introduced here, a control archetype with monsters that replace themselves upon being sent from field to graveyard. This included Suprex, who special summoned a Goki from hand on normal summon, Rescorpio, who could be normal summoned without tributing if you controlled no or only Goki monsters, and Twist Cobra, who could, as a quick effect, tribute a Goki monster to boost another Goki by that monster's attack, triggering the Goki search effect. These three, when played in combination with other various control spell and traps like Enemy Controller, Ballista Squad, Necro Valley, and Fiendish Chain, formed a control deck that was very difficult to combat since all of their monsters simply replaced themselves. With this strategy, Goki was able to make a splash in the metagame for the time around the lower tiers, though struggled to gain any stronger footing than that. The only other card of note from the set are two Shiranui support cards in Ghost Meets Girl, a Shiranui story, which let you, if the opponent had a monster, discard a card to special summon a Shiranui with a different name from deck or grave, and Shiranui style Solemnity, which let you banish a zombie from grave to make your zombie summons unresponsible, or banish a zombie from your field to send a zero defense zombie from deck to grave once per turn. Both of these would see fringe usage in both Shiranui and Mayakashi decks, though quickly fell out of favor with Shiranui players, although Ghost Meets Girl would find other uses later on. Overall, Flames of the Heart would make some meta impact with Goki, but no long-term staying power, showing that the releases of the Desaught era were slowly losing their potency. This would all culminate in the next major tournament a few days later. The KCGT, short for the Kaiba Corp Grand Tournament, preliminaries, ran from June 1st through the 15th of 2020. This tournament would be the replacement for both the RRQ and the WCQ this year, as in-person worlds would not be happening, instead being a qualifier for the KCGT, which would be a tournament of the 2019 World Champion, the winners of this season's KC Cups, 
and the top 100 global players from this qualifier. Decks that had one or two top spots, but not major representation in the top 100, included Super Heavy Samurai, Magnet Warriors, Goki, Blue Eyes, Block Dragon, and Light Sworn. Eleven other decks would make up the remaining top 100, being the largest distribution of meta decks in any official tournament so far. In 11th place with four unique players in the top 100 was Dragoonity. Dragoonity was a surprise for many to see, playing Switcheroo alongside Cosmic Cyclone to consistently dig on their early turns for either Sentinus or Dragoonity Divine Lance, which in turn could create a line straight into Ascalon, able to clear boards and push for game, especially with Hey Trunade, which would remove all back row that could contest the line. In 10th place, with 5 unique players in the top 100, was Hero. With the recent changes to Grit and the semi-limit of Vion, most Hero builds were now either running 1 Vion and 1 Trunade, or were completely cutting Trunade for 2 Vion, seeing no default skill commonly ran between builds. The deck's game plan had been slightly adjusted to now allow for plays with Destiny Hero Plasma, which could lock up the opponent's monster effects on field while also keeping open lines with Mask Change where needed. Tied for 7th place, each with 6 unique players in the top 100, were Lunalite, Invoke Neos, and Black Wings. Lunalites was playing a common lineup of hand traps like Sphere Karibo and Kite Roid with their Lunalite cores and the skill Master of Fusion or Destiny Draw to consistently drop Saber Dancer or Cat Dancer and end the game in a single turn with the attack drop of Crimson Fox, able to stall out turns with the hand traps, the targeting protection of Saber, or the battle protection of Cat to stall for resources when needed. Blackwing was still seeing success, even with the hits on the ban list, thanks to the raw power of Blackbird Close and Necro Valley, able to lock specific matchups out of the game with those two alone. The consistency of Ancient Fairy Dragon into Necro Valley was something to be feared for all Grave Reliant decks, as it could be done on the first turn almost every game. Invoked Neos was the newest Invoked variant to gain popularity, focused in on Purgatrio as the Invoked Fusion of choice, filling the grave with materials using Neos Fusion, the most common of which was Volcanic Shell able to pay 500 once per turn to search a copy from deck, which also triggered Switcheroo to put one back and draw one, then paying 500 again to search the copy you just put back. In addition, Keeper of Dragon Magic could summon back Neos or Alistair in face down defense position, triggering Alistair's search effect when flipped. He was also able to search your semi-limited Neos fusion with ease and was able to discard Volcanic Shell for the cost, instantly recouping the investment and resulting in a powerfully consistent strategy. In 6th, with 7 unique players in the top 100, was Element Saver. The deck was still powerful, but the recent hit of Mallow to 1 had completely removed it from the deck, as Cositas was too critical of a card to cut. In response, the deck had shifted to being played in heavier counts of trap cards like Floodgate Trap Hole, Fiendish Chain, Paleozoic Canadia, and Fusion Reserves, which could search for Alistair in the deck by revealing an invoked fusion. In 5th, with 12 unique players in the top 100, was Ritual Beast. With less decks being able to make Cositas in the meta, Ritual Beast was able to rise in this tournament to perform stronger than the previous few KC Cups, as its arsenal was able to answer most threats in some way, shape, or form. Skill-wise, there seemed to be no default, though popular options included Sealed Tombs, Shadow Game, and Switcheroo. Tied for third, with 13 unique players each in the top 100, was Dark Magician and Shiranui. Dark Magician having the ability to banish a monster on summon with Dark Magical Circle, Spell and Trap Negation with Magician's Navigation, and the ability to counter Grave Strategies with Kaiku, allowed for Dark Magician to continue to see relevance as the meta shifted, even with no new additions to the deck. Shiranui had adapted to the recent banlist changes with its deck building, though its standard game plan had been unchanged with the new support release. The skill of choice was a perfect split between level augmentation and level duplication, depending on how many copies of Sun Saga the player ran. In addition, Builds were now split between a 20-card variant and the 30-card variant, still using that grass looks greener to mill, but now placing even more value on other milling cards like Needlebug Nest and Dice It to set up the graveyard. In second, with 19 unique players in the top 100, was Cyber Dragon. This deck, while not good in Swiss tournament settings, was absolutely destructive in the point battle system thanks to its quick wins or losses, able to grind for points faster than any other deck in the meta with its all-or-nothing games still utilizing Cyberstyle to generate fusion materials. In addition, the combination of Fusion Gate and Cybernetic Fusion support made you able to summon out Cybertech Rampage, dump two monsters for his multi-attack, then banish the two dumped immediately to summon another, which could repeat the process again, resulting in back row wipes from the fusion summons and more than enough attacks to end games. In first place, both in representation with 23 unique players in the top 100, and the first place spot in the world, was Crystron. 
While it had taken hits on the recent balance changes, its competition had been dropped far more substantially, especially in the nerfs to steel tombs and no mortal can resist, allowing them to quickly set up plays in the grave using Genex Undyne, Scrap Recycler, and the Lightsworn engine to fuel their plays. The skill of choice was split almost evenly down the middle between Mythic Depths, which gave the deck access to Citadel Whale and see Stealth Attack, and See You Later, which let them reuse Gen X Undyne and Scrap Recycler on future turns to further set up. Overall, the KCGT would be a drastic change in which decks were on top now, as with the consistent nerfing of Grave Lockdown, Grave Reliant decks were able to almost fully take over the meta. This meta environment was about to get shaken up yet again, as two days after the KCGT ended, the new main box would be released. Witch's Sorcery was the sixth main box of the Desaad era, released on June 17, 2020. The set would be focused on providing a couple of new archetypes as well as supporting an old favorite with its release, starting with Evil Eye. Evil Eye was an archetype almost entirely anchored around the equip spell Evil Eye of Selene, which made the equipped monster untargetable by card effects and indestructible by battle or card effects. Gaining 500 attack every time the monster used its effect or another Evil Eye spell or trap card was activated at the cost of 500 life points. In addition, you could pay a thousand and banish an Evil Eye spell or trap from Grave to reset it to the field from the graveyard. This was commonly played with cards like Medusa, who adds an Evil Eye card from Grave to hand on Normal Summon, and is able to banish a monster from the opponent's grave once per turn during either player's turn while equipped with Selene. Basilis, who could special summon itself if you controlled an Evil Eye monster, able to send an Evil Eye spell or trap from deck to grave once per turn. Kato Blapos who could special summon itself from Grave if you controlled an Evil Eye monster, and was able to target an Evil Eye spell or trap once per turn to protect it from destruction once that turn. Peridolia, a field spell that searches an Evil Eye monster on activation, having both players take the damage of an attack once per turn if Selene was active, and recycled an Evil Eye monster in Grave when destroyed. Confrontation, which destroyed an opponent's spell or trap if you controlled an Evil Eye monster, banishing it if you controlled Selene. Gorgonio, which was considered Selene while on the field, boosted the equipped monster by the difference in you and your opponent's life points when yours was lower, and could banish itself from Grave to discard an Evil Eye card and search an Evil Eye spell or trap once per turn. Awakening, which special summoned an Evil Eye from Hand or Grave, or from Deck if Selene was active, and Evil Eye Defeat, which returned a monster on field to hand if you controlled an Evil Eye monster, or two if you controlled Selene. While Selene was a powerful card that the entire deck revolved around, the deck's built-in protections from spell and trap destruction did little to help the deck, as Cosmic Cyclone was still the removal option of choice, making Evil Eye underperform on release, though occasionally popping up from time to time as a rogue option once back row removal shifted. The other archetype introduced here, and arguably the far more superior, was Witchcrafter. Witchcrafter was an archetype of spellcaster monsters that used their various spell cards to generate advantage, either through their own effects or through fueling their monster effects as targets in hand, able to recycle themselves at the end of the turn. Both of their lower level monsters, Shemita and Pitore, could tribute themselves and discard a spell in hand to special summon a Witchcrafter from deck, with both being able to banish themselves from grave to either send a Witchcrafter card from deck to grave in Shemita's case, or draw one and discard a Witchcrafter card in Pitore's. Their boss monster, Madame Vere, could once per turn negate all monster effects on the opponent's field by discarding a spell, and could reveal any number of spells in hand to boost a spellcaster's attack and defense by a thousand for each differently named spell revealed. Their spells all had the same graveyard effect to add themselves back to hand in your end phase if you didn't activate its other effect that turn, with collaboration giving a witchcrafter two attacks and spell and trap stunning on attacking, Holiday reviving a witchcrafter in grave, and unveiling special summoning a witchcrafter from hand making all spellcaster effects unrespondable that turn. While this showing was potent for Witchcrafter, they felt like they were missing just that last piece of support to make them relevant at the time, which they would soon receive. Other notable cards from the set include the Predaplant archetype, which focused on placing counters on the opponent's cards to interact with them in other ways, such as fusing them with your monsters using Kalamito Sundew to summon Chimera Rafflesia, who could banish an equal or lower level monster once per turn, drain a thousand attack from a monster at battles, and searched either Palmerization or a fusion spell the turn after it's sent to Grave, Spellbooks receiving further support in High Priestess of Prophecy, who could be special summoned by hand by revealing three Spellbooks and could banish a Spellbook in Grave to destroy a card on field once per turn, and Spellbook of Wisdom, able to give any spellcaster spell or trap immunity, Battle Wasp Hama the Conquering Bow, a level 8 synchro that could attack twice if it was made using a synchro monster, Dark Magician Girl the Dragon Knight, 
a fusion of Dark Magician Girl and any dragon that could discard a card to destroy a face-up card on field once per turn during either player's turn, High Speed Roid Kendama, a level 6 synchro with piercing, able to special summon itself from grave if you control no cards, locking you out of normal summons that turn, and the selection box exclusives Mass Chameleon, Inari Fire, and Nefarious Archfiend Eater of Nefariousness. Overall, Witch's Sorcery would be decently received, but nothing would immediately change the meta. Though the change wasn't immediate, some could argue that it felt that way, as a complementing event would begin just one week later. Beginning on June 25, 2020, Reminiscence of the Future would bring the Desod variant of Taya Gardner to the game. Taya would bring with her the other wave of Witchcrafter support, bringing enough cards to fully establish Witchcrafter into the meta. This included Genny, who had the same field effect as the other low-level Witchcrafters, and was able to banish itself from Grave along with another Witchcrafter spell to copy that spell's effect. Edel, who could discard a spell to special summon a Witchcrafter from hand, and contribute itself to summon a spellcaster from Grave. Masterpiece, which could search a spell with the same name as one in Grave, or be banished from Grave with any number of spells to special summon a Witchcrafter from deck with the same level, and Patronus, which could shuffle a Witchcrafter from Grave or Banish to search a Witchcrafter spell, and could banish itself from Grave to add any number of banished Witchcrafter spells to your hand with different names. This wave would bring enough support to Witchcrafters to boost them into meta contention, which would quickly rise to be near, if not the top deck of the meta, as the advantage of the various monsters and spells quickly generated in combination with Madame Vere made the deck very difficult to deal with, especially since that grass looks greener was still an option, finding an extremely comfortable spot in the deck that loved to have everything it played in the graveyard. Overall, Taya's event would be almost entirely taken over by the newest wave of Witchcrafters, shaping the meta around her event drops. This would lead into the next Structure Deck EX five days later. Return of the Fire Kings was the 10th EX Structure Deck, released on June 30th, 2020. This deck would bring a new wave of support to the previously introduced Fire King archetype, bringing the deck's boss monster, Fire King High Avatar Garunix, a monster who, when destroyed by a card effect, Special summons itself in the next standby phase, nuking the board of all monsters. It also had an effect to float into any Fire King in deck except itself when destroyed by battle. While this effect was no doubt powerful, the issue it faced was a meta with threats that did not care about its revival or nuke, as Witchcrafter could just negate it with Vere, Invoked could banish it from Grave for Purgatrio, Cositus couldn't be destroyed by card effect, Sun Saga could prevent the destruction, and other various decks were playing sealed tombs, making it suffer out the gate from poor matchups. As for other new introductions here, Fire King Avatar Garunix let you special summon a Fire King Avatar from deck when destroyed by the opponent, Circle of the Fire Kings let you destroy a fire monster on field to special summon one from grave, and Onslaught of the Fire Kings let you, if you controlled no monsters and your opponent did, special summon a Fire King from deck, destroying it in the end phase, which was commonly used to trigger Garunix's nuke effect and Barong's search effect. In addition, Reprints here included Sacred Phoenix of Neftes and Special Hurricane, making both easier to access. Overall, Return of the Fire Kings, while a powerful release, came at probably the worst time it could have to make an impact, falling flat on release due to the meta surrounding it. Players looking for another shakeup would have to wait for the next mini box two weeks later. Chronicle of Glory was the sixth minibox of the Desaad era, released on July 14th, 2020. This minibox would be entirely focused around the archetype of Megalith, a ritual archetype with, notably, no ritual spells, as all of their monsters had an ability to ritual summon the others, with the lower leveled ones being able to ritual summon a monster while on field, tributing themselves as part of the cost, and the higher level ones able to be discarded to ritual summon. This wave included the monsters Haggith, who searched a Megalith spell or trap on ritual summon, Ophiel, who searched a Megalith monster on Ritual Summon, Oak, who drew and discarded one on Ritual Summon and could use its Ritual Summon effect during either player's main phase, Phaleg, who boosted all of your monsters by 300 attack and defense for every Ritual monster in Grave, Baythor, who destroyed cards the opponent controlled up to the number of unique Ritual monsters in Grave, the field spell Portal, which prevented the battle destruction of Ritual monsters once each and recycled a Ritual monster from Grave to hand when a Megalith Ritual Summon is successful once per turn, and the Trap's Emergence, which special summoned a Megalith from Grave once per turn, and Promotion, 
which doubled the level of a monster on field once per turn. Though Megalith was a fairly recent archetype in the TCG with a lot going for it, the deck found itself not performing well in the current metagame, finding a spot in the occasional rogue strategy, but never breaking into tiered status. Other cards from the set include Stardust Chronicle Spark Dragon, a level 10 Synchro that must be made with Synchros and could banish a Synchro from Grave to make itself immune to all card effects for the turn, Special Summoning a Banished Dragon Synchro on Destruction, and Coral Dragon, a level 6 Tuner Synchro that could discard a card to pop a card once per turn and drew the user a card when sent to Grave, being valuable in removal, draw power, and the Synchro extension by being a Tuner. Overall, Chronicle of Glory fell flat on release, bringing nothing new in terms of meta strategies to the game, leaving the meta landscape unchanged since the Witchcrafter release. To help combat this, there would be another balance update to prepare the meta for the KCGT one week later. The July 2020 balance update would go into effect on July 21st, 2020, bringing a massive wave of balance changes to rein in the powerhouses of the meta ahead of the KCGT a month later. Starting with skills, Draw Sense, Spell, and Trap would be changed to now require at least three differently named spell and traps in the deck to activate. This was a direct response to the growing Block Dragon deck on the ladder, abusing the skill by playing 29 monsters and a single copy of that grass looks greener, able to take a thousand and draw the game winning spell, milling a third of your deck and ending the game quickly after. Cyber Style could now only be used at 2,000 or lower life points and restricted the user to only attacking with fusions that turn. While the fusion attacking restriction was not the worst, as you could still OTK with Chimera Tech Rampage Dragon, needing to be under 2,000 life points now meant that you either had to use two payment spells or cybernetic fusion support to activate the skill, making it less consistent to actually get off. As for buffs, tuning would now only cost 1,000, down from 1,500, and added Speed Warrior to the grave at the start of the duel if you had three or more junk monsters in deck. The other, and far more impactful buff, was to Ultimate Dragons, now also adding a copy of Blue Eyes Twin Burst Dragon to the extra deck, and, from turn three onward, allowed the user to reveal two Blue Eyes White Dragon in hand to add a copy of Palmerization from outside of the deck to the hand, instantly giving the user access to one of the added fusions. Moving to cards, Type Zero Magic Crusher would be limited to one, as players were playing it in various Witchcrafter decks to perform OTKs with, as discarding a spell for its effect eight times would end the game, becoming an issue with the Witchcrafter spells being able to add themselves back to hand. Give and Take was limited to one, as players were using it in combination with Raw's Disciple to lock the opponent out of special summoning, being a degenerate strategy on the latter. Magician's Rod would be limited to two, and Magician of Dark Illusion would be released from the list, as Magician's Rod was the far more impactful piece of the Dark Magician game plan able to search navigation and circle on some. Shiranui Squire was limited to 2, down from 3, and Spectral Sword would be limited to 3 in its place, still keeping the deck off multiple Cosmic Cyclone in charge of the Light Brigade, while also limiting how many 1-card synchros the deck could make. Cybernetic Overflow was limited to 2 to stop the consistency of its nuking a board effect before making Rampage Dragon for game, as well as cutting the deck off of enemy controller. Dragoonity Divine Lance was limited to 2, as Dragoonity was using Hey Trunade at the time to enable OTKs using either Senatus or Divine Lance. By limiting Lance, they limited how many Trunade the deck could run, but more commonly saw the deck dropping Divine Lance entirely to keep playing Trunade at 2. Lunalight Crimson Fox would be limited to 2, as Lunalight decks on the latter had been consistently using it to enable OTKs on any attack position monster, but also to limit its usage alongside Neo's Fusion as a way to cheese an OTK. Christron Impact would be limited to 2, matching Rion, to reduce copies of both in the deck, as Christron was consistently a top deck in the meta. Lastly, Amazonas Princess was removed from the ban list, as Amazonas was no longer a player in the meta at all, though Onslaught was still on the list. This ban list was intended to be the last one going into the KCGT in a month, balancing the meta, in addition to complementing another new archetype release over the next week. Beginning on July 27, 2020, Clash at Crash Town would bring Kalen Kessler to Duel Links. As the standard version of Dark Signer Kalen Kessler introduced back in the 5Ds era, Kalen would once again bring support for his archetype of Infernity in the form of Infernity, Doom Dragon, and Barrier. Doom Dragon was a level 8 synchro that could, when you had no cards in hand, destroy a monster on field and deal damage to the opponent equal to half its attack, though he couldn't attack that turn, seeing occasional play as a tech choice, but far from staple play in any deck. Barrier, on the other hand, was an omni-negate counter trap as long as you had no cards in hand and controlled an attack position Infernity monster, which was undoubtedly powerful, but was only available at one copy, making it inconsistent as, for the initial few days, you couldn't search for it. The only non-Infernity card of note here was Luna the Dark Spirit, 
a monster that could only be special summoned by banishing a darkened grave, and could burn the opponent for 500 during each of your standby phases, finding an occasional tech spot in Thunder Dragons as an additional banishing option. At the time, he wouldn't bring any new notable skills, though he would get one on the second run of the event in October, Shell of a Ghost, which could, when you had no cards in hand and controlled an Infernity monster, place a copy of Infernity Launcher in the deck on top of the deck, then added another copy of it to the bottom from outside of the deck. Though Kallen only brought with him a couple of cards to boost the almost non-existent Infernity deck, this wouldn't be the only wave, as they would also be a pivotal part of the next main box four days later. Infernity Destruction was the seventh main box of the DSOT era, released on July 31st, 2020. As the name implied, this box would be focused on further support for Infernity, bringing the deck arguably its two most important enablers, Archfiend and Launcher. Archfiend was a monster that could, when drawn as the only card in hand, special summon itself, and if special summoned while you had no cards in hand, was able to search for any Infernity card in the deck. Launcher was a continuous spell that could discard an Infernity monster from hand once per turn, and, while you controlled no cards in hand, could be sent to Grave to special summon two Infernity monsters from the Grave. Launcher's special summoning Archfiend would allow the user to search for additional copies of Launcher, able to make a synchro play using a copy of Beetle, putting both back into the Grave, and then activating Launcher again, able to loop through all three copies in a deck before ending it with a search for Barrier, giving the board an Omni Negate. Though this support made the deck playable, seeing success in a rogue setting, the issue still stood that it, like Fire King, had a poor matchup with the current meta field, especially with Sealed Tombs still being popular. The other archetype supported here was Weather Painter, a series of monsters that gained effects off their continuous spells and traps, which passed their effects to monsters in the same or next column over, able to have the monsters banish themselves to trigger the effect, then return to the field in the next standby phase. This included Snow, who placed the Weather spell or trap from deck into your spell and trap card zone face up on normal summon, Sun, who could revive itself by sending a face-up continuous spell or trap to grave, replacing it with a the weather spell or trap from hand, thunder, who could send a face-up continuous spell or trap from field to grave to activate it with a weather spell or trap from deck, cloud, who could, when a weather card is sent to grave, activate up to two the weather spell or traps from grave, and the continuous spell and trap snowy canvas, which gave the ability to banish the monster to search for a the weather card, locking you out of adding cards for the rest of the turn, thundery canvas, which let you, when a Weather Painter battled, banish it to bounce the opponent's battling monster to hand, and Cloudy Canvas, which let you banish a Weather Painter to have a monster's attack and defense, but let it attack directly that turn. Weather Painters would see success like most decks of the time in a rogue setting, but also fell to the same trappings of bad matchups, specifically with Witchcrafter able to negate the gained effects with Vare. Other cards of note in the set included Samorg of Darkness, who could special summon itself from hand or grave when a Dark or Wind monster is tribute summoned, was always considered a wind monster, and was able to tribute a wind winged beast to negate and destroy a spell or trap effect, and the release of the selection box exclusives Goyo Guardian, Naturia Barkeon, and Cursed Fig. Overall, Infernity Destruction did introduce support for two archetypes to find rogue success, but the issue still stood that the current metagame was too oppressive for any new decks to rise in, especially with the power of Witchcrafter at the time, leading to an emergency ban list directly before the KCGT. The August 2020 balance update went into effect on August 20th, 2020, changing the banless position of only a single card. Witchcrafter Holiday would be limited to three, as it was arguably the most useful Witchcrafter spell and needed to share the limited three spot with Charge of the Light Brigade, an almost staple choice in any Witchcrafter deck for the milling it provided. With this hit in place, all of the releases were locked in going into the KCGT a week later. The KCGT Main Tournament 2020 Championships began on August 29th, 2020, being the replacement for the World Championship this year due to world events. The stage of the tournament was a competition between the top 16 players from Stage 1 taking place a month prior, requiring all players to submit three deck lists with different skills and only three copies of any card used across all three decks, adjusted to two and one per limited cards. The players would play in a best two out of three match, only able to use each deck once per match, playing a single elimination bracket. In fourth place was Soroko-kun, who brought a lineup of Dark Magician, Black Wings, and Infernity, notably playing Wing Karibo and the Flute of Summoning Karibo in his Infernity build to stall alongside Trap Stun and Hey Trunade to insulate his combos when he went off. In third place was GAOV, who brought a lineup of Invoked Neos, Blue Eyes, and Witchcrafters, opting to play two Charge of the Light Brigade and one Witchcrafter Holiday in his builds with the recent hits. 
Invoked Neos was in three of the four lineups, marking it as the top deck of the restricted format. The deck had completely ditched using Cositas here, opting for a much heavier line for Keeper of Dragon Magic to revive Alistair and Neos from Grave after using them to either fuse or boost attack as well as being able to search for Neos Fusion on Summon, essentially boosting the copies of the card in the deck to 5. In second overall was KW Row, playing a lineup of Ritual Beast, Invoked Neos, and Blue Eyes. Ritual Beast here was unique in that it was now playing the skill Shadow Game, which burned each player for 100 times the number of cards in Graveyard at the end of the turn. Ritual Beast could avoid this burn usually through a combination of tagging into fusions, tagging out into their tamers and beasts, and using a Pelios effect to banish Ritual Beast cards from the graveyard to keep grave counts lower than the opponents, usually winning in a war of attrition. In first place overall was Zade King, playing a lineup of Shiranui, Invoked Neos, and Hero. For the first time in Duel Links World Championship history, the final match was not a complete sweep, as Zade King and KW Row played a full match in the finals, with Zade King's Invoked Neos beating KW Row's Ritual Beast in the final game to crown Zade King the 2020 World Champion. The KCGT was an interesting event, taking the place of the World Championship for 2020, but the top 16 matches did not disappoint, leading many to look for the next few releases to round out the DSOD era. Beginning on August 28, 2020, Dimensional Disaster would bring Aigami to Duel Links. Though this event technically started the day before Worlds, Aigami was not legal to use in the World Championship, leaving his strategies to be used after. Aigami's main archetype was Cubics, a series of monsters all centered around the card Vijam the Cubic Seed, a monster that couldn't be destroyed by battle, was able to make itself a continuous spell after battle to place a cubic counter on the other monster, which negates its effects and makes it unable to attack, and was able to special summon itself from the spell and trap zone during the player's main phase. While this card might be considerably powerful as a stall option, the catch was you could only play it using the skill Cubic Seeds, which required you to have a deck of nothing but cubic cards, completely killing the usefulness of the card as the other pieces of the cubic archetype were not the greatest when you couldn't use staples. While this event would give Cubics enough support to make it into a deck, it would see absolutely no success, even in a rogue setting, leaving only one release for the DSOD era to change its meta. Arena of Sanctuary was the seventh mini box and the final box of the DSOD era, released on August 31st, 2020. This box was primarily focused on introducing the Valkyrie archetype, a series of fairy monsters focused on swarming the board to overwhelm the opponent with their various effects. This included monsters like Brunhild, who was unaffected by opponent's spells, gained 500 attack for every card the opponent controlled, and could reduce its defense by 1000 to protect all Valkyries from battle destruction that turn, Sigrun, who could special summon itself from hand by sending a face-up spell or trap to grave, able to special summon another Valkyrie from hand or grave on summon, Erda, who reduced all opponent's monsters by a thousand attack if summoned by a Valkyrie effect, and banished any opponent's card that was destroyed while it was face up, Zvita, who destroyed an opponent's monster on summon and recycled a continuous spell or trap when it battled, Verta, who could excavate a number of cards equal to the number of other Valkyrie cards on the field, and add a spell or trap among them to hand once per turn, and float it into any other Valkyrie in deck on battle destruction, Sexta, who special summoned a Valkyrie from deck on special summon and could mill the opponent by two once per turn, and the spell Valkyrie's Embrace, which changed a Valkyrie to defense position to banish an opponent's monster. While this support was decent, Valkyrie would struggle to see even fringe play, never making it into the meta at all. However, a meta deck would rise from the set in the form of support for Karakuri. Karakuri received Kunam Zan, a monster who could special summon itself as a tuner from hand by changing the battle position of a Karakuri monster, Gamma Oil, which special summoned a Karakuri from grave, and Cash In, which is able to negate a monster effect by changing a Karakuri's battle position, then could be banished from grave to change a monster's battle position if you control a Karakuri monster. This little bit of support was enough to push Karakuri back into the meta in a major way, combining with the previously released Beredo to make Karakuri a tier 1 meta threat instantly. Other notable cards from the set include Trishula, the Dragon of Icy Imprisonment, a fusion that could be summoned by banishing three monsters with different names from field, being a solid tech option for decks needing to clear out their clogged boards, Triamid's Sphinx, the boss monster of the Triamid strategy, and Karma Cut, which was released from its selection box exclusivity here. Overall, Arena of Sanctuary was very unassuming on the surface, but would completely change the meta right before the era changed, which was fully apparent from the KC Cup taking place just a week later. 
The final KC Cup of the DSOD era took place from September 8th through the 21st of 2020, being the final look at the meta before the Zexal era would begin. As the era continued, more and more decks had become viable options, even in a rogue setting, leading to this KC Cup having the most diverse field of decks so far, with 12 decks having 3 or more appearances in the top 100. Decks that had a minor representation in the top cut included Desperado, Evil Eye, Goki, Hero, Megalith, Ritual Beast, Stromberg, Lightsworn, and Dragoonity. In ninth was a four-way tie between Weather Painters, Lunalite, Invoked Neos, and Dark Magician with three unique players each. Weather Painters' game plan was fairly standard at this point, playing balance as a way to ensure opening with one monster spell and trap at the start of each game. They also teched in a copy of Necrovalley, as Weather Painters rarely if ever hit the grave, making it a one-sided lockout. Lunalite was also fairly standard at this point, playing various stall cards until you could fusion summon a Saber Dancer or Cat Dancer with Crimson Fox and swing for game. Invoked Neos had remained mostly unchanged from the KCGT, playing Switcheroo to send back Volcanic Shells for free draws, and Keeper of Dragon Magic to reuse and search engine pieces. Dark Magician was also mostly unchanged from its recent iterations, following mostly because the power play of Kaiku was no longer the meta ender it used to be. An eighth with four unique players was Cyber Dragon, still showing the ability for the deck to perform in a point battle system thanks to the raw number of games it can pump out. Tied for fifth with five unique players were Crystron, Triamid, and Shiranui. Crystron had taken a heavy hit on the last balance update with a semi limit of impact, but was still consistent enough with Sea Stealth Attack to see success. Shiranui was still in flux over whether 20 or 30 card builds were better, but it seemed that level duplication had fully taken over as the skill of choice for the time being, as it enabled Turn 1 access to Shogun Saga, which was considered more impactful than the Turn 1 Sun Saga of the Augmentation build, though the first place finisher of this KC Cup used only Shiranui with two of the three builds being 30 card grass builds. Triamid had shifted its focus with the most recent set, and now had its actual boss monster and game ender in Sphinx, who was extremely easy to search and summon thanks to Cruiser searching a Triamid when sent to Grave, and King Golem special summoning a Triamid from hand when sent to Grave. This one piece of support made Triamid a viable option in the metagame once again, still using balance to ensure opening with a monster and a field spell. In fourth with seven unique players was Black Wings, which had fully centralized their builds as of late. The raw power of using Ancient Fairy Dragon to search for Necrovalley was still great against many decks in the format, but now almost every build was playing three copies of Blackbird Close, as being able to use a counter trap from hand to negate and destroy any monster that uses its effect was insanely powerful for the time, especially combined with some Moon and Black Whirlwind for consistent opening plays. In third with 12 unique players was Element Saber, still proving to be the preferred archetype to play with Invoke. The deck had various builds used in this tournament, such as an Endless Trap Hell build with heavy trap lineups, Sorcery Conduit builds still aiming to search Alistair, and the most popular, Destiny Draw builds of varying sizes and lineups, as there was no clear best way to build the deck at the time. In second, with 16 unique players, was Witchcrafter, still riding high off their introduction waves. The majority of builds at this stage were 30 card builds with two Charge of the Light Brigade and one Witchcrafter Holiday as their tri-limit split, in addition to one copy of That Grass Looks Greener, which standardly would just win the game outright if you weren't playing against a 30 card deck. In addition, the deck ran Show of Nightmares, which could give you any spell engraved back to hand at random as long as you had three engraved, which was extremely easy to set up with Witchcrafter and allowed the reuse of setup tools and play extenders. The top deck of this KC Cup, with 25 unique players in the top 100, was Karakuri, showing the raw power of the deck's new tools. Between Kunamzan, Nanishi, and Inasichi, the deck had multiple lines of synchro plays off a combination of any two of them, which Inasichi could always search a missing piece when summoned. In addition to this, Heytrunade gave instant clear back row, Cash Cash was another searcher for the whole deck, Gamma Oil could revive a piece for extension, Cash In was searchable monster negate, and both Beret and Beredo summoned another Karakuri from deck on Synchro Summon, with Beredo providing even more advantage through free card draw. The skill of choice for these builds was Restart, which even though it took away your first draw, was still ideal as your initial combo was so effective that losing the one draw did not matter, as you'd standardly make it up anyways with Beredo, which also is why most players were using copies of Offerings to the Doom in their builds, as skipping the draw phase really didn't matter. To say that Karakuri was a beast at the time was an understatement, though it still wasn't so oppressive as to turn the format into a tier 0 
as decks like Witchcrafter and Element Saber were still potent enough to prevent the meta takeover. Overall, this KC Cup was a welcome send-off to the DSOD era, showcasing the decks from the entire era through its top spots. However, the era was coming to an end, and the next era of Duel Links and the next new summoning mechanic was about to change what archetypes were playable with even a single new addition. 